Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you can please begin to make your way into the ballroom from the breakfast and those of you here, we are just about to kick off the first oral history showcase of the day, which will set the stage for our first panel. My father said he needs a new hiding place, and my mother was in touch with the resistance and found a nice hiding place. A Dutch nurse said she had a good house where they could go. And so that was very near at the time where we were in Amsterdam. So when they moved on the Sunday, we went to visit them. And on Tuesday, it was my 15th birthday, we just sat down to breakfast. Um, the landlords, very nice people as well, had saved an egg for me because we never got any egg or very little food at the time. A birthday egg, she said. And um, <clears throat> we were just sitting down to breakfast. It was a knock on the door in the morning, quite safe, classic visitor or something, somebody delivering something. So they opened the door and the Nazis stormed in and went straight for my mother and me because this nurse who found this house was a double agent. And when we visited, she saw, she organized that Nazis would follow us. So we knew where we, they knew where we were as well. So you can imagine that this is a birthday I will never forget. Then they take us to the headquarters of the Nazis and they wanted to know who had helped us, how we had got our ration books, all kinds of questions. And they beat me and beat me and beat me. And then they said, if you, and I was in shock. I didn't say anything, I just cried because I knew I might be killed now. Can you imagine? I'm just 15 years old and really afraid of at the end of my life. So, and, um, as I say, I just couldn't speak. So they beat me and then they said, um, if you don't tell us, um, we are going to kill your brother. So then I knew that they were arrested as well. So, so I started to cry and I'm terrible. So anyway, can't tell more details, but we eventually they let us go, four of us. We were spent the night in a prison, then we were put on a transport to a local camp, a transit camp, before we were taken to the east. Because in Holland there were camps, but not that if you would have stayed there, you would have uh, survived. But if you were transported to the east, it was very, very risky. And after a few days, we were called up to be transported to the east. So this was, you know, like um, a death sentence hanging over you. So there was no, no way out, we just went. And you might have seen pictures, not ordinary trains, but they were like goods trains, um, like a container. They were just huge metal trains with no windows in it. Um, two big sliding doors, and um, about 80 people were pushed in there. They had made a little opening, a little slot on one side with a, 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 a barbed wire across, but only very small for a little bit of air, and two buckets, one for toilets and one for fresh water. Um, about 80 people. Once a day, it was changed, and um, so we were hungry, we were thirsty, it was May, it was very hot on this metal train, people fainted, um, we were hungry, we were disorientated because it was dark most of the time. Um, once a day they opened the doors and just threw chunks of bread in like you would feed animals. And um, at, But the only nice thing for me was that I was still together with my family. And Heinz told me that, and of course I told you he was a wonderful musician, but of course he can't make any music, he had to be quiet, so he started painting. And he created some beautiful paintings 
oil paintings. He told me about them. And he said, before they escaped from that woman to go to this nurse, um, <clears throat> he, they hit them under the floorboards in the house with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz and Eric Geiger. And after the war, we are going to pick it up again. And he told me this, he was, he was crying at the time. He was very, very afraid. Um, he said, if I don't come back, Evie, said, please uh, pick up the paintings because they are very, very valuable to me. <clears throat> well, Mike is going to come first. Mike. Oh, yeah. No, no. Okay, I see him. <clears throat> I see him. There he is, yeah. You thought I forgot. <laughs> hey, welcome back, everybody. A third day of our conference. I hope you've enjoyed the previous sessions as much as I've had. And uh, we've got another tremendous lineup uh, for you again today. We're kicking off our morning session on the Vance Conference uh, fe featuring Dr. Alex Ritchie, who you met yesterday, and Dr. Michael Nyberg, Professor of History and Chair of War Studies at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the United States Army War College in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. We'll be focusing on how this event shaped the Holocaust as well as American reactions. Dr. Gunder Bischoff, a presidential counselor for the museum and Marshall Plan professor of history at the University of New Orleans serves as chair. Gunder is an international historian focusing on diplomatic history in the 20th century. He's a Marshall Plan professor, uh, but he also uh, serves as presidential counselor of the museum and uh, one of the conference committee members who helped design this great program and also uh, next year's program as well. So uh, Gunter's fingerprints are all over this one. And uh, you know, we, really, we really are grateful for that. So Gunter will offer Alex and Mike an opportunity to make some comments and then open things up with questions as part of an important conversation on this topic. And then with that, I'll let Gunter take it over from there. So, Auf geht's. Auf geht's. Los geht's. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with us this early in the morning. I said to someone, if uh, this program continues until, un until next Thursday, we're going to be starting at 6 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just uh, allow me uh, to make a few preliminary marks, uh, the remarks we are talking about the Holocaust this morning, amongst other things. Uh, but of course, what's important to understand is that the uh, road to Auschwitz was a crooked one, uh, maybe starting with uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism. And there is a debate amongst historians, when did that start? Did it start in his Vienna years, or did it start in his Munich years after World War I? I think it started with his Vienna years, because that's where he encountered, for the first time, a lot of Jews in the city of Vienna, where he was failing, as you know, as an artist. Uh, when Hitler came to power, he very quickly began to exclude uh, the Jews uh, from German public life. Uh, in January 1939, he gave a famous speech before the Reichstag, the German parliament, uh, which he didn't use very much, uh, where he issued his famous or infamous, you should say, prophecy. He threatened the, uh, quote, annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe, unquote, in the event of war, and added, quote, if international finance Jewry inside and outside Europe should uh, succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, the result will not be the Bolshevization, Bol Bolshevization of the earth and thereby the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. And Hitler would use this kind of prophecy often uh, uh, after 1939. Now, on December 12, 1941, and this was the day after he declared war on the United States, he addressed a meeting of sectional leaders of the Nazi party and of regional leaders, Gauleiter. And he said, coming back to his prophecy, quote, regarding the Jewish question, 
The Führer is determined to clear the table. This from Goebbels' diary. He warned the Jews that if they were the cause of, of another world war, it would lead to their destruction. Uh, and those were not empty words, he added. Now the war has come. The destruction of the Jews must be the necessary consequence. We cannot be sentimental about it. Uh, and December 12th, if you think about it, this was only a few weeks before the Wednesday conference, which uh, Alex is going to talk about this morning uh, on January 20th, 1942. So uh, I think if you think about the Holocaust, uh, don't think about just uh, a straight line from Jew hating to extermination. As Holocaust historians have pointed out uh, recently, it was a, a crooked road involving many contingencies uh, along the way. So keep that in mind as we are talking about the Wannsee Conference this morning. We couldn't be in a better uh, position uh, to have two very distinguished historians uh, explain these events to us. Uh, Dr. Alexandra Ritchie is going to be the first one. She was the previous convener of the presidential councillors, now uh, Dr. John Morrow is uh, the group that you've heard about. Uh, uh, Alexandra got her DPhil at Oxford University at the famous St. Anthony's College there. And uh, she has uh, lived in Warsaw uh, for the past years. And she's teaching at a private university called Collegium Civitas in Warsaw International Relations. She is the author of uh, two uh, well-known books, Faust's Metropolis, sort of a history of Berlin. A lot of Faust is usually being bandied about when you talk about the Nazis. Uh, uh, and also a book on the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. Uh, so she's going to speak first, and then uh, and I'll introduce him now to uh, Dr. Michael Nyberg. You already heard he's the chair of war studies uh, and uh, at the U.S. Army War College, where he's teaching uh, uh, history. I find it interesting in his case that he seems to be going back and forth between World War I and World War II. He has written well-known books on uh, World War I, uh, but then usually he comes back to World War II. A few years ago, I remember chairing a panel where he was talking about the Potsdam Conference, which is also a book of his. And more recently, he has come back to World War II with the book that's just out, When France Fell, and he's going to talk about the, uh, uh, that uh, this morning. So without further ado, I hand it over to Alex Ritchie. Thank you so much, Gunter, and welcome everybody. I know it's uh, very early, and I know that this subject is very, very grim and very difficult uh, to face sometimes, um, but it's also very necessary uh, to look at the Holocaust, to look at the final solution, uh, and to understand, really, how crucial this was in Hitler's war, in the Nazis' war, um, and in, in the consequences uh, of what Hitler began. Um, and, it, and it's really uh, the discovery of the, of the camps, Belsen and Dachau and so on, which was really the tip of the iceberg of the, of the Holocaust, in fact, um, was one of those things that shifted our perceptions as to what we were fighting for. So it's a very, very important thing, I think, to understand some of the steps that lead to the final solution, and that's what uh, the Wannsee Conference was all about. So I'm standing in front of a photo of a beautiful villa um, 56, 58 Van, Vanze, am Großen Vanze, uh, in a beautiful, elegant suburb uh, in Berlin. And on January 20th, 1942, a number of elegant black cars, limousines, Mercedes, um, could be seen pulling up to this lovely place. Um, and the house originally, which was owned by a, a, a right-wing industrialist in Germany, had in 1941 been sold to none other than the SS. And the SS used it as a sort of a guest house when they wanted to you know, meet the guys from Riga or from Minsk to come in and have some drinks together and have a meal. Uh, this was the place that they chose. So it wasn't really surprising that on that day, uh, 15 high officials of the National Socialist regime had been invited by none other than Reinhard Heydrich 
uh, to a meeting to discuss, quote, the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. It was to be a meeting followed by an elegant breakfast. Um, they'd invited, uh, been invited by Heydrich, who was extraordinarily clever, very, very cruel. Uh, Hitler called him the man with the iron heart. He saw this as a compliment. Um, but it was also very, very important for Heydrich because this was to be effectively the rubber stamp of the final solution. Now, as Gunther mentioned, and as we all know, there had already been terrible discrimination against the Jews when Hitler came to power, everything from the Nuremberg Laws to Kristallnacht. And in fact, the Germans, the Nazis, originally wanted to push the, the Jews out of Germany, out of Austria. Um, and the big tragedy, of course, as we now know with hindsight, was that not enough countries were willing to take them in. So Hitler and Himmler and Heydrich came up with other solutions. Uh, when they invaded Poland, they were going to create a huge reservation for Jews in, in the Lublin area. When they took France, they were going to send the Jews to uh, Madagascar. Um, when none of these worked, uh, what Hitler did instead was round the Jews up in, in Poland, for example. There were three million Jews living in Poland, put them in ghettos, walled them in. Um, and of course, many tens of thousands uh, died of, of starvation, of disease, and so on in these ghettos alone. But this was not yet the final solution. Many, many people were dying, but this was not yet the, the final solution. Now, the first phase of what we can call the Holocaust really began with Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, 22nd June 1941, when um, the army went, of course, began this enormous invasion uh, and was followed behind by the so-called Einsatzgruppen and, of course, other police and other units as well, whose specific and sole purpose was to murder primarily Jews, also political commissars and others, specifically dictated by Hitler. And this mass murder began right away. And this was called the Holocaust by bullets, where around about 1.4 million people, 1.4 million people, it's hard to imagine, were simply lined up the edge of pits or in, in mass graves in forests or whatever and shot. Infamous, of course, places like Babi Yar outside of Kiev, but then there were many, many other smaller sites as well. But the point was, <clears throat> as Hitler figured out, it's, it's, it's possible to go and mass murder uh, a million or so people in the faraway areas of Russia because nobody really cared, nobody could see. It was easy to keep it quiet. But what were you going to do with the population of Jews, for example, in Poland? Hitler wanted to create a paradise in the East. And paradise can't, in the German mind or the Nazi mind, have a Jewish population. So in their minds, they began to think, well, yes, we have to do something about this as well. And this is where the Wannsee Conference fits in. As I said, Hitler had correctly calculated you could shoot people in the Soviet Union and get away with it, as it were. But it was going to be much more difficult to do that in, in Poland. And of course, as the idea dawned on them that perhaps let's murder the Jews of Western Europe as well, you can't very well go into the center of Paris and start shoot, shooting people into the Seine, because this would be noticed by the rest of the world. And so there was, this was the sort of beginning of the genesis, the idea of the extermination camp. And one must remember that this innovation, which we now know so much about, was entirely new. Nobody in the world had ever thought needed such a thing. Why on earth would you need to move people to a special place in order to kill them? This was, this was, was absurd. And so the Nazis put their technological engineering minds to work and began to come up with all sorts of um, innovations. And they put together um, many things that they'd already developed into this horrific conclusion. Um, one of the things was, of course, the euthanasia program, which had been put in place by Hitler and the others because they wanted to kill people who had been dis disabilities, uh, who were mentally handicapped, or whatever it might be. They didn't fit into this perfect Nazi world. And around about 70,000 people were murdered in six different killing centers around uh, Germany, places like Sonnenstein. And this was only stopped because of the, in uh, because of the activities of some Germans who realized that their relatives had been murdered, uh, and people like Archbishop Galen, who started to, who to, who started to protest against this. A second piece of the puzzle 
was the ability to move large numbers of people. And this began in things like the Olympic Games, when, when you were tens of thousands of people were being moved around Berlin. But it was perfected in this sort of sinister purpose by uh, Reinhard Heydrich, and by, by, sorry, by Adolf Eichmann, who uh, uh, oversaw the ethnic cleansing um, after 1939 of, of what had been Polish areas and that were to be Germanized. He pushed people on trains, moved them to other parts of, of the, the General Gouvernement, and, and started to learn how you, you, you move people around in this way. Um, and also, as a result of the so-called Holocaust by bullets, which I mentioned earlier, Himmler began to realize that the terrible toll that this, this was taking on his poor uh, sensitive SS men, I mean, it's, it's really quite terrible to have to you know, shoot tens and tens of thousands of people into pits. I mean, you know, the, the sensibilities were, 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 were being challenged. And, and so they were looking for a more, um, I suppose, kind way of killing people. Not kind for the victims, of course, but kind for the perpetrators. The idea of using gas began to be uh, tested in various places, taking off from the euthanasia program. The first use of Auschwitz, uh, at Auschwitz was a kind of a, a ad hoc experiment by uh, SS Hauptsturmführer Haupt Karl Fritscher, who threw some Cyclone B into the basement of Block 11, the, the, the hated punishment block in Auschwitz I, the main camp. Uh, and it worked, and so they started using the small crematorium at Auschwitz I um, as, a, as, a, as a killing field already um, before the Wannsee Conference took place. And this was true of two other of what would become extermination camps as well. They were also up and running before Wannsee took place. The first was Helmno, where they were experimenting with, with gas vans, putting the exhaust into the sealed container at the back of a van, driving around and killing people that way. And then the first purpose-built extermination camp um, was um, was uh, uh, built, started by Otto Gorbotsnik in, on the 13th of October 1941. Uh, and he proposed the construction of a gas chamber at a place called Belgetz. And this would be the first actual uh, extermination camp. Now, the, the, the point about places like Helmno and Belgetz is that they were hidden deep, deep in the forest somewhere. No, nobody could see them, but they were reached by a train, a train line which came right up to the camps. So this, of course, starts to merge together the idea of a mass killing site using gas plus being able to transport people in secret to a far off location where they can be murdered and their bodies disposed of without anybody knowing about it. Um, this is a picture of Reinhard Heydrich. Uh, and the invitation that he sends, sends to the people who are going to go to the Vanse Conference, um, this particular invitation is sent to Martin Luther. And you may be able to see that the original date for the, um, for the conference was on the 9th of December, 1941. However, as we all know, quite a few important things happen in December, 1941, in which would which would turn out to be perhaps one of the most dramatic weeks of the war. Of course, we all know that around 5th of December, the Germans start to uh, feel a pinch outside of Moscow and, and, and realize that they're not going to take Moscow uh, in that uh, just before Christmas. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, for this is that on the 7th of December 1941, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Four days later, the Germans declare war on the United States. Now, Hitler seems to have considered this to be, in a way, a trigger to give the go-ahead on the mass murder of the remaining Jews of Europe. Um, and as Gunther mentioned, Goebbels recorded in his diary on the 12th of December 1941 that Hitler had gathered his Nazi dignitaries to the Reich Chancellery and returned to his quote-unquote prophecy on the 30th of January 1939 that if the Jews ever started a world war again, of course because they had started this world war, as, as we all know, uh, it would mean their annihilation. And in reality, uh, this meant that the Jews of Europe were doomed. So on the 20th of January, Heydrich waited as these major officials arrived, party officials, high-ranking SS officers. And they were all well-educated. Eight of them had academic doctorates. They were representatives of the top ministries, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Minister of the Interior, um, Foreign Ministry, uh, Gestapo Müller was there, head of the Gestapo, of course. Adolf Eichmann, who would become notorious later on uh, for his trial, uh, was there on hand as Heydrich's deputy and to take the minutes. Um, Heydrich opened the meeting by informing the guests, in no uncertain terms, that it was he who was going to be in charge, along with Himmler and the SS, of this new innovative idea of exterminating the Jews of Europe. We didn't want interference, thank you very much, from the Foreign Ministry or the Interior Ministry. So really one of the main purposes of this meeting was to rubber stamp the idea of the final solution, but also to make sure that Heydrich uh, and Himmler at, at Al were going to be in charge 
thank you very much. Um, this is a, a picture of um, Eichmann, and what is really very, very chilling, I still can't look at this list without, without feeling sick. It's a list, if you can read it, um, of, of, of the countries of Europe and elsewhere as well, because um, you know, uh, Turkey is included and, and Morocco, and the number of Jews that the Nazis had figured out live in these places. And these were the people who were now going to be, as uh, Heydrich said, Europe was going to be combed from west to east every single Jewish man, woman, and child was going to be found, and they were going to be, quote, unquote, transported to the East. What is so shocking is the, it's the scale of the crime that they were planning, and yet here they were in this glorious villa, having a wonderful breakfast, and uh, according to um, Eichmann, during his trial, the, the cognac had already started to flow. Heydrich outlined the plan in some detail. Eichmann pointed out that roughly 11 million Jews would be included in the death toll. Some Jews, like decorated veterans who'd fought in the First World War on the side of Germany, might be allowed to go to the model camp at Theresienstadt, for example. But generally speaking, um, you know, the rest would, would just have to disappear. The meeting took an hour and a half. Actually, much of the time, if you look over the minutes, was spent over arguments about what were Mischlinger and what was going to happen to so-called Mischlinger, which were uh, the Jews in mixed marriages or their children. Do, do you kill them, but then you might offend some Germans? Uh, or do you keep them, but then you might offend the Germans who don't like Jews? And it was just back and forth around the table, and everybody got in a, in a bit of a sort of hot under the collar about it. But anyway, uh, that was resolved. The Nazi machine pulled together to create and run these new factories of death. And this would turn 1942 in particular into a horrifying year of the Holocaust, one of the most terrible years of uh, systematic mass killing uh, in the history of mankind. Uh, for example, a camp like Treblinka, in where most of the Jews from Warsaw were killed, over 850,000 people. Most of those people died in, in one year. It is something of a miracle that we know about this meeting. So much relating to the Holocaust was done verbally, uh, or not written down, or written down and destroyed. Now, Heydrich printed out 30 copies of this, uh, protocol, and you can see just a, not a very good picture of, of, of part of the protocol, um, and, um, and, and they were supposed to be destroyed. But one person, Martin Luther here of the Foreign Ministry, decided he was going to keep his, we don't know why, uh, and he hid it away in his papers. And so fortunately, after the war, it was discovered um, uh, by a, person, a Brit called Kenneth Duke, who was microfilming uh, documents for the, for the Allies. And he handed it over to US prosecutor Robert Kempner, um, who used it in the later Nuremberg proceedings, and also, of course, in the Eichmann trial. As for the participants, um, a lot of them died during, during the war. Um, uh, uh, Rudolf Lange, Heinrich Müller, Ronald Fri Roland Friesler, Alfred Meyer. Uh, these men perished in the, in the uh, you know, in, for example, in Berlin. We're not sure about uh, Gestapo Müller. He disappeared. He, he might have d escaped like Eichmann, and we just never know about it. But, um, but as for the other participants who, who survived, only a few were brought to trial after 1945. Of course, we know Heydrich was assassinated. Um, but uh, the rest, including State, State Secretary Willem Stuckert or SS Major Otto Hoffmann, George Leibrand, uh, denied when they were questioned that they had understood anything about the Wannsee Conference. They said, well, they just said they were deporting these people to the East. We didn't understand what it meant. Uh, we had nothing to do with the mass murder of Jews, absolutely nothing whatsoever. And tragically, this argument worked, and they didn't go uh, to prison. Uh, in fact, they got off scot-free and, and had successful careers in, uh, in West Germany after the war. This is a picture of Joseph Wolf, the gentleman in the glasses. Uh, one man was horrified by this fate, uh, and after the war, the villa became a school, then a hostel. The West German government didn't really know what to do with it. And the historian and Holocaust survivor, Josef Wolf, campaigned tirelessly for the villa to be turned into a memorial site. He named Nazi criminals who were having wonderful careers in, in West Germany. He tried to explain what Wannsee had meant. But, of course, this was the time of the Cold War, and he was ignored. And sadly, he committed suicide in despair in 1974, never seeing the realization of this project. 
Fortunately, as we all know, attitudes changed in, in West Germany first and then in the United Germany, so that by uh, the 1980s, the Holocaust had become very much more of an important subject in both Germany and, of course, around the world. Um, and on, in 1992, on the 50th anniversary of the conference, the Wannsee Villa, Villa became a memorial, uh, an official museum of the Holocaust and an educational center. And indeed, for those of you who have been on or are going to go on my Rise and Fall tour, we go to the Wannsee Conference, which now has a new uh, display area. It's been sort of revamped. And we also go to Auschwitz, and it, to me, is always this terrifying reminder of these, these gentlemen, in quotation marks, sitting around the table, having their uh, wonderful breakfast, and then you go to see the, the horrors of, of what the camps really were like and what the consequences were of their, of their sort of blithe comments and discussions. Um, and so what remains so chilling for me um, is the thought of these you know, educated, well-dressed, high-ranking officials getting together uh, over this lavish meal, toasting their success at the planning of the mass murder of millions and millions of human beings. It's a chilling warning from history as to how something like the Holocaust can happen. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start by just saying what a pleasure it is to be here in person at an actual conference. And I want to thank everybody here in New Orleans that I know worked so very hard uh, to put this together. I have to be honest with you, um, I am not a Holocaust scholar, and as I was reflecting upon this, I think this might be the first time in 25 plus years of coming to conferences that I've spoken about the Holocaust. Nevertheless, my working on Vichy, as Gunter kindly pointed out in the book, kept me coming back to themes of Second World War history, of ways in which America's relationship to Vichy France touched on everything. It touched on the Eastern Front, it touched on the Middle East, it touched on Southeast Asia. And it touched on the Holocaust as well. So what I want to do in the 15 minutes or so I have with you here is talk a little bit about that and talk about the way that Vichy France and America's very strange relationship to that very strange political entity conditioned much of what the United States knew and what it did. So just to remind everybody, uh, Vichy France is this very, very odd, very difficult to explain political entity. In June of 1940, as you all know, France is defeated. Uh, nevertheless, France manages to get something out of the armistice negotiations. And what they manage to get out is an unoccupied or free zone, shown here in blue on this map, that becomes known as l'État français or Vichy France, after the very small spa town in which uh, it, it centers its government. Vichy technically is an independent, neutral state, and crucially, Vichy maintains control of the French Navy and control over the French Empire overseas. And those two things are critical for American planners who are absolutely shocked that France had fallen. What will happen to that fleet and what will happen inside the French Empire? The two men most connected with Vichy France, the man on the left is Pierre Laval, uniformly disliked inside the United States. Dr. Seuss drew him as a rat in political cartoons, but Laval had a son-in-law, a man by the name of René de Chambrun, who was distantly related to the Roosevelts and descended directly from the Marquis de Lafayette. He came to the United States even before the fall of France to represent Vichy interests. The man on the right is Henri-Philippe Pétain. He is one of the great heroes of the First World War for France. He is also a good friend of John Pershing's and a man very much loved and admired inside the United States. Uh, there are still six American states that have Pétain streets or Pétain boulevards in them. The American administration, especially Secretary of State Cordell Hull and the ambassador to Vichy France, Admiral Leahy, gave these two men a lot of room and a lot of space inside US policy. They had decided directly opposite to what the British were deciding at the same time, that America should not only recognize Vichy, the United States should embrace Vichy, in part because Vichy was anti-communist and in part because of René de Chambrun and Pétain's promises that despite everything that had happened in 1940, France and the United States could continue with positive relationships. This is also true of the new American ambassador, uh, Robert Murphy, the diplomat that's operating in North Africa. Therefore, the United States knew full well what was happening to French Jews and chose to do nothing about it. 
This is a photograph of the roundup of about 15,000 Parisian Jews at an indoor bicycle arena called the Veldive in southwestern France. Uh, Laval clearly knew what was going on. At one point when Laval, uh, oh, excuse me, when Robert Murphy questioned Laval, Laval's answer was, well, if you don't like what we're doing with, you, with Jews, we'll be happy to send them all to you. Knowing, of course, that American immigration policy was a sensitive issue inside the United States. The United States raised no objection to Vichy's policy and raised no uh, significant private objection to Vichy's policy either. The United States also knew that those people in the Veldiv and elsewhere inside of France were being sent to this place, the Drancy Transit Camp. Uh, if you take the RER line from Charles de Gaulle Airport to downtown uh, Paris, you'll pass right by the Drancy uh, station, which is exactly where this was. This building contained just four working toilets, no heat, minimal food, and minimal water, and the United States knew all about it. John C. is today a museum that just opened uh, where people can come and, and, and see it. Uh, it's now an interpretation center similar to what von Say has become for the Germans. There is absolutely no secret about what Vichy was trying to do and about the deep anti-Semitism inside the Vichy regime itself. This political cartoon here is showing the Révolution Nationale. This is the, the domestic plan that Vichy's government had to renew France. And you can see some of the symbols uh, inside here, there is a oh, sorry. There is a very clear, of course, Jewish star up there. Uh, there is also a word for laziness uh, there on the bottom left. There's a word for Judaism. There's a word for capitalism, all tied together in this uh, Vichy and Nazi ideology about the role of Jews inside Europe. Foreign Jews were an especial target for Vichy. They were the first target for Vichy, but French Jews as well uh, were targets. In October 1940, the Vichy French government issued something it called the Statut des Juives, which excluded Jews from professions that influence people, uh, a wide open category that soon included teachers, doctors, anything in the media, anything in the civil service. And in March 1941, the Vichy government created the General Commissariat for Jewish Affairs, uh, designed to figure out what to do of the French end of what to do with all of these Jews. Now we know now that most of the information that the United States was getting about the Holocaust was coming either directly or indirectly through France. It was either coming from French sources or it was coming from Swiss sources that were then sending them through France. The most famous is a cable that came from a, a Zionist living in Switzerland detailing in great detail what was going on inside Germany. When that cable reached the United States, someone, most likely the Secretary of State Cordell Hall, sent back the infamous document Cable 354, telling sources in Europe not to send back any more information about what was going on with Jews in Europe. The Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, was so angry that he went directly to President Roosevelt demanding an answer as to what had gone on with that cable, and Roosevelt uh, refused to get involved. Now, what's interesting to me, this all happens in the summer of 1942. On September 16, 1942, Cordell Hall gave what I believe is the first, it's the only first one that I can find, the earliest example of any senior American official admitting in public what the United States government knew. This is September 16, 1942, where he harshly condemned the, quote, revolting and fiendish Jewish policy of sending Jewish refugees back to their native countries in the East. The Germans, quote, have announced and in a considerable degree executed their intention to enslave, maltreat, and eventually exterminate Jews under conditions of most extreme cruelty. And just for your information, this document did not appear on the front page of any American newspaper. It was appeared only in the back pages in September of 1942. Why did Hull do this? If he, if he issued Cable 354, if he told people in Europe, don't send us back any more reports, what's different in September of 1942? Well, two things are different. One, the number of reports coming out of Vichy France, where they're, again, the unoccupied zone, so people can operate slightly more freely from German interference. Reports are reaching the world, they're reaching the United States government, they're reaching newspapers. Things like Jewish women killing themselves and their children by leaping out of buildings rather than risk deportation. Reports of the Germans melting down corpses in order to make things out of the bodies that they wanted and reports of Vichy French officials actively supporting the deportation and the killings that were going on inside France. These reports were about to be released and were about to be made public by an American rabbi based out of Cleveland named Stephen Wise. 
So it's possible that what Cordell Hall was doing was getting on top of the news cycle, as we would say, trying to get out in front of a story. The second thing that's going on, of course, and as you can all hopefully figure out from the date, is that the United States and Great Britain are getting very close to executing Operation Torch and coming into North Africa. The United States and Britain have no idea what the response of Vichy French forces are going to look like once they get there. This could be part of Cordell Hull trying to lay the groundwork for saying, if Vichy does not cooperate with us, we're trying to lay the groundwork for a reason to take that regime out. And I can talk much more about that if anybody is interested, because it's kind of fascinating to me. Now, this has become quite controversial again inside France. Uh, a recent book by a French historian named Jacques Semelin uh, argues that although 80,000 French Jews were killed in the Holocaust, Semelin argues that the majority of French Jews survived, not because of any effort by Vichy to protect them, but despite Vichy's efforts to protect them, or Vichy's efforts to kill them, excuse me. Why is that the case? Well, Semelin argues that one thing that's true about Vichy that's not true about occupied France is that it has borders, mountainous, difficult to patrol borders, that can let some Jewish escapees get into countries like Spain, Switzerland, and Italy, which was relatively good for Jews until the fall of uh, Mussolini and the German occupation of northern Italy. This is the story of Primo Levi, an Italian Jew who lived a fairly reasonable life until the, the, the end of the war. Also, remember what I said about Vichy controlling the French Empire. It's very easy for people to move between, relatively easy, as easy as it could be in wartime, to move between Vichy France and the French Empire. That means Morocco, that means Algeria, that means Tunisia. So several Jews uh, appear, appear to have been able to get out uh, that way. Vichy France also has far fewer cities inside of it. So whereas in the north, the chart that Alex showed, when it had France on there, it divided France between the occupied zone and the unoccupied zone. Those in the unoccupied zone are principally in the big cities of Paris, Lille, Lyon. In Vichy, France, most of these Jews are scattered throughout the countryside, making it harder for police units and police units to come and get them. And Jacques Semelin argues that there was an active underground operating inside Vichy, France, that was trying to protect these people and get them to safety when they could. And again, I want to insist, because this has become an issue again in the French political sphere, this is despite Vichy's efforts, not because of anything that Vichy did to try to protect these Jews. How do we know that? Because we know what Vichy did in 1942, the year that Alex has already cited uh, as being so critically important. Vichy's own behavior in 1942 begins to change. Whereas Pétain had tried to police the French people as gently as possible, by the middle of 1942, Vichy officials are getting more aggressive and certainly much nastier. Here are two of them, Louis d'Arquier de Pelpois, the Commissioner General for Jewish Affairs. And every time I read that, every time I read a title like that, it just boggles the mind to think they created an office like that, meaning that they're perfectly upfront and perfectly comfortable with doing what they did. The man on the right, Joseph Darnan, who served for a time in the Waffen SS, he will become the maintenance, Secretary General for the Maintenance of Order. Uh, he will head something called the Milice, which is the Vichy paramilitary force, which will operate uh, with greater and greater ferocity and nastiness as the war begins to go on. So the Second World War for the French is very much a war between the resistance and the Milice. And this has been the memory of the war in France that French people have been trying to deal with. When the United States and Great Britain entered uh, North Africa and entered uh, Operation Torch, this ends Vichy France and German forces come into the south. These guys get even more authority and even more backing. Now it's not just French forces that are doing this, but Germans as well. And what they'll do is they'll build this network of camps, uh, one of which uh, we'll see on the um, med crews in the spring, Les Mille, down in southern France here. Um, what I want to do with this uh, to make sure that I end uh, on time, I want to end with something that has always fascinated me as you, as you walk through France. I've been going to France since the early 1990s, and many of the places from which Jews were deported, especially in northern cities, uh, they've now created plaques and historical markers to try to indicate um, 
what, what happened and where and, and what happened. So this is one of those plaques, and this is what I'd like to end with because I find it so fascinating, and I hope some of you in the back can read it, and even if you don't speak French, um, I think I'll be able to explain what, what it is. It's talking about deportations on the 16th and 17th of July, 1942, when 13,152 Jews were arrested in Paris uh, and, and in its... Uh, suburbs. This is talking about another one of these roundups, or what the French call a rafle, uh, and these people were sent to Auschwitz. Now, what's interesting to me is about two thirds of the way down here, where it says um, they were placed in inhumane conditions. And here's the part that that always strikes me: by the police of the government of Vichy, under the order of the Nazi occupiers. Now, to me, these are fascinating as an historian. Sometimes in France, they will say Vichy did this. Sometimes they'll do what they do here. Vichy did it under the orders of the Germans. Sometimes they'll say the Germans did it, and sometimes they'll just put it in the passive voice. 13,000 Jews were deported. And to me, the, the language of this, the way you understand this, the way you create an historical memory of this is to me fascinating. And this is the political debate that remains ongoing in France today. The extent to which you can write this off as being something done under Nazi orders or the extent to which you have to wrestle with the fact that much of Vichy's own anti-Semitism was driving the, the, the policies and driving the way that, that France behaved. Now, I have to say, for the United States, this was not a, a high moment of, of, of um, uh, high morality for us either. When the American forces came into North Africa, the United States raised no objection to the anti-Semitic policies that had been going on in Vichy. They raised no objection to something called the, the, the suspension of the Cremieux Law, which gave French Jews in North Africa citizenship. The United States allowed Vichy officials to continue to run North Africa for a good long time after uh, the United States had moved on to Tunisia, and the United States raised no objection. The deal was that Vichy would govern North Africa so that the U.S. didn't have to do it while American forces head on to, headed on to Tunisia. As a result, no American official from Eisenhower on down raised any objection to the suspension of the Cremieux Law or insisted upon changes in Vichy domestic policy. That will change as America's great nemesis, Charles de Gaulle, comes to the fore, but that, as they say, is another story. Um, what I wanted to do is just indicate to you the, the language on these plaques and just remind everybody that for many people living inside Europe, for many people living inside France, the battles over memory, the battles over language, the, ba the battles over the political meaning of these events continues to be something that is very important in the French political sphere. It's important today as they have a presidential election coming up and Vichy is back in the news as a result of that. Thanks very much. Thank you to both uh, Alexandra and Michael for their wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm going to start out by asking them a question or so, and then we're going to throw it out to the audience for questions and uh, answers. Now, note that both of them ended with uh, an appeal to the memory of these events, the memory of Wannsee, the memory of Vichy, and how those battles are still being fought today, as Michael just told us. And this is uh, a reminder for you that we have a memory conference coming up in March, uh, so the museum is paying uh, plenty of attention to the memory battle, so uh, just as a reminder. Now, the question I have for Alexandra is the issue of the importance of the Wannsee conference on this twisted road to, to Auschwitz. Uh, I think the older scholarship had Wannsee sort of front and center as the turning point towards the final solution. But now more recent the Holocaust scholarship, like the German scholar Christian Gerlach, uh, they see uh, a continuum towards Wannsee, you know, with Hitler's speech of, uh, both of us mentioned that of December 12th and so forth. So uh, could you maybe give us an assessment uh, of how important is one? Say it's important in defining who is a Jew. You mentioned that at the end, who is a Mischling and so forth, but what is the importance? You're absolutely right. I think one of the reasons that Vanze became so important in the early scholarship was because we had the proofs of it. Uh, you know, if you've got the whole protocol and you've got all the information, it's very, very rare to have um, documentation of, of someone like Heydrich sitting around a table saying, this is what we're going to do. And so, of course, this was, in a sense, gold dust for Holocaust scholars. Um, and, there, and you're absolutely right that this was a step-by-step a, a step, um, process toward 
the final solution. Um, you know, in the, in the 70s and the 80s, there were two real schools of thought about the Holocaust, one called the functionalists, who believed that the Holocaust had been planned uh, when Hitler was writing Mein Kampf, or even earlier in his mind, and it was just a question of when he could do this. And the, and the, um, the uh, f functionalists who believed that, you know, this was a, a, a the, the uh, Reich was sort of ad hoc, and they were trying to put things together as they went along, and the, 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 the final solution was, was a result of this kind of one thing leading to another to another. Um, and um, really with the opening up of the archives in, uh, the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, really the uh, functionalists won the day because we got so much more evidence from, um, from uh, the, the files, including the things like Himmler's day book and uh, Goebbels complete, the complete Goebbels diaries, which show really step by step how this came about. And there are other very important uh, meetings that took place uh, that we don't have evidence of. So for example, meetings between Hitler, Himmler on the, over the telephone in the July 1941, um, in which obviously this, these matters were discussed. Um, there were um, other meetings that again, Goebbels refers to, but we don't have any minutes, we don't have any proofs of them. But it seems that Hitler made the decision for the the final solution sometime in the autumn of 1941. Um, and that, again, is pointed to by, by new scholarship and, um, and new evidence from the Soviet Union. So in that sense, to answer your question, uh, the Wannsee Conference was rather more a rubber stamping exercise. And as I mentioned earlier, to make sure that Heydrich and the SS made sure that there was not going to be enter any interference from other, other bodies, that they were going to be in charge of this and uh, nobody else was going to get a look in. So that's really the significance of it, but it's one in many, many other uh, meetings and um, uh, ideas that came, came along between 1941 and, and 42. Thank you. Uh, I find it odd or ironic that the official after whose minutes survived is a Martin Luther. Usually we associate holier, holier matters with that name. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yes, indeed. It was, it's very ironic. Uh, and, and, and he was very, uh, he would have been uh, chastised severely by, by Himmler had Himmler discovered he'd kept the minutes. But we were very grateful, ironically, that he did. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. A question for Michael. Michael, uh, you, you pointed towards the fact uh, that Roosevelt made this decision to recognize the Vichy government. And that, in your book, you say, was a very unpopular decision. Public opinion didn't like that at all. Could you enlarge on that a bit? Yeah, I, the way I love to do this with students is show clips from the movie Casablanca, which is being made at exactly this time. And those of you that remember that brilliant film, the last scene, or one of the last scenes, is uh, Louis opening up a bottle of Vichy water and starting to drink from it and then throwing it in the trash can. Uh, American public opinion was turning towards Charles de Gaulle, was clearly turning towards the de Gaulle as the leader of a free French movement or free France or whatever they were calling it, fighting France. Um, Cordell Hull, Roosevelt, Leahy, Leahy a little bit less, Leahy was coming to, to, to get very disillusioned by Vichy, Robert Murphy was not, uh, saw a lot that they liked. They, they saw a, a government that was stable, they saw a government that they thought they could, they could manipulate with carrots and sticks. Uh, and they saw a government that was anti-communist and anti-Charles de Gaulle, both of which were very popular inside Washington. So one of the problems and one of the things I look at in the book is this tension between the American government pursuing this policy and the intense, intense hatred of that policy inside the United States. And it's one of the reasons why Roosevelt pushed Marshall to launch Operation Torch before the midterm elections of 1942. This was really what he was worried about, that uh, if the midterm elections of 42 turn on foreign policy, at that point, autumn 1942, Roosevelt is reasonably weak on wartime policy. And that's what they're worried about. So uh, again, to me, it was just fascinating the way that Vichy's, the, the threads of Vichy just connect to everything. I think uh, the importance of your book, and you, you sort of pointed out in your introduction, is that you are trying to salvage the US-French relationship in the war from oblivion, so to speak, yeah. uh, because Americans, you say, are sort of infatuated or, or enthralled with uh, the special relationship to Great Britain, and you say, wait a minute, don't forget France. So in your introduction, you also make, I think, an, an important point uh, that I'd like you to debate a bit more, namely that uh, for the U.S., you say the war began with the fall of France in May, June of 1940, not with Pearl Harbor. Could you maybe develop that a bit? Yeah, it's, um, 
you know, if you, if you think about this, so France, the United States policy in the 1920s and 1930s just begins from an unquestioned assumption that the French Army and British Navy will do what they did in the last World War. That is, they'll keep the Germans away long enough until we can come in at the time of our choosing. When the French Army is no longer there, and the French Navy is in this weird state where it's part of this weird country in Vichy, and we don't really know what it's going to do, those assumptions completely go away. Um, and if you look at a map of the French Empire in 1940, it includes Senegal, which is the part of Africa that's closest to South America and interferes with the shipping lanes. It includes Martinique, which is where the France's only aircraft carrier is, which is in the Caribbean, also where half of France's gold is. So overnight, the map goes from something that looks very safe and secure for Americans to something that looks terrifying for Americans. And it's in this period, these, these few weeks after the fall of France, that we pass the Two Ocean Navy Act, uh, the Burke-Wadsworth Act, which brings selective service in. This is where destroyers for bases goes through. Uh, these enormous, I have the numbers in the book, but these enormous spending bills uh, that just keep going up and up and up and up and up as people get more and more scared. Um, it's where we actually debate a four million man army, a four million man army in 1940, that Marshall and Roosevelt ratchet down to two million. So it's this flurry of activity that gets the United States involved. And the key thing, um, and I credit Pete Crane, who used to run our, our archive at Carlisle, uh, Matthew Ridgway was then in the War Plans Division, and Ridgway is writing memoranda to Marshall and to President Roosevelt saying, look, we no longer choose the time of our entry into the war now. The fall of France means this is no longer under our control, and we're not prepared to defend anything except the coast of the United States, and we're not even sure that we can do that. So it is this moment of absolute panic, and again, I don't want to go on too long, but another thing that Vichy connects to is Roosevelt's decision to tell the FBI, just ignore the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution on wiretaps, ignore the two recent Supreme Court cases, and do what you have to do, uh, and the beginning of the opening up of this kind of uh, tension between civil liberties and security. So that's sort of a point that Stephanie made yesterday, that the U.S. Constitution is under threat with all these wartime orders. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 20 minutes left for your questions. Uh, uh, I defer to you, your wonderful audience. You have lots of, lots of good questions, and which are surely much smarter than mine would be. So, Jeremy, you want to take over? Yes, we'll start to your left in the very back, please. Thank you very much for this very interesting panel. One question to Michael. Um, you remember you closed your, your presentation with a plague and how big discussions are going on in France about how they should be written and, and what sort of memory we should uh, <clears throat> state Vichy. Vichy. Now the question is, how would you write this plague after having writ, uh, written the whole book, and why? I'm really tempted to give the Army answer that as a federal employee, I cannot comment on the <laughs> intergovernmental uh, affairs of another state. Uh, I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do that. So, uh, watch, I'll be happy to talk to you offline, but I'm going I'm to duck that question uh, since I am a federal employee here on official business. <laughs> I can't believe we'll, I got away with that. <laughs> we'll stay to your left towards the back, please. Great answer, man. Great answer. Uh, pardon, pardon my voice, so I'll do this as quickly as possible. Um, the point was made that we had never seen a killing like this before. Um, my mom's family walked across the Syrian desert out of Armenia in about 1915 because there was a killing of this scale going on. Yeah. To a better point, though, you guys do great scholarship, and I still wish I was a history professor. I'm in hiding as an, as an administrator now, but thank you. Um, but <laughs> the, the point being, it's not us you have to be talking to. Look around this country. There are people thinking it's okay to be Nazis. We have to be speaking to the people that aren't listening to us. We have to make our scholarship accessible. And I think if they knew the stories you guys are telling about how horrible this is, and why public history is important to understanding these things, we'd be a better country. Your, your point is well taken about the Armenian yeah. genocide, of course, and, uh, and Hitler himself said, 
who remembers the Armenians? And, and he was very well aware of the fact that that, that was a precedent um, which he, he very consciously referred to uh, as, well, you can mass murder um, hundreds of thousands of people and nobody seems to bother much. Um, so yes, it's very, very important also in, the, in the, the run up to the genocide. I think that the point I was trying to make is that, that there, yes, there, there have been, had been genocides, uh, mass killings before. But what made the Holocaust and to this day makes the final solution slightly different was the use of all of this technological and engineering know-how to create an entire system whereby, for example, in Treblinka, in one month, July 42 to August 42, 315,000 people are, are, are ma mass murdered. I mean, it's all unbelievable the scale and the technology and the way in which it was done. So this is not to denigrate whatsoever the, the fate of the Armenians or others who before and since have suffered uh, in genocide, but simply to say that, that, that this was a, a quite unique uh, mechanism. Next question is immediately to your front with Connie on the right side, please. Thank you both so much for excellent presentations. Uh, a question for Michael, if we can go back to the plaque. There, and maybe we could see it again. Is that possible? There is, facing yeah, it to the bottom right, there are Hebrew letters. Right. And what are they? I think they mean don't forget. So just next to the Hebrew letters are the French letters, uh, Nubion Jamais, or never forget. So I, I think that's what the Hebrew is referring to, though I, I wouldn't bet my mortgage on that. Okay, well, we have to find out. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it says, it says never forget. And in Hebrew or in Yiddish? In Hebrew. Hebrew. Okay. In Hebrew, because, of course, these are Sephardic Jews, most of whom would not have spoken Yiddish. They would have spoken French, maybe Ladino, if they spoke a Jewish language, but unlikely to be Yiddish. Yeah, oh, there actually, it is. Just, a, just an interesting point to that is that the first Jews who were, who were um, uh, transported were Jews who'd fled from mostly Poland, who were stateless, and therefore they were, in a sense, easy to, mm -hmm. to move, um, including the young Grinspan, who, whose parents were being deported across the German-Polish border and um, in such terrible conditions that he murdered a, an official in Paris, sparking a Kristallnacht. So it, it, just to be clear, what it says at the bottom there is not never forget. It says passerby remember, and it uses the informal uh, to form of French. So it's an informal speaking to you as a friend kind of thing. And I don't know what the Hebrew says, but I, I, would, I would suspect it's a translation of that. To your left towards the front, please. Was there a relationship between the German campaign against the Soviet Union and the decisions made and the timing of the decisions made at Bonsai? Well, yes. As I mentioned, the first phase of what we know of as the Holocaust um, was Barbarossa, was the invasion of the Soviet Union. And, um, and it was, this was the, the mass killings into pits, the Holocaust by bullets. Um, and so this was really the first, first phase when the Germans had decided, the Nazis had decided that, that uh, the extermination of the Jews uh, was paramount now. Um, it coincides with the closing of all borders. The last place that Jews could get out of Europe was Lisbon. That was closed off at the same time, and therefore Jews were, the decision was made not to try and push Jews out to Palestine or to Britain or wherever, but to lock them in and then they were destined for, for mass murder. So yes, it is related to, to Barbarossa and the invasion of the Soviet Union as the first phase, effectively, of the Holocaust. Next question is in the center aisle with Connie, please. Uh, in his book, um, Hitler's Willing Executioners, uh, Daniel Goldhagen goes into great detail explaining how Hitler didn't really have to do a whole lot of motivating to many Germans because for for decades, for centuries, including all the way back to Martin Luther, uh, the, Jew, the, the theologians, politicians, writers had discussed the, the Germany's Jewish problem or their Jewish misery, and therefore, like the guys of uh, Police Battalion 101, took their wives along when they were killing thousands and thousands of Jews in pits and count in, in, in Poland. And I just like to ask you, I mean, how is it? I mean, I still have a, a difficulty. In, putting my head around how, how a cultured people could just ignore all this stuff and go on with it. And 
and they're the ones that the, the functionaries and the cops and the you know the guys in the police battalion 101 were older they most of them were not members of the nazi party yet they went along and took their wives longer they killed uh, with, with glee help me understand the what happened there well again this is one of the most baffling questions of of of, of history how could the Germans, this this land of Bach and Beethoven and, and Goethe and Schiller, uh, have have become the perpetrators of such a horrific crime. Um, I mean, Goldhagen has been somewhat discredited as, as one of the he's one of the intentionalists that that you know everything was pre-planned and 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 it was because the Germans had this history of anti-Semitism that led inevitably to the Holocaust. Um, recent scholarship people like Christopher Browning, you mentioned Gerlach and others have have have, have put a little bit more nuance onto this that the Germans weren't predestined to do this. It was something that happened along the way. In fact, I think that makes it even worse because, because it wasn't something they couldn't help in their DNA or whatever. It was actually the, the Holocaust was man-made. It was choices taken day by day by people like the ones at Vanze who made this decision, then they made this decision, then they made this decision, which ended up in, the, in this horrific mass, mass murder. Um, and the irony after the war, as I said, even talking about the people who were um, arrested and questioned over their um, in, involvement in Vanze, said, we didn't do anything. I had no idea what you're talking about. We, had, we, we, we weren't involved in this. No, we didn't shoot uh, anybody. We didn't go to the camps. I never saw a camp. Didn't even know they existed. And they, and they were able to morally distance themselves um, from, from the fact that they, of course, knew exactly what uh, transportation to the East meant. Uh, they called the Jews Stuck, pieces, not human beings. Uh, and and th this language was even deliberately developed in order to distance their, themselves morally from the thing that they were doing. But the overall question that you've asked is, is one of the great mysteries. And when we say never again and this should never happen again or whatever else, it's like, what, what do we mean exactly? What is it, coming back to the question of education, what is it that we're trying to warn against? What is it that we're trying to prevent? And it doesn't help to say, oh, you know, well, they were, they, they were just anti-Semitic from birth, so, so that's, we'll, it'll never happen with us. That's not the answer. The answer is every single human being is capable of great good and great evil. And if the circumstances, propaganda, the uh, conditions are such that people make those wrong, immoral, uh, criminal choices, uh, you know, the question is, how does that come about? How do we prevent that from coming about? Let me add something here. In German, it sounds even better. How could das Volk der Dichter und Denker become das Volk der Richter und Henker? Mm. How could the people of poets and uh, thoughtful people, philosophers, become the people of, uh, of hangmen, so to speak? But on, on the Goldhagen controversy, I would add this. Uh, I remember when Goldhagen was here at Turo Synagogue in New Orleans giving a speech, and he filled the synagogue, more than a thousand people. So he was uh, a phenomenon when the book came out in Germany, too. Uh, but then I think uh, more thoughtful people like Chris Browning, who has been at this conference, came and gave, a, as Alexandra said, a more nuanced explanation of uh, the police battalion 101. And so I would say today in Holocaust scholarship, Goldhagen no longer is the gold standard because he came up with a very deterministic argument that the Nazis had been anti-Semitic since Middle Ages and they still were at the time of World War II and that explains it all. To your left at the very front, please. Uh, thank you very much. The, the Nazis were a lot of things but they were not chemical engineers or mechanical engineers. Can you talk about the role that German industry played in the, in the development and construction of these camps? Uh, and were any of them ever held accountable uh, for their role or any consequences in, in making these things happen? Uh, no, there were Nazis who were chemical engineers and biologists and chemists and all sorts of other things. And in fact, the, um, the experts in the T4 euthanasia program um, went on to work from, you know, they were, they were 
um, pediatricians and, and, and medical doctors or whatever who then, when the euthanasia program stopped, just transferred themselves into, um, into working in the camps and figuring out what was the best way to gas people or whatever else. Um, you're right that the, the organization TOTE and all many, many, many other uh, industrial concerns um, uh, were, were involved in the creation of the camps. The, you know, specialists came to check which, how do you build the crematoria. Specialists came to say, well, how do you, how do you empty the Cyclone B into the canister, from the canisters and so on. On all layers of German society, um, uh, industry, uh, finance and um, chemists and all others took part in this exercise. And all, all of this, you know, for example, with the building of Auschwitz, we have, we have um, documentation for practically every single contract that was given out uh, to these people. We have, we, have, uh, uh, we have evidence of the contracts, for example, of the companies that worked in the Wuj ghetto or in the Warsaw ghetto, um, the, the Tobin's brush factory. I mean, we've got, we've got lists and lists of these things. Um, but again, after the war, most of these people got off scot-free because they said, I had nothing to do with this. I didn't pull a trigger. I didn't, I didn't kill anybody. And so um, with very, very few exceptions, and you have horrific cases of some of the doctors who were involved in the euthanasia program uh, and indeed in the Holocaust itself, going back to becoming famous pediatricians or, or medical doctors in uh, German society. So I think one of the problems after the war was the disconnect between the, um, the mass uh, of uh, people who were involved in creating this horror um, and the misunderstanding that it wasn't just Himmler, Heydrich, and Hitler at the top who did this. It was many, many, many people being involved, but they were often cogs in a wheel and so could distance themselves after the war. And as I mentioned briefly, because of the Cold War, there wasn't really the enthusiasm to go after everybody who was involved because we needed chemists and engineers and so on to rebuild Germany, so it became a stable democracy in the heart of Europe after the war. So a blind eye was turned to a lot of people who perhaps should have been questioned, at least, if not uh, imprisoned. Uh, Alexandra, permit me to add a footnote since you mentioned the role of doctors in the euthanasia program. Not too long ago, uh, the California historian Edith Schaffer came out with a book on Dr. Asperger. Uh, Dr. Asperger was an Austrian doctor who gave the name to Asperger syndrome. And uh, Schaffer explained how he was involved in killing children am Spiegelgrund in Vienna in the euthanasia program. So she pleads for the name Asperger syndrome therefore being changed. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but just uh, to again show you how these battles are still being fought as new information is being discovered. Exactly. Yeah. Next question is to your far right, halfway back with Connie. Um, just a quick lead in to the question. Uh, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, Edward Teller a long time ago, and Teller made a comment in a private conversation we were having, and he said, uh, it's going to happen again. Holocausts are going to happen again. He didn't, and, he, and I asked him, and he didn't mean just to Jews, he said, Holocausts are going to happen again around the world. They have. He was right, Cambodia, Africa today, ongoing, others, Kosovo, you can perhaps add to the list or, or correct my comment. So question, there aren't probably too many Holocaust deniers here <laughs> in, this, in this forum, but there are some around the world. Um, is our forums like this are the kinds of research that you all and others here continue to do, are memorials and plaques enough to prevent more Holocaust from occurring? And if not, what else can be done? Well, I think it's, a, again, a huge, huge question. Um, I think that everything that we try to do, whether or not, whether or not it's the creation of institutions, a respect for human rights and international law and the things that the institutions that were put in place partly because of and, and after uh, the horrors of uh, the Second World War, um, fighting against Holocaust deniers. I mean, the, the trial against David Irving was a, was a milestone in that regard and, and constantly trying to, um, you know, say to people who, who denied the Holocaust, look, the, this is the evidence. Have absolutely, absolutely 100% 
uh, 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 credible scholarship so that nobody could say, ah, oh, you see, this wasn't correct or whatever else. But I mean, I think the, the, the real way to, to prevent such things from happening again is to build um, democratic, uh, tolerant societies based on the rule of law and based on those uh, rights and, and privileges that were uh, put in place after the, after the war. It's a tall, tall order, as you rightly said. Very, very difficult. But, you know, that's, and, and then education and information and so on. I'm sure you have. I, I would just say that I think this is why the Goldhagen debate was so important. If you wanted to, you could read Goldhagen and say, well, this is specific to Germany in the mid 20th century, and we can kind of close the door and sleep at night that this isn't going to repeat itself. And that's why the book was such a hit in Germany. It was telling Germans, you've turned that door, you've locked that behind you. Um, I, I wish I could believe that, but as you pointed out, the evidence is that, that that's not true. So I'm not sure if what we do reaches the levels that it needs to reach, but the debates that we have are important, and the way that people understand our work is very important. To well, your left, I, I think oh, ultimately what it depends on is whether it will get into the schools. We can do it here, we can do it at the university level where I do it regularly, but if it doesn't reach schools, and if you have school administrators in Texas, who think the Holocaust needs to be contextualized, then we are in trouble. <laughs> to your left, towards the front. Um, I heard or read one time about a German concentration camp um, commander being asked, how could you commit such monstrous acts? And he made a comment he said, killing one Jew was hard, but it made killing 10 easier. Killing 10 Jews was hard, but it made killing 100 easier. Killing 100 was hard, but it made killing 1,000 easier. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but um, would you like to comment on <clears throat> how this thing kind of snowballed and got worse and worse and worse? Well, this, this is... Uh a common phenomenon. I mean, Stalin said, you know, one is a number, a million is a statistic, and people forget statistics. So, um, you know, the, the, this is true of, I think, a, a situation like this where, uh, you know, um, even people like Erich von den Bach-Zaleski and Himmler um, were worried about this sort of one-on-one -on -one killing. In fact, um, Himmler goes to Minsk in 1942 and watches a killing take place, and he's shattered by it. Uh, he gets blood on his, on his tunic, and he's, you know, isn't this terrible? And von der Bach says to him, you see, Himmler, this is a killing of just 100 people. Just imagine what my poor men are facing with the, with the killing of over a million people. And this was very much the impetus for the Holocaust, as I said, for the, for the extermination camps, uh, which, of course, were very different from the camps like Dachau and, and Sachsenhausen, which we know in our pub public memory, because they were precisely that. The statistics, the numbers got so high um, you know, when you think, as I said, 1.1 million people murdered at Auschwitz, how, who in this room can imagine what 1.1 million people looks like? Uh, it, you know, it, whereas a group of 10 people we can somehow relate to. So I agree with you that the, that the higher the numbers got, the more distance they were from our little tiny imaginations. If you have a... No. You said that perfectly. Next question is to your right. This is a what did you know and when did you know it question. Um, there had to be at some point when America's military and political leadership understood what was going on in Germany. When was that? It's a really tough question. So you have information coming in. How do you piece it together? How do you figure out what's going on? I think what goes on is the evidence if for some people what's being discussed is so horrible and so unimaginable that they don't believe that it's actually happening. I think for others, the decision-making calculus is, okay, we know what's happening, what's the best way to stop it? The U.S. government, senior levels of the U.S. government clearly knew by the fall of 1942 what Germany's intent was, what they were doing to achieve it. The question was, do you make any special effort outside the war effort to stop it? Um, I asked this question to a few World War II veterans that were in my family, who were, my family's Jewish, when did you know? 
what was going on. And their answer was, we heard terrible, terrible things, but not until 1945 did we know for sure that those rumors were true. We just couldn't psychologically process it. And there's the, the famous sto uh, story of Jan Karski, who of course was one of the couriers in, in Poland who got to London and actually flew to see Roosevelt, who dismissed him. Actually, he had gotten himself smuggled into the Warsaw Ghetto and also into one of the transit camps to, to for Helno. And he goes to talk to um, then Chief Justice Frankfurter and says, you know, this is what's going on. This is, these are the crimes that are being committed. I'm an eyewitness to it. And Frankfurter says to him, it's not that I say that you're lying. It's just that I don't believe you. But Paul, I think uh, the debate came to the fore in the debate about whether the trunk lines to Auschwitz should be bombed. And if you recall, the Assistant Secretary of War, John J. McCloy, we heard about him uh, yesterday, he sort of decided not to do that because he wanted to concentrate all the effort on winning the war first, and that would liberate the Jews, as, as he thought. And I think that debate took place in the fall of 1944. So that's when it was discussed within the U.S. government. To your right, about halfway back with Connie, please. Good morning. Um, it's funny how you remember things. Years ago, I watched a movie. I think it was called A Town Without Pity. Um, and it wasn't about the Holocaust, but one of the comments was that it was, it was about a trial in Germany of, a, I think it was an American soldier uh, after the war. But one of the comments from a German that was interviewed by, I think it was Kirk Douglas, she said that the people didn't know anything, the German people, we didn't know, we didn't know. And I, be I was a kid, so I believed that comment at the time. L years later, as I did more reading, I said there's no way they could not have known. I'm not talking about the people that were working in the, at the camps or in the industry, just the general population. So can you comment about, I mean, we talk about what the United States knew. What about the German population? And were there any efforts within the population to help those, some Jews? Can I give it a stab? Yeah. Uh, I think you're referring to the case of Anna Rosmus, uh, which was a young woman in uh, Bavaria who somehow got interest in what did her town know. I think it was uh, Regensburg in Bavaria, and she found out that nobody knew anything or said they knew nothing, but then she discovered that there was all kinds of war criminals in her midst too. I think that's what you're referring to, but on your larger question, let me answer it from an Austrian perspective. So I was born in a small village in the Austrian Alps close to the Swiss border, and there was no Jewish people living there, so people had probably a general anti-Semitism, because there was lots of Nazi propaganda towards that direction, but uh, they didn't really have the experience of Jews. So if they tell me they didn't know anything, I tend to actually believe them. However, if you lived in a town like Vienna that had 200,000 Jews, that more than 10% of the population was Jewish, and of course they were gone after 1938, uh, there is no way you could not know, because you saw people later on being deported if they hadn't left on their own. So uh, I would generally say in urban areas, you must have known. In rural areas, people might get away with saying, I didn't know. And just to add to that, the, the, um, from the different perspective, the soldiers going off to the front, especially if you were on the Eastern Front in 1941, 42, there's absolutely no way that you wouldn't have uh, either seen yourself, and there was um, sort of massacre tourism, people going there with their little Leica cameras and taking pictures of these, these massacres, although sometimes it was frowned upon. Um, but at least you certainly would have heard about the, what the Einsatzgruppen were up to. Um, you would have certainly known about the treatment of the Soviet prisoners of war, uh, 5.2 million of whom were captured and about 3.5 3 million of whom died um, in terrible conditions. So it was impossible for even an ordinary Wehrmacht soldier who was in on the front at that time, for example, to not have had knowledge of the sorts of crimes that were being committed by the Germans. There were also letters home, there were also uh, going home on leave, there were ways in which this information sort of filtered into the society. But the question was, you know, what could a, a German 
do about it if, if they heard that there was some sort of massacres going on on, on the Eastern Front. Um, and so I think a lot of people um, stepped back. They didn't want to accept responsibility um, and, and, uh, and chose to effectively do nothing and just close their minds to what was going on. Um, so there, so it's, it's not that they did not know, but they choose not, chose not to pay attention. But there was also Germans and Austrians who resisted. That was another option. But those were the brave people that we're going to talk about next year in the symposium, the European resistance. But let me just mention two cases. Uh, the White Rose students, the Scholl brothers and sisters in Munich uh, who uh, protested uh, because they knew terrible things happened on the Eastern Front. Of course, uh, they were executed by the Nazis. And there was a lesser known Austrian case, uh, uh, Franz Jägerstetter, a very simple farmer living in where Hitler was born, close to in Upper Austria. He refused to be drafted. And he was executed too for refusing to be drafted because that couldn't be tolerated. So those were brave, rare cases of people who knew and were horrified by what was happening. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our panel. Thank you to Gunter, Alex, and Mike. They will all be outside at the book signing station right now. Our break will last until 9.45 when the next session begins, but as you will recall, we will be playing an oral history showcase a couple of minutes before the session begins. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tyler Bamford, Leventhal Research Fellow here at the National World War II Museum. And today joining me is Dr. Jason Dossie, Research Historian here at the National World War II Museum. Today we're going to talk about the liberation of Dora Middlebow by the 104th Infantry Division on April 11th. Dr. Dossie, can you tell me what the experience of the 104th Infantry Division was leading up to their liberation of Dora Middlebow? So the 104th Infantry Division is a fascinating story in its own right, Tyler. Like, it's a unit that trained in mostly in the Pacific Northwest, and so it earned this nickname the Timberwolf Division. And by the time it's ready to ship out in 1944 for combat in Western Europe, it's under the command of Major General uh, Terry de la Mesa Allen Sr., known as Terrible Terry to uh, many of his men. And the unit has a long history, really some 200 days of combat. It lands in early September 1944. It sees some action connected to Hürtgen Forest, mm -hmm. fights in Belgium and the Netherlands, and part of that time it's actually fighting with British and Canadian units, and then gets pulled back to the First Army, American First Army. It does basically defensive fighting from the time of the Battle of the Bulge, late December 1944 into February 1945. Mm -hmm. 
And then once things go on the offensive again for the United States, it's involved in taking the, the great German Rhine city of Cologne. And then the following month is involved in the, the Ruhr Pocket offensive where the Americans surround an entire German army group. So the division has a long record of combat before it gets to Dora Metalbau, and then it sees something that is absolutely horrifying. So when this veteran division comes upon Dora Metalbau, what is the scene that greets it? What, what is exactly that these veterans come, what is it they see? It's really difficult to put into words. I mean, it was a, a, an utter hell, this, this camp. And Americans, I think we think we know a lot about the Nazi camp system, but there's many of these camps we don't know so much about. I mean, we're familiar with Dachau, perhaps, maybe Buchenwald. But Dora Metalbau was very different from those camps insofar as that it was set up really in 1943 to be a producer of the V-2 rocket, the A-4 or V-2 Vengeance Weapon 2 rocket mm -hmm. that the Nazi dictatorship thought would be a, a miracle weapon, would really change the course of the war. So they had this underground facility at Dora Metalbau, it's north of the city of Nordhausen mm -hmm. in the southern part of the Harz Mountains in central Germany. And there this gigantic facility was put into place by slave labor. And they, it was underground. I mean, for at least much of the time, the prisoners worked. And actually, prisoners may be too generous. I mean, these are inmates. They're, they're forced laborers uh, that are they're living underground. They're working underground under the most brutal conditions. Twelve-hour days may be short days. You know, with they're basically being whipped, being beaten, and in many cases where... The SS uh, feels like they need to make examples out of people. They, they execute prisoners for what would seem to many of us to be fairly um, minor infractions. So it's draconian. It's absolutely a brutal place. And there's some 6,000 of these V-2 rockets were produced there during the second half of World War II. And we think that in the process, about 20,000 of these inmates perished at Dora Metalbau. So when the 104th Infantry Division arrives there on the 11th of April, the 3rd Armored Division had already discovered the site, and the Armored Division asked for help, mm -hmm. and understandably so. They were facing a, a, a real catastrophe, and so they found about 750 inmates that the SS had abandoned when they moved, they moved others to Bergen-Belsen, which was liberated by the British four days later on April 15th. But about 750 they find alive, and they find about 3,000 corpses while they're there, too. So the 104th Division comes across what is basically a humanitarian crisis, and this is a scene that they're not at all prepared to experience, um, And in, in addition to the 3rd Armored, like you mentioned. So what is it that, that these veterans, you know, could have done at that time? What is it that they would have been doing? They really do swing into action, and the first thing is to get as much medical care as possible for the survivors. Uh, many of them are emaciated, uh, there's, there's disease, and just maltreatment. There's really a series of factors that had added up for the, uh, for the men that are there. And these are men that, by the way, are from all over, from the Soviet Union, from Poland, from Czechoslovakia, from France. In some cases they had been people in the resistance. Others had people who had, quote, criminal backgrounds that are brought there. They, they have different backgrounds, but had come together in this sort of polyglot universe that the SS created underground there. And so the, the men of the 104th are just doing what they can do, and, and that's, it's really on the fly. Everything they're doing is, is, is with as much urgency as they can, and it's amazing, in fact, what they're able to accomplish given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting, too, that the 104th, like many American units, they do not allow Germans in the surrounding area to pretend they didn't know about the camp or that would have gone on there, you know, that they could simply pretend or ignore it. So they force many of them to come in and bury the dead. Wow. 
And it's important to remember that the Dora Mittelbau was one of thousands of, of concentration camps and work camps all throughout Germany, and that even though uh, many Germans feigned ignorance, these camps were everywhere from rural isolated areas to the suburbs of major cities. Now, the 104th Infantry was one of 36 divisions that the United States Holocaust Museum has identified as liberator divisions, and it's important as we come across, as we come upon the anniversary of victory in Europe, that we remember these uh, liberators and the liberated at the same time. J.J. Whitmire was a platoon leader with the 79th Infantry Division and spent more than 200 days on the front lines battling through hedgerow country in France. After a particularly brutal day, Whitmire and his platoon were dispatched to track down a German machine gun unit responsible for killing a company commander the previous day. I had three other people with me, and I had a little fellow named Ferriola. I took care of him like he was my son. I really took good care of him. So we crawled along behind this brick wall, and I'm the first one in. And I guess the other guys pretty much smeared up too. The company commander called for Whitmire's platoon to rejoin the unit on the other side of the wall. I took this very old by the hand and I got up on the wall and I pulled him up on the wall and that machine gun cut loose and, and it hit this boy through his neck right in its V. I was sitting on the ground and had him cradle in my arms and he was squirting blood all over me. He died. This was like my kid. Lapley told me afterward, he said, Everybody around you took your rifle and fired every round they had in their rifle. I know that's where I changed from. First, I had to change from a civilian to a soldier. Then I had to change from a, a soldier to a, a killer. Whitmire later fought in the port city of Cherbourg, France, and moved with the unit to Haganel, where he was wounded in combat. In June 1943, Charles McGee was one of the first graduates of an experimental Army pilot training program at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. It was the first time in American history that African Americans were allowed to fly military aircraft. After graduation, McGee was assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group, where he escorted heavy bombers from the 15th Air Force over targets in occupied Europe. I ended up uh, in one dogfight and shooting down a Falkworth 190, and we uh, provided our escort, and only if the bombers were attacked did we dispatch a flight to fight off that attack, and I was dispatched and fortunately was able to get a bead on the Falkworth over the aerodrome. The dogfights take place pretty quickly, and in a few minutes it's over, and you're climbing back up to join the back in or head back home uh, yourself. After 137 combat missions, the reality of war sinks in. When you realize that, first of all, that fire they're putting up is meant to, knock you out of the sky, uh, uh, it gets your attention, and the idea is not to kill the other pilots. You don't go in with that, but to destroy their aircraft, and hopefully they bailed out. I'm not so sure in the case of mine that the pilot got out, but uh, that's, it was one or the other, and uh, so you do your job. After the war, McGee remained in the Air Force until 1973, retiring as a colonel. Charles McGee flew more combat missions in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam than any other Air Force pilot. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command, and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Hostilities will end 
officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe's day. Tomorrow will also be victory in Europe's day. But let us not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. Japan, with all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. The injuries she has inflicted upon Great Britain, the United States and other countries, and her detestable cruelties call for justice and retribution. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our task, both at home and abroad. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the king. They call about three of us and said, you are now going to Ascudo, Michigan, and you'll be a part of the Tuskegee. They didn't call it an experiment, but that's what it was. According to the uh, study of black men in 1918 by the War Department, a black man who could not qualify uh, to be taught how to fly a plane. Unbelievable. Well, these persons had degrees in, from college and lawyers and whatever. And they say, it's a whole race of people that don't qualify. <laughs> what waste. After three years, 43, 44, 1945, December, I am given an honorable discharge after these years overseas in southern Italy. 1051st quartermaster of the 96 Air Service Group attached to the 332nd Fighter Group. After serving that time with them, I came back and said, you cannot come in this door, boy. And a railroad station, when I was trying to buy a ticket home four to five minutes after I had been honorably discharged. You cannot come in this home, colored people had to walk around the back. I was born in segregation. It was something that you didn't get used to. We lift the American flag up in spite of the condition at home. One victory. Two, to come back home and fight segregation following Martin Luther King. That was the second victory. Hello, my name is Tyler Bamford, Leventhal Research Fellow here at the National World War II Museum. And today joining me is Dr. Jason Dossie, research historian here at the National World War II Museum. Today we're going to talk about the liberation of Dora Middlebow by the 104th Infantry Division on
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to please find your seats. We are about to begin our next oral history showcase, immediately followed by our panel. Thank you. I was in the office of the Associated Press uh, one Saturday in 1945, and all of a sudden I, I noticed a huge flurry and there had been a telephone call from the White House press secretary saying President Franklin Roosevelt has died. And the AP being instantaneous takes no time to talk about it or uh, react in any way. They immediately put a flash, so-called, on the wire and it rings flash all around the world in every AP bureau there is, FDR dead. And that's what they say. Then they turn to those of us in the office uh, who just happened to be there on Saturday and said, get comment. So then we get on the telephone, the old <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell telephone, and we call up senators and congressmen and justices of the Supreme Court, and we tell them this news and they are absolutely overwhelmed, there being no TV and the radio being slow to get the news and the AP having instantaneously uh, relayed the news and we would call. We are calling from the Associated Press. President Roosevelt has died. Please give us your comments. And I particularly remember calling Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black uh, who was always very verbal and always had plenty of things to say, and he was, at, at, at that moment, speechless. Uh, but so we did use the old cranky telephone to tell people in Washington this absolutely astounding news, which we had not expected. Ladies and gentlemen, before the MC takes the stage, a friendly reminder to please find and silence your phones so that they do not interrupt the session or the speakers. Thank you very much. Hey, hey so welcome back, everybody. Another uh, opportunity to keep moving. I'm, I'm incredibly interested in this one, having uh, over the years uh, in the Gulf War, one of my tasks was the, the care and feeding of uh, Joe Galloway. Uh, you know, later uh, in Iraq, uh, we had a, a number of uh, correspondents that, that we take on the battlefield with us. And, and you know, how do they see the, the conflict, but also how important was it the interaction with them and the understanding that they would have as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, later uh, when, when I would you know, I'd be a uh, senior White House official was by my, uh, will show up in the newspaper. It'd be interesting, the, the interaction with correspondence and, and that piece. So uh, incredibly uh, uh, pertinent time. You know, certainly now we have uh, Twitter feeds and things like that that you're responding to. You know, not just the AP on the wire that the president's dead, but uh, it's certainly how we communicate and how we understand that, but also the incredibly powerful role of, of correspondence in this as we move forward. So uh, we have uh, author and literature teacher Janet Somerville, uh, and we have uh, Hillary Roberts, who's the senior curator of photographs at the Imperial War Museum. I should note, um, you know, great uh, opportunity to build institutional ties with the Imperial War Museum. You know, so thanks, Hillary, for being here. Uh, Janet and Hillary will be discussing the work and lives of two female war correspondents. Uh, and then uh, in this process, our long-standing museum presidential advisor, acclaimed historian Dr. Don Miller, who you met yesterday, he'll provide comments and questions for our panelists. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll open it up for the group as well. Now, I should note that, you know, Don, of course, is, is, uh, has, has his, his role in the I think the media sphere, if you will. Uh, so in addition to his uh, achievements as an author, he's a TV consultant and involved in museum travel and workshop. And of course, his Masters of the Air is the primary source for an upcoming Apple TV miniseries. So we're, we're into the world of uh, you know, public awareness as, as we think about this and how do we cross into that. So 
with that, I'm going to turn it over to Don, and uh, good luck. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Glad to be here again. Um, so um, a couple years ago, I um, organized and led a, a World War II tour. And the theme of the tour was um, war correspondence in Northern Europe. And we took the story from D-date to the end. Um, we traveled across Omaha and Malo and across to Rem and Paris and then out to, uh, wound up in Herkton Forest, actually. And um, along the way, we had a nice group of people, full crowd and full bus load. And uh, along the way, people kept coming up to me individually, not as groups individually. We didn't take a survey or anything. And mostly the guys kept saying, you know, and I should say this, I, I included male and female correspondents almost equally. They kept saying, next time we do this, why don't we just do the women? <laughs> they're, they're a lot more interesting. Uh, they're better writers, and they're into, into the kind of things that are more relevant today. Um, I was glad to hear that, because I was, at the time, beginning a book on women correspondence. So, um, and I think they're right. Um, you know, um, they stack up with... Um, Cronkite and Rooney and uh, Pyle and Whitehead and all the other, Erwin Shaw and all the other luminaries. Um, I came across a quote from a New Yorker writer, Bill Buford, a guy I, I like to read. He was, a, he was a fiction editor in New Yorker. And uh, it sums up, I think, both. Although it's about Gellhorn, it sums up Miller and Gellhorn. Reading Martha Gellhorn for the first time is a staggering experience. She's not a travel writer or a journalist or a novelist. She's all of these things and one of the most eloquent witnesses of the 20th century. So you're going to be treated today to the um, uh, illuminations of two really extraordinary uh, writers. Um, the, um, you have the introductions in the um, brochure. I'm not going to go into a long introduction. I'll just say that um, how I stumbled upon them. I, was in London in 2015 and went to the exhibit that uh, <laughs> our friend here organized at the, uh, Hillary organized at the Imperial War Museum on Lee Miller. And I, I had known Miller before, but this was a stunner. And then I picked up the book, uh, you know, a, a Woman's War, and it was just fabulous. It was so beautifully done, first of all, um, based on photographs that had been hidden for years in the attic of Farley Farm and in East Sussex, where Miller spent her last years and never even told her son who, uh, what she had done in World War II. He discovered it, 66,000 pieces of prints and photographs and things in, in the attic after she passed away from cancer. I think it was 19, what, 77 or, yeah. And um, so that started me going and um, she's gonna be talking about Miller and her book. and. Uh, I've read a lot of Martha Gellhorn's stuff, and um, I was uh, in a bookshop in Washington, D.C., and um, I picked up Janet's book, and it was a stunner for me, because there, Gellhorn has been anthologized, but not quite in the way uh, that this book was organized. It, it did the war years, it take, although it takes you up to 1948, and the pre-war years when she was working with, uh, you know, living at the White House and, and doing reportage uh, for the New Deal for Henry Hopkins, Harry Hopkins. And uh, what I liked about the book was not only the selection, very judicious selection, um, she's, a, she's a real pro. She works in the archives, uh, the restricted archives of Martha Gellhorn at Boston University. So it's a wonderful selection, but interwoven with the selections, uh, the letters, are little pocket biographies of, um, of Gellhorn that take you, uh, that set the context for the photographs and, and place you chronologically where you ought to be and tell you a little bit about what's coming up and, uh, and some analysis as well, some very astute analysis. So um, I thought I was in the hands of a real writing pro and uh, I thought the book really worked well. And then I saw a really nice review of it, the New York Review of Books. So.
so be it. Let me just begin here with just a couple of brief words about these correspondence, and then I'll pass this on. The, um, the accreditation process for the accreditation process for women photographers in World War II was pretty tough. Um, men didn't want women in this war, particularly the, uh, the command staffs. Um, there are only 140 um, American uh, and British women who were um, accredited to cover the war. Usually, you got a, a paper like Collier's, which is very popular in, in, in the war years, an American publication, would get one correspondent, and that was it, and they could accredit them. There were certain exceptions for people like Margaret Burke White, but that was generally, uh, generally who was the real pet of the administration, but that was generally, generally the rule. And, um, but women didn't get into the war. Uh, they covered war, uh, the Blitz, and Gellhorn, of course, was an experienced journalist um, throughout the 30s. I mean, she covered wars in, uh, she covered Czechoslovakia as it was falling to Hitler. She was in Helsinki when the Russians bombed the city. She was with Hemingway in Spain covering the, 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 uh, the Spanish Civil War. I mean, so she's an experienced journalist, but even she couldn't work her way in to get in, you know, into Europe in 43 uh, until 1944 when the invasion arises. And, and just before the invasion, some of these women are not only accredited, but they're allowed to go to the front. And slowly, they, they had to go to, evac to areas in the rear. Uh, Miller, for example, first covered nurses um, who were running an evacuation hospital just off, the, off Omaha Beach. And uh, she did some stunning shots of the hospitals there and things like this. But eventually, she, like Gellhorn, pushes herself. And you'll see, you know, they'll tell that story. I, I don't need to do it now. They push themselves to the front, almost always against orders, and sometimes resulting in, in military arrest. And both of these women were arrested several times. So they, they, they really wedge themselves into the war, and by... Uh, 45, they are finally allowed in the press camps um, that, 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 that covered the war, and they're closer to the front. I mean, here these women are working without military briefings, so they're driving around with nurses picking up bodies and things like that, and they don't know where the Allies are shooting, and so they're under friendly fire a lot of the times. They had to figure out on their own where they're going to sleep and eat, they had to figure out on their own how to get their dispatches back and file their dispatches back in London. They were not allowed to use any of the uh, equipment that the men were provided with, radio transmission, things like that, nothing. And many of them, you know, especially Gellhorn and Miller, preferred to work alone or with just one other companion. Uh, so they're soloists. And so it's an amazing feat that they were able to bring these stories forward. And by the end of the war, both of them are both at the tip of the spear and covering the aftermath of battles, and which was, I think, was their specialty. So you get, I think, in their writings, a, a very different kind of war than the men were reporting. Uh, men, um, most of World War II reportage is by men and about men. But this is a different kind of world here that they're writing about, a, a woman's world. And um, a lot of their coverage is of suffering women in, uh, in Germany and, uh, and, East, and, and, and Western Europe. And some of it's pretty tough stuff. It's pretty tough stuff, as we'll see. So I'm going to turn you over to our panelists and kind of drift to the sideline here and ask a few questions later on. But I've asked them to each do a 10-minute summation um, that's a bad word, isn't it? Summations are so hard. But um, a, 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 a ten-minute introduction uh, to their uh, to their subjects. Okay, so um, we'll start off with the um, the Ferner <laughs> from the Imperial War Museum, who I'm told she said they say on the thing that she's senior curator. I was just over at the Imperial War Museum. Everybody told me, oh. Yeah, she runs the place. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for your warm welcome. It's a 
privilege and a pleasure to be here. I think I'm the first member of my institution to be allowed into your fair country. <laughs> Possibly the last after today, we'll have to see. But um, it's wonderful to be able to uh, come here to talk about Lee Miller. Um, I would like to congratulate Gwen, Murray, and Jennifer for their excellent panel yesterday afternoon, which laid out many of the themes and issues which shaped Lee's life and career. I mean, it was so encouraging to hear about their work, and, you know, it matters, it's important. I'm going to start briefly by outlining how my project, Lee Miller, A Woman's War, came to be. Um, the work of women war photographers has been a consistent thread running throughout my career at IWM, which dates back an awful long way. Um, public interest in the subject, however, has waxed and waned, often reflecting fluctuating public interest in questions of gender and women's place in society. In this context, there's been a considerable number of research projects addressing the role of women conflict photographers, really from the turn of the 20th century, 1900, South Africa, um, right up to the present day. Um, in 2010, God, that's a long way away, um, I found myself sitting on a bus, traveling through Jordan with Lee Miller's son, Anthony Penrose. As an alternative to camel spotting, he asked whether I'd be interested in working on a project about his mother. The obvious answer was yes, but I wanted to try and take it in a slightly different direction. In what way did Lee Miller's gender shape her work and our understanding of the impact of conflict on women's lives? Five years later, as um, you've already heard, I was privileged to curate um, a major IWM exhibition um, in London, and this, uh, the book uh, came out of that project. And um, it's extraordinary, actually, how many people saw that exhibit. Um, and it is, you know, I just sort of feel that um, it is uh, a great honor to have been able to work on it. Um, Kate Winslet, the actress, um, the day after the launch of the exhibition, announced that she would be working to develop a film, a Holly, um, feature film, on uh, Lee Miller, which follows many of the threads that this book explores. And so I really felt that um, at that point in 2015, I had started something. So let me start by introducing Lee Miller. Who was she? Lee, or Elizabeth Miller, was born in Poughkeepsie in upstate New York in 1907. She was, in turn, a fashion model. You can see how stunningly beautiful she was. An artist's muse, a surrealist, a professional photographer in fashion and also in um, uh, you know, celebrity lifestyle, a war photographer, a journalist, and finally, an award-winning cordon bleu cook. <laughs> and there is a recipe book which, uh, of her recipes, her extraordinary recipes, which I would thoroughly recommend. Um, they are interesting, but they are very palatable. So Lee Miller, um, was one of the generation the f which was first entitled to vote. But nevertheless, she lived in a man's world, and she knew it. She had to work um, through the system where, um, on her own terms, but also accommodating uh, the, the inevitabilities of the, the day. And she was interviewed early on in her career about how, where she took her inspiration from. And this quote 
what you mostly do is absorb the character of the man you're working with. Um, I mean, that is of the times, but uh, it reflects the fact that the majority of professional photographers in the, at that time were in fact men, but that photography itself was acceptable one of the, as one of the very few professions in which women uh, could be um, not only sort of working, but also influencing and leading. Um, so the influence of the men that she worked with included um, Man Ray, with whom she rediscovered uh, the solarization process. And this is Man Ray's um, well-known portrait of her, Lee Miller solarized. Um, another one was George Heuningen Hoene, uh, who was the uh, chief head of studio at French Vogue magazine. Um, Lee Miller's affiliation with Vogue, um, really to the exclusion of every other publishing magazine, um, is key to understanding her work. But photographs such as this are where she learned her trade, and then she took these techniques on and made them her own. In 1939, she found herself in London. She offered her services as a photographer to British Vogue uh, in order to free up uh, the male photographers to go and serve in the context of the war. And for the first three years of the war, in this capacity, she photographed fashion, celebrities, but she also lived through and photographed the Blitz. And here you have in these two photographs a characteristic style of Lee Miller, which is um, photographing women to advantage, never patronizing them, but with a quirky, surrealistic turn, which always excites interest. The other thing about Lee Miller's photography, as I very quickly learned in my project, was read the subtext. So you can enjoy the photographs um, on their own merits, but they also have underlying messages, and they become more fascinating the more you think about that. By 1943, uh, she was an accredited um, war correspondent, and uh, the key influence in this aspect of her life was David E. Sherman, who was a photojournalist for Life magazine. He mentored her in uh, the techniques of documentary photojournalism and war reporting, and he also mentored her in the art of writing. She was completely, she was an incredibly bright, fast learner with what I would perhaps describe as a fairly short attention span. She mastered things very, very quickly, made them her own, and then le looked for the next new challenge. Photojournalism sat very well in this context. Her work was initially published without her words in layouts such as this, and she uh, grew increasingly impatient with the way that this happened because of the lack of control. The Vogue, British Vogue um, had a unique situation to face, um, which was that it was um, at the heart of the European war. French Vogue had um, shut for when it, France uh, became occupied and would not reopen uh, and republish until after the war. American Vogue across the Atlantic, particularly before America entered the war, had a, a very um, remote perspective on what was going on in Britain. And so this was the point that American Vogue and British Vogue, although part of the same stable of Condé Nast magazines, began to part ways and take a different editorial direction. And in British Vogue's time, it was all to do with the relationship with the Ministry of Information and publishing stories in support of the war effort. So women in the forces, gaining access to what life was like for women in the forces, which no man could cover. And then, as Don has already mentioned, along came the Normandy landings. And this was where Lee Miller was on her own, but by now she was able 
to write with confidence, and she began to file these stories, such as Unarmed Warriors, that very quickly, as Don has mentioned, became absorbed into the real frontline stuff. So this is her at St. Malo, a greater contrast to the glamorous uh, portraits of her before, you can't imagine. And she was there to photograph the battle for St. Malo, the first use of napalm by the United States forces. Always surrealism, the surrealism of war, the ultimate surrealist experience was a factor in her photography. But she was working for a woman's magazine and her audience was primarily women. And the empathy and understanding, but also commentary uh, was very much part of her photography of this period. This one, there is so much in it um, in terms of symbolism, it almost caused an international incident because um, in France, the way that this woman was dressed was a, a statement of resistance. She is a French resistance worker. She is, using, she is wearing a dress which is wasteful of material. Her hair is styled in what's called the victory ro uh, role. That sent a message to her compatriots in France, but that message wasn't read by American women or British women who said, why is this woman wearing such a wasteful, frivolous costume at the height of war? And Vogue had to actually explain the context to this image. So Lee continued across Europe, um, often working with um, David Sherman, Together, they managed to get the briefings that Lee wasn't normally entitled to, which meant that they were often in advance of any other journalists and in advance of the story. And, of course, the liberation of the con concentration camps um, really uh, was extraordinary. Uh, uh, it shaped her life forever. This is Dachau, and this would haunt Lee for the rest of her life. Uh, right, the end of the war, she was exhausted, um, she was uncertain of her future, her role as a conflict photographer was taken away from her, and she stored her archive away in the attic, left photography, um, and this is the form in which it was discovered after her death. She never willingly talked about her work after the war, and as a result of that, she almost disappeared from view and it was um, she focused on reinventing herself discovering a new different life this is her shortly before her death um, in her kitchen with her uh, surrealist uh, cooking but it was only after her death in 1977 that her son went up to the attic opened the boxes and discovered who his mother had really been and so it is credit to his untiring work that we celebrate Lee Miller today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here lifting up Martha Gellhorn's life and words. And I want to thank Jeremy Collins in particular persevered in putting this panel together. Both Hillary and I were invited either in 2018 or early 2019. So we're both absolutely chuffed to be here with you today in 2021. I don't have nearly as many photographs as, as um, Hillary has shown you because Martha's time in the war was really based on words, but I, there are a few things I'm going to share with you this morning. That is actually a Lee Miller photograph of Martha taken at the Dorchester Hotel in London in 1943, and you'll notice that there are two photos of a rather famous American writer tacked to the mirror. And Martha didn't keep many photographs, period, but those two photos of Ernest Hemingway remain in her restricted papers in Boston University, which I found interesting. 
that, um, that she kept those too. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how I came to write about Marcia, a little bit about her uh, upbringing and how she found her narrative voice writing about the most disenfranchised. My story begins in New Orleans, actually, in April 2015. And I went to Faulkner House Books down on Pirate's Alley in the shadow of the St. Louis Cathedral and was talking to the bookseller there and said, could you recommend something to me that I've maybe never heard of before that you really love? And she said, take this book, what there is to say we have said, which is about the correspondence of two great American writers, Eudora Welty and William Maxwell. And I loved that book. It's about their abiding friendship. It's about their writing lives. It's about their passion for gardening, especially cultivating roses. And I was cavelling about this book on Twitter, and here's where maybe circumstance or serendipity comes to play. And a fellow from Fife, Scotland, responded to me and said, have you ever read the selected letters of Martha Gellhorn? And in April 2015, I had not. So I read that. I read everything I could find in print of Martha's, written by Martha. I read the great biography by Caroline Moorhead, Martha Gellhorn, A Life. I found the only extant publicly accessible copy of her debut novel, which was written and published in 1934, called What Mad Pursuit. The British Library has that in London, so I spent two days in rare books and music, turning the pages and reading that book and decided I was going to write a novel about Martha until Paula McLean, who wrote The Paris Wife about Hadley Richardson and Ernest's first wife, announced that she had, was writing a novel about Martha and Ernest. So I knew I couldn't compete with Paula McLean, number one New York Times bestselling novelist. And another serendipitous thing happened. I was at the International Festival of Authors in Toronto, and Adam Hochschild was there. Some of you should recognize his name. He wrote a book called Spain in Our Hearts, which was about the American volunteers, a lot of the Lincoln Brigade, who served during the Spanish Civil War. And there was a piece in his, his book about Martha, and I noticed that he'd had access to her papers and that they were restricted. And he said, um, Email me when I'm back in California, and I will put you in touch with Sandy Matthews. Now, Sandy Matthews is Martha Gellhorn's stepson and her literary executor. And so I wrote to him, and he gave me permission to access her restricted papers in Boston. Those are restricted until 2023, so soon they'll be open for any scholar to examine. Um, 25 years after her death. And to my shock, he said, yes, I was a nobody. And when I got to Boston, the archivist assigned to me said, you're one of a handful of people he has approved and given access to. So that, that in itself was thrilling. So that's how the book came to be. The title, yours for probably always, those are words that Martha wrote to her friend Cam Beckett. They were lifelong friends until his death. They met in the early 1930s in New York City. And it's true for her relationships. You know, she, she was a good friend. It was for probably always. And there were, of course, um, exceptions, but very few exceptions to, to that. Now, Martha Gellhorn was born in St. Louis in 1908 to very progressive parents. Her mother, Edna, worked for the League of Women Voters. She was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. She helped to get uh, suffrage for women. Her father, George, was an obstetrician gynecologist who pioneered transvaginal hysterectomies because they were better for the recovery of his patients. She had three brothers. She was the only daughter in the family, and she was raised to think she could do anything that her brothers could do. So from a very young age, she never doubted herself about um, her ability to, to go out into the world. And St. Louis was too small for her. 
she always said, you know, I want to go everywhere, see everything, and sometimes write about it. She wanted to become a foreign correspondent, and that didn't happen right away. But she quit Bryn Mawr after her third year, one year shy of her degree, and she went to Paris. And she took all kinds of uh, jobs there, menial jobs. Uh, at one point, she ended up working as um, a general factotum at French Vogue, around the same time that Lee Miller uh, was working for French Vogue. So Hillary and I have talked about the likely confluence uh, of them having met each other in the 30s before Lee took that portrait in 1943. She covered the London Economic Summit in 1933. She interviewed Hitler's translator, whom she snarked was even Nazi in his tailoring. Um, outrage was part of Martha's, um, it's just the way she saw the world. She came back to the United States in 34 and 35 and worked for Harry Hopkins, as Don mentioned, at the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, writing about the treatment of the unemployed all across America. She ended up getting arrested in Idaho because she incited a riot among the unemployed workers there and suggested they throw a brick through the relief office window and so they did. And the FBI came and said, you know, who is your leader? And they said, the relief lady, Martha. <laughs> so Hopkins had to fire her. And she didn't really mind because she wanted to work on her book. Her book was what would be called The Trouble I've Seen, which is fiction. And it's uh, based on her work uh, for FIRA. Something ridiculously lucky about Martha all of her life, I think, but when she was fired from FIRA, the Roosevelts invited her to move into the White House to sort herself out because they knew she couldn't get another job in government, and she did. She moved into the White House for a couple of months but didn't really, really like it. Most of you probably know the story about meeting Ernest in Key West in December 1936, and Martha was already planning to go to Spain without having met uh, Ernest and wanted to be there in solidarity with the only people, as far as she was concerned, who were standing up against Hitler via Franco. And she didn't go to write. She just went to be there. She called it an act of solidarity. And when she got there, she actually became a war correspondent by accident. She had been there a couple of months, and she, um, Ernest said to her, well, why don't you write about Madrid? It's what you know, what the ordinary citizens are enduring here in Madrid. And so she wrote a piece called High Explosive for Everyone that um, Collier's published as Only the Shells Wine. And there began her war correspondent's career. I'm going to skip ahead now, she, just to Martha highlights, so I don't go too much over time here. She, in 38, was sent by Collier's Magazine to cover the German-Jewish refugee crisis in Prague. In 39, as Don mentioned, she was sent to Finland, so she was there when the Russians bombed Helsinki. Her, her piece is called Bombs on Helsinki. She um, was with uh, pilots, uh, British pilots in 42. She covered D-Day, which I'm going to come to just at the end. She, like Lee, was at Dachau. And here is her pass. She was allowed to be at Dachau for two hours. And of Dachau, she said, much later in life, she did an interview when she was 84 and promoting her collection of war correspondence called The Face of War. It's as if I fell over a cliff and never recovered. And I think Lee, you know, we'll talk about this in a bit. I'm sure that Lee had a, Dachau affected both of them for the rest of their lives, haunted both of them for the rest of their lives. 
She, this is for your um, amusement, I think. You might recognize those two fellows. One is Robert Kappa. She was very close to Kappa. She considered him a brother. When he died accidentally, stepping on a landmine, she said, I miss him every day. It only grows. And the other handsome fellow there is James Gavin, the youngest general charge of the 82nd Airborne, and he threw over Marlena Dietrich to be with Martha. And there's so many letters from James Gavin in her papers, hundreds, I would say. I only transcribed a portion of them, like this one. I wanted you to see this because this was on the 82nd Airborne letterhead. It, and he wrote it from Fort Benning, Georgia. It reads, my beloved Marty, I'm very fortunate, I know, to be here with this overwhelming job on my hands at this time. I'm heart sick and lost without you or the knowledge that I will see you soon. It's sad and heartbreaking and I know not the answer. Still, these months of a year with you is far better than any amount of time with anyone else. I find myself quoting you and talking about you with anyone possible. It is just simply another world I am in without you, and I'll have to accept it. And the letter goes on, but that's just um, an excerpt of it. I'm going to have a clip, short clip played from my audiobook, and it's read for you by Ellen Barkin, who also loves New Orleans. Some of you may have seen her in The Big Easy many years ago. And this is going to lead into our D-Day discussion. And these are Martha's notes about that extraordinary time. So if you could cue the clip now, and I will sit down, and we'll start our, our conversation. Her first sight of France on June 7 was of ships thick as ducks and four roads like brown scars up green cliff. She saw sunk tanks with only wireless antenna showing above water and mines being exploded, one high, thin like a fountain, and the shrapnel like skipping stones on the water. On June 8th, she went ashore, the only correspondent to do so. Even Hemingway was confined to an amphibian craft and helped to evacuate both Allied and Axis wounded noting great speed and efficiency loaded, special tenderness towards colored wounded, everyone watching in silence, no wounded speaking, too ill. Aboard in the ward for German prisoners, cared for by a Jewish colonel who spoke no German, Gellhorn bellowed, be quiet, on a doctor's orders, and another man repeated, you must be quiet and they were all instantly silent. She observed, we are helpless against our own decency, really. Colliers published their pieces in the same issue later that July, over and back by Gellhorn, Voyage to Victory by Hemingway. That's it, Don. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, let's start with D-Day. We could end right here and it'd be a successful panel. Uh, <laughs> go have a drink. <laughs> um, how, tell us the story in, in, in some detail about how she gets to Omaha Beach, uh, D-Day 1. Oh, I'm happy to do that. I'm going to step back a little bit because as you mentioned, the magazines could only send one certified correspondent. And Martha had been the Collier's correspondent since the beginning of the war. And she'd been bu bugging Ernest to come with her. To, to, nobody could write about the war like he could write about the war, she kept saying to him. And eventually he decided, all right, I'll come. And he went to New York and he met with Chenery, who was her editor, and said, I'm here. I'm going to be your war correspondent. And they hired Ernest. So he had the accreditation papers. So she had no accreditation papers to get back to Europe for the assault that she had been planning to cover um, for 
for many months at this, at this time. She was itching to, to cover Operation Overlord. So Roald Dahl, you may recognize his name, British writer, wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach. He was um, an attache, a British attache in Washington, and he got Ernest a flight on a plane to London, and um, Martha said, well, since he took my accreditation papers, get me a seat on that plane, and he, Ernest said to her, no women's allowed. And she later found out that the actress Gertrude Lawrence was on that flight. So there were women allowed. She ended up sailing from New York City to Liverpool on a Norwegian's munition ship. She was the only civilian and the only women uh, among about 40 people on that ship. The captain joked to her, you know, don't bother to insure your luggage. We're carrying dynamite. So that's how Martha got back um, to England. And by this time, Ernest had been head injured because he had been at a blowout party at Robert Kappa's flat for war correspondence in Mayfair. And a drunk medical doctor drove him back to the Dorchester, but didn't get there because he hit a water tower and Ernest's head went through the windshield and he ended up with 57 stitches. And so Martha, when she was greeted at the dock in Liverpool, was taken, Mrs. Hemingway, you have to come, your husband's been in a car crash. So she went to the hospital and there she found Kappa, she found William Walton, another war correspondent. She found Mary Welsh, a correspondent for Time Life magazine, perched on the end of the vid and said, uh, right then, Ernest, you're fine. I'm going to go and continue on my business. And so she went to Southampton after the D-Day announcement was made to the Room of War Correspondents, and she lied her way aboard the hospital ship, a Red Cross hospital ship, said, I'm just writing about the nurses. It's a woman's story, which she would later say is absolutely no interest to anyone at all, and uh, allowed her um, to get on board and she got on board and she locked herself in the toilet and she sipped whiskey from her flask. She said, I got scared, took a drink, got unscared. And then uh, she was on that ship and she went with uh, some of the medics to help recover the wounded from Omaha Beach. And she was the only war correspondent and the only woman to do that. And when she and Ernest filed their pieces about D-Day, hers was called Over and Back, and his was called Voyage to Victory. His was all about the rat-a-tat-tat and the armaments and the strategy, and hers was about the human element. You know, she, she wrote with such compassion and empathy for the wounded, both Axis and Allied wounded on that Red Cross hospital ship. Does that answer? Yeah. yeah Don, yeah. sorry, I get all wound up. Well, Hillary, um, you showed those compelling um, images of San Malo. Oh. Uh, how, how, how did Lee Miller get down to San Malo from that evacuation hospital? Um, it was a military mistake. <laughs> um, false intelligence suggested that uh, St. Malo was already in um, Allied hands. Um, when she got there, um, that proved not to be the case, and that was her baptism of fire. So she Im embedded uh, with the unit in charge of uh, capturing the fortress. The German forces had retreated to the uh, fortress of St. Malo, as you, I'm sure, know. Um, and so there she was, um, uh, not covering a women's story by any means, but covering frontline combat for a fashion magazine. And, um, you know, it is entirely to the credit of uh, Vogue, and particularly Audrey Withers, the editor of British Vogue, who was um, 
a very atypical editor for Vogue, but absolutely the right person to edit Vogue in wartime. Um, the letters that uh, Lee wrote to Audrey, Audrey subsequently edited, and the result is a multi-page feature which appeared in Vogue magazine. One of the interesting things that people often forget is that Vogue was um, a monthly magazine um, and had pretty limited circulation. Uh, it was subscription only during the war. There was an awful lot of passing hand-to-hand -hand of the magazine itself, but the important thing was that by the time that Lee Miller's work appeared, events had moved on, and therefore she was able to get away with telling stories which um, newspaper journalists and um, sometimes, you know, sort of even uh, Life magazine could not because of military protocols. So um, for her personally, it was a revelation. Um, it was certainly a revelation. Uh, she was a revelation to all the GIs and around her. She was um, nearly arrested and returned um, to the UK for being in breach of her accreditation. Um, instead, uh, after being held under guard for a while, um, she was allowed only to go to Paris, where it was thought that um, she would get into less trouble. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Janet describes uh, how she, uh, Gellhorn, wrote with such compassion about the suffering. And um, yet, after Paris, they, of course, both follow the war into the Netherlands and Belgium and to Aachen and the Hurricane Forest and, of course, then into Germany, and where they both became great haters. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, None of them believed, neither of them believed in what they call this bullshit uh, objectivity. objectivity. bullshit. Yeah, yes. and uh, tell us a little bit about their first encounter. Here they encounter, they cross into Germany, Aachen, and then they go to the Rhineland. Here they encounter not only the blasted cities like Cologne and things like that, but they discover some prosperous Germans, even in Aachen they do, you know, in the, picking around in the ruins. Tell us about their feelings about Germans. Well... I mean, sort of patriotism underpinned the work of all the photojournalists of every nation um, during the war, but patriotism gave way to bitterness and hatred um, as the reality of um, what fascism meant in occupied Europe became more and more apparent. Um, so in the case of Lee, um, she didn't just visit Dachau, she uh, saw a number of um, prison camps along the way. You have to remember that um, she had many Jewish friends um, whose fate she was concerned about. But um, when she first crossed the border and headed towards Aachen, um, you know, she, she wrote this telling phrase, which is that um, they seem just like ordinary people leading ordinary lives. And in fact, of course, they are the enemy. The key point, I think, for her was the liberation of a Gestapo prison in Cologne. Um, the, it was a place where uh, political prisoners were held. So uh, not only Euro uh, French and other Europeans, but also Germans themselves. And right up to the moment that um, the prison was um, liberated by the Allies, um, prisoners were being summarily executed. And she found women as well as men um, who had literally been saved from the firing squad by minutes. Um, and that was really where I would say her anger, which became ever more ferocious, just like Martha, um, developed. And um, it reached its apogee, its climax 
in Dachau um, and uh, informed the rest of her life. Yeah, there's that picture she has of a dead German soldier lying prone in the street. She takes the photograph and she writes under it, um, this is a good German, he's dead. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, in that sense, she was completely in tune with the changing mood of the troops themselves. Um, speaking for uh, about the British armed forces, um, there was a healthy respect about the fighting capability of the German armed forces. But the more that they discovered about the reality um, of it all, um, and particularly in the case of the British, the liberation and subsequent relief of Belsen concentration camp, um, at that point, um, the respect had completely vanished. And um, the German guards, particularly, were actually less than human. And so the brutality of um, the Allied response to um, uh, the Germans from that point in time uh, really changed. Uh, and I, you know, I can, uh, I, it's been my privilege to work with many um, British military photographers over the years, including First World War veterans, uh, Second World War veterans, the Ar British Army Film and Photographic Unit, of whom there are now just a handful of survivors, all in their mid 90s. But I vividly remember um, one, Harry Oakes, who um, was uh, tasked to document the relief effort of. Belson over an extended period of time. And I was walking one day down the street at, in his hometown, and it happened to be, um, there happened to be a butcher's van making a routine delivery in, in the street as we walked past. And um, the delivery guy hauled out um, a carcass to go into the butcher shops. And Harry said, I'm back in Belson. And this was 60 years later. Mm. So, you know, the sights, sounds, smells, triggers, and triggers lead to mood, and mood leads to, well, how do you deal with this? And, you know, we're talking, verging on to sort of PTSD yeah. now, um, uh, which in those days was um, sort of uh, fatigue. Um, they need a bit of a break. Uh, it wasn't... It was understood in medical circles, but not really well understood within the armed forces as a whole. And of course, you know, um, uh, the armed forces themselves were very unwilling to actually admit to it. And their way of coping was to not talk about it and um, focus on the future. Right. Janet, um, so, Gellhorn also wrote with unsheathed disgust about the Germans, and I think this sets her up for her encounter at Dachau. Yes, and even before that, I, I want to say that Martha, even late in her life, would say, you know, I'm not the most tolerant person I know. She knew herself well. She also believed that her writing shouldn't tell people what to think. You should write it in such a way that people would make up their own minds. and. She wanted to wake minds to what was happening in the world. And there's a piece that she wrote about Cologne as well, where she talks about meeting a flower seller. He's got a cart on the, the street. You know, the cathedral's been annihilated. Um, it's upheaval everywhere. And there's this man selling flowers. And soldiers are coming by and buying blooms from him, and she talks with him. Now, Martha could speak German. Her father was German. She could speak German and French quite fluently, um, a little bit of Spanish. And he opened up a, a wallet and showed her the photographs of all of his family who were killed during the Allied bombing. and. That little moment, that little moment of humanity, I think is what was able to connect her to her readers. 
Now, when she was in Dachau, as I mentioned, she said, it says, if I fell over a cliff and never recovered. And she wrote a big piece for Colliers called We Were Never Nazis that's um, full of spite. That's one of her ire. most widely anthologized pieces, yeah. Oh, widely anthologized. And she was proud of that piece. It's yeah. in the face of war, her, her own collection that she decided to curate. And, and there's a detail in that where she's visiting a house in Dachau, and she notices how the curtains, the heavy curtains in the front window are heavy with dust. And that dust is from the ash of the corpses at Dachau. And so again, she finds this way to communicate to her readers something wholly unrelatable in a relatable way by referring to the curtains. Yeah. The, um, Miller leaves Dachau and goes to Munich and finds herself in Hitler's apartment, interviews the butler, finds him as loathsome as Hitler, and then in her own symbolic act um, of both defiance and symbolism and has herself photographed by Sherman in a bathtub. <laughs> What's she trying to say there? Well, um, I mean, this episode sort of started out, I mean, first of all, they both knew where uh, Hitler's apartment was. They'd carried the address with them and they were intending to go there. And by pure chance, um, they got there on the day that um, Hitler committed suicide. But they got there also and found that all the amenities were still there. There was hot water and they'd been on the, the road for weeks. Um, so the first thing was, oh, yes, uh, we can clean ourselves up. We can have a hot bath. And Lee... Um, in her in civilian life was, you know, sort of meticulous um, about this sort of thing. So the chance to have a hot bath was great. And then they realized what the, you know, the potential for a story. So this photograph, um, his, which almost has come to dominate uh, Lee, uh, uh, Lee Miller's career to the you know, the drowning out of all her other work, was a collaborative um, staged image which she and Sherman put together. Um, the items in the image, um, each of them convey a message. There's a portrait of Hitler, there's a piece of kitsch art. Um, his pristine monogrammed um, towels and bath mat um, have the dust of Dachau from Lee's boots trampled on it. So dust features again. Um, and, uh, you know, you have this uh, sort of beautiful naked woman in a, in, in a bath. Um, in the, it has to be said that they photographed each other. So there is also a naked David Sherman in the bath, but who wants to see that one? <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the, so, so this is not, if you like, it, this is not photojournalism. This is um, uh, using the techniques of art photography and uh, to send a message. Um, but Lee, as a former model, knew precisely how to present it. And its power is the fact that we're still talking about it today. You know, and too, by this time, what I found in, in the archive is that she's writing these captions and, and doing these, you know, these photojournalistic stories. But what she sends back to Vogue is ex extensive and explosive, I mean, oftentimes 12 and 13 page essays. And, uh, that's some of the best war writing that I've ever encountered, especially on liberation. Yeah. Um, which she's not as, you know, Hemingway celebrating at the Ritz and things like that. She sees a dark world mm. in liberation. Yeah. I mean, her prose, um, I would say, uh, sort of reflects her 
background um, in the visual arts and photography. I mean, it's almost as though she's using words to paint pictures. Um, the problem uh, is that I, she, she supplied so much, and so much of it was so good, um, that Vogue really struggled to do justice to it. Um, one of the things that people um, forget is that uh, it is the issue of paper rationing and the impact that that had on reporting in general. So now, um, in the UK, uh, which at that point had to import all its supplies of wood pulp, um, uh, you know, sort of paper was in very, very short supply. And British Vogue had been reduced to 18%, 1.8% um, of its normal quote, paper quota. And this had commercial implications for the magazine because it could carry less um, uh, adverts, but it also had um, implications for Lee's work because... Um, you know, Audrey Withers, as editor, had to balance the needs of the magazine as a whole with this extraordinary and exceptional writing and war reporting. American Vogue was less constrained by paper rationing and therefore could um, sort of, you know, carry Lee's text more fully but also had, you know, the perspective was different. Um, you know, um, the proximity of Britain to Germany and uh, New York to Germany uh, and the differing um, priorities of the two nations meant that um, the editorial approach um, and the treatment of Lee Miller's work uh, varied. Brilliant. And it was different for Martha, right? Because she was writing for Collier's, right. Collier's Weekly, that had a circulation of something like three million subscribers. And uh, she always said that none of her pieces were cut. Everything, every copy that she filed is basically yeah. what they printed. What they sometimes changed was the title. Uh, so, for example, what she called high explosive for everyone, her first uh, war reporting piece in Madrid in 37, they talk called um, Only the Shell's Wine. She wrote a piece called Obituary of a Democracy uh, about uh, Prague, too. And uh, they gave it a, a uh, I think they called it Mr. Chamberlain's Peace, mm -hmm. which is a softer <laughs> title than right. Obituary of a Democracy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but other than the titles, they, they essentially printed what she filed. And she knew she was lucky in that. And likely, she didn't have the pressure of filing for a daily. You know, that like they cute. weren't filing for the New York Times or the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or, you know, they, they were working for magazines. And so they had um, little more time to revise their, their work as well. Well, we're running into a time issue here. Uh, so why don't we open it up for questions? Yeah, what uh, great presentations and a very thorough roundtable. Thank you. Please raise your hands and Connie and I will get to you. We may go a little long depending on the questions. We have a long lunch break following this. So questions please. Did Don cover it so well with his <laughs> questions that nobody has one? Oh, up front, sorry. Hi, really enjoyed that. Um, I, the photograph of, um, of the French resistance woman that Lee Miller took, and you commented on the, the dress, reminded me of a uh, what happened to a lot of the French resistance women when they arrived in Ravensbrück because they felt this sort of national pride in French fashion and glamour. They would try to make themselves look really good as the train arrived. And the uh, Russian women who were working as the guards uh, upon arrival thought they were all prostitutes hmm. and would spit at them and, and you know. So 
can can you speak a little bit more about that whole um, the, the the significance of the of that way that woman was dressed, the young woman was dressed for the French po population? Uh, yes, of course. Um, I mean, to start with, of course, there is the importance of uh, French, the French couture, the French fashion industry um, uh, to uh, Paris. And, uh, you know, France had a global reputation for being the leader of fashion. Um, these, you know, the issues confronting the industry uh, as a whole when, um, Germany occupied France uh, is a story in itself, but uh, each couturier had to make a decision, um, you know, to collaborate, to close, um, what do you do? And, uh, you know, sort of uh, some of the, uh, Hitler, Hitler, or the, the German government initially aspired um, to move the entire couture industry to Germany and was talked out of it by the head of the um, Parisian couturiers um, who on one level I think saved French couture but also in doing so you know had to bear the consequences of um, the, the, the decisions that he made to actually sort of exist during the occupation. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the women's, um, it, it is generally the case that dress um, offers a powerful um, statement. Madeleine Albright, um, you, you know, she had her pins, which she used to send messages via the media. And there was a fascinating exhibition I saw in Washington, D.C. some years ago, and I believe she published a book about them as well. But being able to read the visual language of fashion was something that um, French women could do. They needed no tuition on this. The, and it was something that Lee Miller, with her background um, in the subject, equally could do. So at this point in time, um, in Paris, there was a, an acute shortage of everything. I mean, you know, sort of, uh, 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 sort of women were using um, wooden soled shoes because there was a shortage of leather, for example. Um, uh, hair styling, all the, the hair salons uh, were closed. So, you know, the ability to um, do your hair was a problem and many women as a result, grew their hair very long. Um, deliberately uh, wasting material was, um, and therefore disobeying German orders to be economical with materials, um, was uh, a way of doing this that uh, women did pursue. And so pleats, flounces, you know, any and everything um, was, a, you know, it was a, an intentional statement which everybody actually could say. It, it was a uniform. It defined you. Um, and uh, it was a very dangerous thing to do, um, particularly following uh, D-Day and, um, you know, when scores were being settled. So that woman... Um, was running a considerable personal risk, um, but at the same time nailing her loyalties very firmly to the mast. Um, the victory roll uh, that her hair is done with, so if you look at it from a certain angle, what you can actually see is a V. Um, Lee Miller um, took a very funny series of photographs showing um, the only functioning hair salon in Paris at around this time, where you have French women under the hair dryers, you know, these big hoods. And then down in the basement, you have two French cyclists on a tandem powering them. Yes, <laughs> so fantastic. So, I mean, uh, she, fashion uh, was very important. Now, in her photography of Dachau, 
um, there is an image, which I haven't shown today, but there is an image where a German girl amongst the uh, German civilians who have been uh, forced to view conditions in Dachau um, uh, is defiantly wearing um, German national costume. Dundal. Dundal. Yeah, Dundal. that's right. Um, so, you know, again, in this case, um, uh, this German girl is using um, dress costume to send a visual message. Um, and the interaction between um, costume and presentation and protest is a you know, very, very interesting one. It's got a very long history, but if you, know, if you look at the sort of peace and uh, protests, the anti-nuclear protests, C&D protests in London in the 1980s, you have this incredible creative industry where everybody is making their own costumes using humor or whatever sort of form of analogy comes to mind in the hope of attracting the camera and therefore drawing a wider public's attention to this. So, so there is a very long um, history of this. And um, it is, as I say, um, uh, the feminine version of um, the military uniform. I'd like to jump in with a question for Jen. Um, Gellhorn's in Paris at the same time. And she's Hemingway celebrating at the Ritz with his gang. And, but she's visiting the torture prisons That's right. and places like that. But also, and, and writing, you know, uh, evocatively, you know, about this you know, cob tortures, you know, burning people, roasting people, things like that. But also, when the French take out the reprisals against women who were supposedly sleeping with Germans or had married Germans and start to brand them, cut their hair and things like that, she's outraged by this. That took me by surprise. Well, I think it's also part of the way she wants to record the sufferers of history, mm -hmm. right? She, you know, I was thinking, you know, when, when you're talking about the resistance of, of dress, it was something that Martha, it didn't occur to Martha, she was just furious that these women were all charted up walking through Paris at liberation. And um, she didn't understand the codification of, of all of that. She was just outraged. And as you said, her response was, was to go to the, all the Gestapo torture chambers in the outskirts of Paris and to write about that. She was somebody all of her life who looked when others looked away. She did that during the First World War. And that's true of Lee, too. You know, look when others look away, feeling like you have to use your eyes and you have to use your ears to record what's happening because if you don't record the truth, then it's, it's fascism all over again, right? Because, and, and we see this now. We see this now where, where words don't seem to have real meaning mm -hmm. anymore. They're, they're void of, of meaning, and um, they were both very particular uh, about that. I mean, I, I, I think that um, all of this sort of sits firmly in the context of convincing the world about the reality of the Holocaust and um, the concentration camps. Um, you know, they were all part, they were both part of this um, drive to convince the world that something so inconceivable was reality through words and pictures. Now, yeah, like Miller writing back to her editor, you must publish this. Yes, this uncensored. You must, in, mm. in capital letters. And you must see it. So, you know, um, uh, Lee wrote um, to Audrey Withers saying, I really hope that Vogue, uh, you know, she said, um, I don't usually take pictures of horrors, as you know, although every day I see them everywhere I look because of Vogue. But I hope on this occasion you will find a way uh, to publish these pictures. And um, Vo Audrey simply said, here they are. You know, I've never seen two reporters more shattered by an experience than these two women were by Dachau. Um, 
But Gellhorn goes through a hard time, you know, as you write, and she pulls out of it. She covers Vietnam. She resumes her career, et cetera. It dies at a very old age, suicide, um, fortunately. But um, Miller really went into a spin. I mean, she was cry I, I came across one quote where she uh, was reported to be talking to a friend. She said, I would commit suicide, except for the fact that it would give great joy to my husband and my child. I mean, that's a tough one. It really is tough. I mean, um, this, this is um, perhaps where you know, the, uh, the sort of lives of the two women diverge slightly. Um, I hadn't really had time to go into Lee's childhood, but aged um, eight, she was raped by a, fam uh, the, a, a family friend and infected with gonorrhea. Um, this was something that she and her family never talked about in her lifetime, but it shaped her relationships, her personality, and her choices in life. Um, so she was emotionally fragile. Um, equally, unlike Martha, she didn't really have a career as a war correspondent, um, or indeed as a correspondent yes. at all. Um, and so uh, her period as a war an official war correspondent, um, uh, she found one of the most fulfilling periods of her life where she really made a difference. Um, she was accepted on her own terms rather than because of the way she looked. Um, uh, and when that accreditation scheme came to an end, it, you know, it took that life away from her. I mean, she was not in a, a particularly good place Obviously, she was exhausted, um, borderline ill. Um, and so, like so many women, and we, uh, you know, this was talked about yesterday, um, the end of the war brought a strong sense of personal loss in terms of, um, you know, fulfillment, making a difference, role. Play. You almost missed the war. Martha certainly missed the war. She called the war home. Mm. She, she did, and she felt belonging there because there she was with people who cared about what she cared about, who had seen the horrors and knew what it was to celebrate life, to laugh together. Um, she missed, la as she aged, that's one of the things she wrote about. She said, I, I, I miss laughter the most. Um, I mean, she... I, the, the, the challenge for the generation emerging from the war is, um, you know, all the certainties and, you know, the limiting constraints which inform some of those certainties suddenly disappeared. And you are back to making your own choices, um, but you're also doing it in a condition of um, post-war fatigue, trauma, and trying to accommodate to a new world. And for women, um, certainly in, in, in Europe and definitely in Britain, it was very much um, now, you've done your bit, uh, the war is over, back to um, domesticity. And uh, in Lee's case, um, she tried to go back to fashion photography. She did for a while. But, you know, it, 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 I mean, even had she been well, um, it would never have satisfied her um, in the way that her other role did. And um, alcohol uh, became her crutch. And so for, you know, many years, she was a functioning or not so well functioning alcoholic. But again, to her credit, without any particular intervention or help, um, she did pull herself out of it. She remained a you know, deeply damaged, very difficult person for her son and husband to live with. But at the same time, she did find a role, a meaning, a, a form of uh, satisfaction in terms of, um, uh, ironically enough, um, cooking. You know, she had taken the message, returned to the kitchen, and she made it her own and produced, you know, sort of 
um, sort of the, all these amazing dresses, uh, 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 dishes. Um, so I wouldn't say that she ever really got over the war, um, but she again made the most of the opportunities that were available to her. We have a well, question from the floor before we break for lunch. Okay. Uh, just curious, how did their male colleagues view these two war correspondents? Did they view them as curiosities or oddities, or did they treat them as peers? So, place some perspective on that. Shall I take that? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, Martha, it seems to me, was just accepted as one of the boys. Once uh, people got over her natural good looks and saw the kind of work that she did and the places she went, um, they just respected her. And, you know, she covered, post-war, she covered Nuremberg, she covered the Eichmann trial. Um, yeah, she, she was never treated, as far as I can tell, with disrespect among, among her colleagues, so. I mean, it's, it, it's, an int it's a very interesting question because um, the pattern of conflict seems to me is that um, in a state of war, um, initially the uh, idea is to protect women from the, um, the realities of it, um, certainly during the two world war conflicts. And then when the chips are down and you are literally in you know, the center of it, all of these sort of social um, barriers sort of fade away under the need to do whatever is necessary to get through this. And, you know, the sort of Lee Miller's um, uh, time as a war correspondent really rather reflects that in the sense that she starts off uh, being directed towards women's stories by minders. And then um, from the point that uh, of St. Malo, um, all of this sort of breaks away and, it, you know, she is taken seriously on her own terms. There are always individuals who have different perspectives on this and that is, I think, true for both Martha and Lee. They would all come across people, individuals um, within the armed forces who had particular views. But, you know, the majority of the GIs um, regarded Lee as one of them and, um, you know, were always very happy to work alongside her. And she formed um, very lasting um, friendships with different units as she came across them. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Don Miller, Janet Somerville, Hillary Roberts, and also for Martha Gellhorn and Lee Miller. We are uh, now at our lunch break. The next session will begin at 12 o'clock, so you'll want to make your way back here at about 5 till. The authors will all be outside signing copies of their books at the book signing station. Thank you.
Amanda Shaw. We all know Louisiana is as fun as all get out. So get out, take a road trip, and explore our state. Fill her up, then try a new restaurant that's as fun-loving as it is food-loving. Grab the family and take off for monumental adventures at our 21 state parks. Or take a magical minivan tour along our 19 scenic trails and byways. Louisiana's a trip. Take one today. This is Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Plan your road trip at louisianaisatrip.com. Uh, we had donut machines, donut mix, coffee, ground coffee. So we'd go out to a base and um, hook up to their electrical system for the, for the donut machine. It had uh, a PA system, but that meant that, uh, that either they could listen with their coffee and donuts or you could dance with them. We also, in our off time, as it were, would go over to the two, to the two Red Cross clubs in town. And uh, and help uh, you know entertain and listen 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 listen. I'll tell you the first unit that we served was a, an artillery battery in in firing position. Uh, we we used to have just line up jerry cans and put a box of donuts and a, some cream and sugar and some coffee, you know. Um, we'd, we'd, and the guys would come by. The, the guys loved it when we did stupid things. They did. And sometimes we did them purposely, but not usually. Anyway, uh, so they're, they're going down the line and, uh, and uh, we're talking to them and everything, and they're wondering, some of them be, stand behind and wonder, what are you doing way up here? And well, well, I don't know. We're doing our best, and um, uh, so the, they were not firing at the time we set up. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Uh, I'm doing coffee again, and it's a big one-pound uh, ladle. Uh, you know, and um, I've got it uh, just about to pour into this guy. This off. He turns out to be the the commanding officer, the captain, uh, of, uh, he, and he's got his canteen cup out, and I'm about to pour the coffee into it when they start firing. These are 155s. These make a noise. And I go this way and pour coffee all over him. And uh, he, fortunately, he had a field jacket on. And so our orders were to be among the first to cross. And we, and we had this truck that we turned into a club mobile and had the donut machine in it. And our GI cooks, we had two guys who had, you know, they did the cooking while we went out and served. That was the point. Why, why put Red Cross women in a truck and have them cooking? Um, what happened was when, when we turned up at the, um, at the gates of Memmingen camp, uh, and started it, the guys went wild. It was disbelief, mm -hmm. it was joy. I can remember I was standing in, a, in a, an open space with just nothing but guys, you know, mm -hmm. prisoners. And I started trying to talk to them. And you know, okay, hey, hey, who's, who's from there and whatnot? And, and um, they wouldn't answer. They just stood there and looked at me. And finally, I said, I don't know what, to, what, 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 why won't you talk to me? Mm -hmm. And and one guy, an American, stepped forward. And he said, Miss Red Cross, could I touch your hand? And I said, sure. And I, and he turned it over and just went like that. Mm -hmm. It went, you know, uh, I think what it meant, what, I hope what we meant to them, and I believe it, was that there there is a a, a normal caring world out there. Mm -hmm. Constance Negrotto was a talented art student in New Orleans when a professor suggested she apply for a job as a draftsman. We were supposed to bring a sample of our work. I drew a picture of a, a C-46, a big poster, and uh, <laughs> I got the job all right. Negrotto began her new job at Higgins Industries, working on both production and internal projects. My aunt and my cousin worked there as riveters, and I had a job up in front 
We did a lot of the charts and things for both the plant and Higgins' conference room. When the grotto began work at another Higgins location, the Mishu assembly facility, wartime restrictions posed challenges for her commute. I didn't have enough ration stamps to get gasoline for my car, so I had to go and catch a streetcar, ride to Canal Street and Broad, get off and get a ride to the Mishu plant in a horse trailer. <laughs> it was kind of fun. <laughs> Draftsmen and women like Negrotto were key to the productivity of wartime manufacturers like Higgins Industries. By the end of the war, Higgins employed 25,000 people and had produced over 20,000 boats and landing craft. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States, died on April 12, 1945, while in office. His death was a shock to the country and dealt a blow to the morale of the American people in the waning months of the Second World War. For many Americans, especially the young men serving overseas, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the only president they had ever really known. Elected in 1933, when many of those fighting Germany and Japan were in grade school, Roosevelt was the epitome of the term leader. His leadership was unquestioned from his initial election through his astonishing and unprecedented four terms in office. Winning in a landslide victory over incumbent Herbert Hoover in 1933 during the heart of the Great Depression, FDR as he was known, guided the country through the worst economic years in America's history. At the time of his election, more than two million Americans were homeless and over a quarter of the American workforce was unemployed. Roosevelt's New Deal policy helped pull the country out of the depths of the economic depression and put people back to work. Despite his successes in his first two terms and into his third, Roosevelt's greatest lay in front of him, desperately trying to keep America out of the war raging in Europe while still trying to render aid to the country's besieged European allies. The president provided skilled and trusted leadership in the dark days following Japan's attack on the United States at Pearl Harbor. His trusted voice reassured, panicked, and scared Americans that the country would strike back at their attackers and gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. With confidence, in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Throughout the war years, Roosevelt displayed great leadership, trusting his subordinates while leaning on their expert levels of dedication, ingenuity, and strategic decision-making. Roosevelt's leadership allowed for American victory to be achieved in both the European and Pacific theaters of war. His leadership on the American home front gave hope to millions who otherwise had not known opportunity. The war which essentially ended the depression and either employed the unemployed in defense plants and war work or enlisted them in the armed services also provided opportunity, thanks to Roosevelt's decisions, to millions of African Americans and women who both took a prominent role in the workforce for the first time under FDR's guidance. The depression, war years, and ceaseless leadership of the American people and her allies took a toll on the president. With his health declining during the initial portion of his fourth term as president, Roosevelt succumbed to a massive brain hemorrhage on the afternoon of April 12, 1945. On the morning of April 13th, Roosevelt's body was placed in a flag-draped coffin and loaded under the presidential train for the trip back to Washington. Along the route, thousands flocked to the tracks to pay their respects. Roosevelt's declining physical health had been kept secret from the general public. His death was met with shock and grief across the United States and around the world. After Germany surrendered the following month, newly sworn in President Truman dedicated Victory in Europe Day and its celebrations to Roosevelt's memory, saying that his only wish was that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had lived to witness this day. Walter Imahara, and welcome to the Imahara's Legacy Garden here at Hemingbao in St. Francisville. First thing you see is a Tory gate, because the Tory gate, it's, it's welcome. You're welcome to uh, peace in nature, and you leave the old world behind. This garden has uh, been built about two years ago, 
because we had a, uh, we sold a big gardens on in St. Francisville. We needed a place to finish up with the legacy portion. And we didn't want a big piece of property. So here at Himmelbau, we found this property, but needed a lot of work because where I'm sitting, big erosion. And the trees are just so solid in here, you couldn't see the water. We bring in plants from all over uh, Louisiana because the plants from up north doesn't really grow good here. And during construction, I was asking if it's a Japanese garden. I said, well, it's a, it's a Japanese American garden, which is uh, never been heard of before. But the mixture of Japanese and American because that's who I am. But we have lanterns here, we got Tory gates. Do you see some carvings that came from Indonesia area, made out of lava stone? Okay, this is a greeter. I was born in 1937, so when World War II started, I was like uh, four years old. I learned a lot of philosophy from my father and mother because you must remember now, I'm now age over 80. I, I, I've been with them all my life, except for the three and a half years in the service. And I must mention that uh, I learned a lot because my parents were Buddhists. And we were born Buddhists, but after camp, my mother became a Christian. We came from camps from Arkansas. We went to camps in uh, Jerome and Royer, which is about five hours north from here. And my parents wanted to go south because they lost everything in California. Okay, and when I say they lost, they lost a the farm and all that. And one of the biggest things that we want people to know that we really were Americans at that point. So, and we knew the circumstances of the war. My father spoke about incarceration uh, to, uh, to the, not too much to the children until he got past the anger. My father's journey into uh, plant materials that he found peace after uh, leaving camp. But it took him maybe uh, uh, 10 years, but till then he was very bitter against the United States and just bitter against everything. But uh, he found a way in his heart that with the Buddhist background, and then he started uh, working with plant material in your nature, huh? You see plants blooming, you see the bees, and you see the butterflies, and it's, it's all nature. That's why I like, uh, my father and I like the gardening business, because sometimes when you work with plant material, it really uh, makes you feel better, yeah. This monument was first found by my father and myself in Hiroshima in 1977. But it took us another, until 2005, when we understood that the, the monument was gonna be taken down in Hiroshima at this Buddhist temple. The temple did not want the uh, monument any longer because no one has come visit it for 50 years. And the generation of Ima Harris left Japan and, my, and now living in America. Okay, so this is a very old, uh, I would say in age-wise, it's about made, uh, it was built about 19, uh, 1905. What's interesting about the monument that it did survive the atomic blast, and it, the history is that uh, my great-great-grandfather built it for a son who passed away 1895 uh, while he was a Navy in, in China. So it's not a tombstone per se, it's like a monument. But also, in the front here, I can't read Japanese, but in translation, it means this is an Imahara monument for those now living and also in the future. When you walk in the gardens, it's, uh, it's peaceful, 
nature. Uh, you don't hear no uh, trucks going by, and it's just so quiet, huh? And you see a, uh, the birds, you see the bees, butterflies, and the peacocks, things like that. It's just uh, it's good. Uh, it's good for the soul huh? to uh, to visit nice, quiet place with nature. So quiet here.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to make your way back into the ballroom and find your seats, and we will start our next oral history session before our conversation with Rob Satino and Rick Atkinson. Thank you. They gave me a very unusual assignment. They wanted me to take these two tanks after I cleared the right side of the forest and uh, a patch out in front was about half as big as a football field. All the trees were cut and the wood was stacked, uh, code uh, wood. And uh, behind those uh, patches of uh, uh, piles of wood, the Germans had set up a couple of positions, machine gun positions. In this one instance, this same fellow I was telling you about, uh, Bellinger, he... Um, comes out of the woods on that right side, but he's way out in front of my line. So I began shouting at him, hold up, because it, we try to keep contact with the, the other units. And he turns around, he's got a BAR, and he empties a clip. Like, I, I hit the ground. I said, this crazy guy is shooting at me just for calling him a SOB or something. Well, they killed the two Germans that were out in front of me of just about 120 feet. I was walking right up to where they were behind this wood pile. So it gives you some idea of, of the warfare that we were in in that, in that woods. So with these tanks, I had to come to that end of that road and then leave the road with the tanks and try to get behind the Germans that were holding up uh, my unit my regiment uh, at the crossroads. And it's in the history books. They refer to it as crossroads number so-and-so. So I was successful after we cleared that wooded part and, and, and the machine gun I told you about. As a matter of fact, we can drop in, Germans began dropping mortar shells on it. And uh, I recall covering myself with a, one of the dead Germans that was about to shoot at me. It was better than him to get these shrapnel than for me to get it. But uh, um, after I got what I thought was a, a distance behind the crossroad, then I made a left turn to the roads that, that made the crossroad, and some of the Germans were running down that road, and, and we uh, fired on them, of course, and disposed of them, and some of them ran to the woods on the opposite side of the road. First thing you know, a tank came down the road, and uh, instead of continuing past where I was, he cut on behind uh, the forest uh, on, a, on the opposite side. So I, I got behind one of these wood piles about, oh, I guess 50 feet or so from the road, and I said, Swartz, Robert, I called him, Robert Swartz. I said, uh, give me that bazooka. Oh, Robert, uh, give me the bazooka. And I said, we took two people to shoot the bazooka, fire the bazooka then, one to load it. So I told him, put a shell in there, and he, and he did. And here came the second tank. And when he got almost even with me, he was uh, not quite uh, opposite me, I fired, and I think I might have knocked down a pipe of cub someplace because no telling where that thing went. That sure didn't hit the tank. So I said, Robert, give me another shell and put it in there. And, and, and by that time, the tank had gotten closer, and I, I hit it in the track, and it went down in the ditch on a little angle, and it was just sitting there churning, but it couldn't get out to where it was. So I said, Robert, give me another. He said, I don't have any. I said, what you did with the bag? He said, I threw them away. Those things were too heavy. So. No, I didn't have any more rounds to finish that tank off, but I had two tanks, and they were behind me down in, in the wooded area, along the edge of the wooded area. So I ran back there with my Thompson and started beating on the side of the turret. And uh, first thing you know, the turret opened up, and the sergeant, uh, I'm trying to make him hear, we had telephones on the back of the tanks, but that didn't work because the noise was too great from the motor. So I, I told him there's a, 
a tank up there. I was at a tank, a German tank. Reading my lips, perhaps, I was shouting. And he put that thing in reverse. And he backed up so fast, he almost run into the one behind him. And I'm, that was a crazy fool. So I'm down there, now I'm beating on again. And and now he comes back out of there. I, I said, there's a tank. And, and so he's yelling to me, he couldn't go up there. He was a, concerned that the, it was a tank dug in and that if he came into its view, it would knock him out. So I, I had to walk in front of him and I kept enticing him, come on. Anyway, he came forward till he saw that tank. And his, his uh, uh, I guess he probably had a 75 on that tank and on the Sherman. Anyway, and he swung the tower around, and he put one round in that tank, and it caught fire. And so he you know, he jumps down off the tank, and he's so gleeful. He you know, knocked out the tank. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin on our next session, please find your cell phones that I'm sure you took out to check emails and texts during the lunch break. And please silence them. Thank you. God bless you. Do you have any slides? Any slides? No. Just checking. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm animated uh, for this next panel. Uh, I've been thinking about a comment uh, by George Washington, the effect that you know, when I put on the soldier, meaning the uniform, I did not, I did not take off the citizen. So um, for our next session, this is our General uh, Raymond D. Mason Distinguished Lecture on World War II. During the Second World War, General Mason served in the European theater in the famed 4th Armor Division under uh, General George Patton. The Mason Lecture is made possible through the generosity of Major General and Mrs. Raymond E. Mason, Jr and the Raymond E. Mason Foundation, intended to feature writers, scholars, journalists, and distinguished members of the armed forces and, and uh, journalists. And so today, we certainly have a, a speaker that is all of those. Uh, you know, I, I, I've tried to uh, follow uh, our speaker from, from his uh, publication of the Gulf War uh, account uh, ever since then. Uh, and, and everything he produces, I'm always uh, incredibly oppressed, impressed. This year, our Mason lecturer is renowned Pulitzer Prize-winning historian and journalist. Note that we got both of those terms in there, historian and journalist, uh, Rick Atkinson. And uh, Rick will talk about the long history of citizen soldiers in American history, certainly not just in World War II, but in a range of conflicts. And joining him is our own senior historian, uh, Dr. Rob Satino in this conversation. So with that, uh, I'm anxious to hear this, so I'll be quiet and turn it over to Rob. Thanks so Thank much, you very Mike. Much. Rick, it's always a, a treat to be with you on a stage, or frankly anywhere. I always feel a heck of a lot smarter after we've talked for an hour. Um, you know, th there's a false dichotomy uh, uh, between so-called scholarly history and so-called popular history. And, and my friend Rick Atkinson here is someone who's completely obliterated that distinction because he's, a, a, he's a, one of the preeminent scholars of the U.S. Army in World War II and a lot of other things. And he's also extremely popular in a, in a way that many of us are, are jealous. So it is really, really wonderful, Rick. Thanks for coming. Rob, it's always a pleasure to be with you anywhere on stage or off stage. Good. Great. Um, so you've written uh, uh, the first volume of a trilogy now on the American Revolution. It's entitled The British Are Coming. If you don't own it yet, you will at some point in your life, I'm confident. Uh, it's, it's brilliantly written. It's brilliantly researched. How different is it researching a book on the American Revolution from a book on World War II? I mean, you've been in the George III archives. You just spent a decade of your life talking in conversation, let us say, with, with Eisenhower and Patton and the great figures of the U.S. Army in World War II. How different is it talking to George the uh, Third? Well, he's got a funny accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of the reasons that I decided to, uh, as a writer, to uh, leave World War II and go back in time to an earlier century and, and our first uh, war as a nation 
was I, I wanted to understand better uh, where our 20th century and 21st century force had come from, whence they derived. And that required going back to look at the revolution in the Continental Army. And, um, and to understand the forces, you have to understand their adversaries, whether you're studying World War II or whether you're studying the revolution. Our, our adversary was our last king, George III. Um, his papers are kept by Queen Elizabeth II. She owns the, all the Georgian papers, the four men named George who became king in the 18th and 19th century. And she decided in uh, 2015 to open them up for the first time to, to scholars, uh, part of a digitization process. Uh, and I was one of the first allowed in to take a look. Wow. I was the first, uh, uh, I went there in April of 2016. Uh, I would show my badge every morning at the Henry VIII Gate at Windsor Castle, just, e just west of London, and show my badge again at the Norman Gate, and then I would climb 119 stone stairs and 21 <laughs> wooden steps to the Garret of the Round Tower, begun by William the Conqueror in the 11th century. And there are the papers. It's where they keep them. And gorgeous, oversized red binders. George was his own secretary until late in life when he began to go blind. And he kept not only his correspondence himself, he not only wrote the correspondence, he made the copies himself. And he's a great list maker, lists of uh, my regiments abroad from 1765 to 1775, recipes for insecticide. Um, uh, theater reviews, he would, had a steely mean, was a particularly effective Brutus. And as you paw through these papers, you really have a, f uh, a sense of being in his presence, of having a tactile relationship with him. Uh, and um, it's, for me, particularly illuminating to see his strategic misconceptions, because the war goes wrong for them, and the war goes wrong in part because George and his ministers had misconceptions about who we were and what we were willing to fight for, what we were willing to die for. Uh, so George believed, for example, that were the American colonies to slip away, and you can find this in the papers, he's very explicit about it, it would be the end of the British Empire, which was a new creation as a consequence of their victory in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War as we call it, where the empire had come into being and they had gotten uh, huge tracts of land, Canada, half billion fertile acres west of the Appalachians, Sugar Islands in the West Indies, parts of India. Uh, and he believes that if those fractious, rebellious Americans slip away, it's gonna encourage rebellions in Ireland, mm -hmm. Canada, the Sugar Islands. Uh, it, he's quite wrong about that, but he is willing to go to war against his own people for eight years. And watching the wheels turn in his head is, uh, was a fascinating experience. You know, Clausewitz says, who I've mentioned a few times at this conference already, uh, you can never, it's a drinking game. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can never, you should never deceive yourself as a commander about what kind of war you're fighting. I mean, this is sort of the first decision, you right. have to figure out what it is and then kind of move from there. So, you know, the British are coming, takes us from Lexington to Princeton. So um, April 1775, the big outbreak too, just into the new year, 70, 1777. In terms of World War II, where, where would that be for the United States? Uh, how far are we through the, the saga? Is it, I don't know, Casserine Pass or, or something? Um, I think it's probably closer to, to Tunis in May of 1943, where after some real lows, uh, the Allied force, American and British, wins through and clears the North African coast. And uh, we have landed, of course, in 1942 in Morocco and Algeria, and the seven-month campaign through the Atlas Mountains. And finally, we drive the Germans and Italians. We destroy the German and Italian army in North Africa at that point. And I think that that uh, corresponds roughly to where we are after Washington's really unbelievable victories, twice at Trenton and, and once at Princeton. We are in early uh, 17. Uh, 77 at that point. It's, you know, to paraphrase uh, Churchill, it's, it's not the beginning of the end, but it's probably the, the end of the beginning in, in, in both those wars. I'm, I'm really fortunate right now that there are few individuals in the world who could even take a crack at the question I'm about to uh, ask. Are there commonalities between these wars? You spent a big chunk of your life studying both of them now. I mean, certainly, you know, the technology was different, machine guns from, from flintlock muskets. 
in the end? Does that sort of thing matter? What are, what are the commonalities between the two wars you're studying? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're completely different on, on uh, some levels. The, the weaponry, the communications, the transportation, all of that is as different as the 18th century is from the 20th century. Um, I think uh, the, the thing that they m most have in common, uh, our, our first war as a nation and our biggest war as a nation, is they're both existential. Mm. Uh, our very existence, obviously, is predicated on winning the American Revolution, our existence as a, an independent people. Uh, our way of life, uh, you know, I think it's not too much of a stretch to say, and people have been talking about it here uh, for a couple of days now, that uh, our existence as a, as a people, and what we most uh, sincerely believe is at stake in World War II. So uh, most wars are not existential. Mm -hmm. Um, some wars shouldn't be fought, most wars probably shouldn't be fought, but I think that those wars that are existential go on a special shelf because of the stakes that's involved, and I would put those two in that category. We had um, presidential counselor and eminent historian John Morrow here yesterday, I think he may still be in the room somewhere, and he, he said, you know, there's some wars that are necessary, some wars are necessary, uh, all wars are bad, but some you have to fight, you have no real choice. Any way either one of these wars you've studied so deeply, any way either one of them could have been avoided? Um, you know, in the case of World War II, I think if uh, Stauffenberg had been a few years earlier and had been more successful... Or uh, Hitler got run over by a bus. Uh, or something people. like that. Uh, it's hard for me to... I mean, we, we heard the, the panel earlier this morning talking about the final solution. Alex talked very eloquently about what they had in mind, and I think when they're thinking in those terms uh, that early in the conflict, it's hard to imagine how you're going to avoid war. They're, they're, they're going down a very dark road very early. Uh, so I don't see how World War II gets avoided. Uh, it can go in different directions, it can turn out differently, but how it is avoided uh, is hard for me to see. In the case of the American Revolution, I, I think that war could have been avoided if there had been uh, if someone had had the wit to envision, say, the Commonwealth, uh, no one could see it. No one could see that Britain eventually would have a, a, a loose arrangement in which there was kind of a, uh, a collection of nations, Canada, Australia, and so on, that had uh, a kind of sentimental attachment to the monarchy, were independent, were uh, aligned in their uh, commitment to basic Western values, but um, it's, it's a very loose alignment. Now, had that been proposed in 1774? Maybe, mm. maybe, maybe it gets avoided, but that is not the way uh, George III, Lord North, his, his prime minister, and the rest in Britain see it. Uh, blows will decide. This is what George says in 1774. Blows must decide. And uh, when you've got that kind of attitude, it's pretty difficult to see how you're going to avoid blows. You know, maybe the Commonwealth came about be pre precisely because of what happened in the late 18th century. It, it certainly influenced thinking about how we can avoid this kind of messy relationship with our vassal states. Right, right. Let me, uh, let me ask you a counterfactual, the you know, million dollar scholarly term for something that didn't happen. Um, well, what happens if, if we, if, if the United States or the American colonies, what happens if we lose these wars? Can I ask you to speculate a bit on a, a, a defeat in the American Revolution or maybe even more in a grandiose terms, a defeat in World War II, but start with the AMREV. What happens if we lose? Well, scholars love counterfactuals because you can never be wrong. No right? one's going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if, if we lose the uh, revolution, if Washington is captured or killed, if the Congress is arrested and uh, the, basically the rebellion is suppressed, it's hard for me to see that that is a steady state for Britain. For one thing, the American colonies, when the revolution begins, there's two and a half million of us, 500,000 are, are black slaves, but we have the uh, most explosive population growth on the planet. We have a population that's growing three times faster than Britain. It's a rate of increase that has never been seen in Europe. So we're going to get big and muscular, and we've got all the uh, advantages of a, a potential continental power. How Britain keeps that under control now, they kept the, kept the Indian subcontinent under control for a long time, but I think it's going to be very difficult for them. And if they win, they're going to have two million rebellious, angry, 
colonists that are going to have to be policed. It's going to be very expensive for them. Some of the opponents in Britain, like Edmund Burke, uh, like, uh, like uh, Chatham, uh, the former William Pitt, they see this is, this is really expensive if we win. It's expensive fighting it, and it's expensive if we win. So I don't see that the, you know, the status quo is going to obtain long. World War II. This is, a, this is the big one. <laughs> Feel free to go as far as you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I think you're well positioned. You're fluent in German. <laughs> <laughs> I could say something, but I won't. <laughs> We'd all be singing Deutschland über alles today, as the saying goes. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good enough, I think. Um, one of the things that... that uh, bounces off of every page of, of this book, your treatment of the American Revolution, Rick, is that this is, um, we say the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution, it's also a kind of civil war. It's a, it's a, there, there's, there's domestic impact here, and, and that separates it from World War II. No, I mean, I, that's one of the areas in which the two yeah. conflicts diverge. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right, Rob. Um, the, the opposition to ent American entry into the war ends when the war begins. The America First movement dies on the vine, and there really is a sense of 140 million people in America rowing the boat in the same direction. The American Revolution is a, a revolution, but it is also the first civil war. It is a nasty civil war. It anticipates the civil war in a lot of ways. Uh, modern scholarship estimates that probably 18% of the white American population, the, the two million white Americans, were loyalists, that they actively supported the crown and the crown's ambitions here, in some cases actually fighting in loyalist units under British uh, higher command. Uh, uh, that is not a significant enough portion of the population as it turns out to prevail, but it is significant enough to cause a nasty fracture in the body politic. And so uh, you see right from the beginning the uh, rebels, let's say us, uh, recognizing that uh, draconian measures to suppress dissent are paramount if they're going to prevail. Mm -hmm. They're already up against it because they're fighting uh, one of the best professional armies in the world. They're fighting the greatest navy the world has ever seen in the Royal Navy. They're fighting 30,000 uh, German mercenaries, the Hessians, uh, Thank you. and they're Thank you. I just want to shout out to the Germans in the American Revolution. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, and they're fighting this uh, fifth column in the, the loyalists. So uh, if you are loyal to the crown, or even if you're a fence straddler, unsure of the wisdom of rebellion against your government, you are subjected to dreadful treatment, uh, expropriation of your property, jailing, uh, exile, uh, execution in some cases, and this gets nastier as is the want of civil wars as it goes along, so that by the time we're in the, the back end of the war, most of which is fought in the South, um, it is uh, uh, brother against brother, family split apart, family split apart by irreconcilable political differences. Benjamin Franklin's son is the royal governor of New Jersey. He remains loyal. He is jailed. He is sent into exile. Franklin hates him. Wow. He hates his son. It's his only son. It's the son who helped him with a kite flying experiment. I mean, it's the joy of his life. And that's what civil war does to the country at that time. We can uh, get a, so that's sort of strategic level. Let's get back maybe into the operational level for a moment. Uh, George Washington, needless to say, plays a major role in the book, and I presume in the next two volumes as, as well. Why was Washington such a great leader? Let me uh, maybe go a little deeper there. Is he more an Eisenhower? This is sort of how I was brought up to think of George Washington. And by that, I mean an able administrator, a guy who makes different factions work together and makes sure all the moving parts are, are oiled. Um, so more of an Eisenhower, perhaps less of a great captain, less of a Napoleon or a Frederick the Great? You know, I had the uh, privilege of living with Eisenhower metaphorically for 15 years, uh, and I'm now in the same uh, cohabitation with uh, Washington. We're, we're eight years into our arrangement. <coughs> <laughs> 
and uh, the, the deeper I saw into Eisenhower, the more I admired him, and I'm feeling the same way about Washington. Mm. Now, on the surface, they're quite different. Washington is to the manner born. He's wealthy, and he becomes very wealthy when he marries the richest widow in Virginia, Martha Dandridge Custis. Um, he has uh, com combat experience as a Virginia militia colonel fighting under British command during the French and Indian War. He's seen a lot of combat. He's seen some really nasty stuff. Eisenhower's never heard a shot fired in anger when he becomes the theater commander in the caves of Gibraltar in October 1942 before Operation Torch and the invasion of North Africa. Um, so there are a lot of differences. There are a lot of differences in what they command. Eisenhower's commanding millions. Washington's army is rarely more than 20,000. Um, but they have some, some similarities. Uh, one is that they're not very good tacticians. Mm -hmm. uh, Washington makes mistakes. Uh, he just, he's a surveyor, so he should know land, right? He should be able to read the ground. Battle of Long Island, he misreads the ground. He gets outflanked. His army gets uh, mauled. Uh, he makes mistakes at Brandywine, Fort Washington on the current upper west side of Manhattan. He misreads that, uh, 3,000 American troops, November 19, uh, 1776, are trapped and killed or captured. He's not a great field marshal. He is not a great captain. Eisenhower is the same way. Eisenhower, Straits of Messina, Battle of Sicily, he doesn't see what's happening in front of him. Four German divisions are going to get away, and we're going to fight them over and over and over again on the, on the mainland of Italy. He's at Falaise with uh, Bradley. He doesn't really see what's happening at Falaise, that the encirclement is not complete. OK, I could go on. But that's not really his job, Eisenhower's job. His job is to be a supreme commander. His job is to hold together this fractious international coalition against all of the centrifugal forces that pull at every coalition. Washington is somewhat the same way. He's got a higher calling. Now, he's more of a battlefield commander because he's, he's, he is there responsible for moving regiments around. But he's also responsible for holding together what will become an international coalition. They're, they're most similar, I think, Rob. First of all, they're two of the 12 generals in American history who become president. But they're most similar in that they are the best political generals we've ever had. And by that, I mean, in Washington's case, after he takes command of the Continental Army, uh, in, at Cambridge in July of 1775. That month, he writes seven letters to his political masters, the Continental Congress. His correspondence is full of letters to uh, uh, colonial governors. They, they become state governors in 1776, uh, committees of, uh, of safety. Uh, he is really working the political structure. Part of this is to demonstrate his subordination to civilian control. This is a very fraught subject in the 18th century. They all know who Cromwell was. And he wants to demonstrate, he's making this up as he goes along, and we still abide by it today. He's making the clear declaration that civilians are running the war. They are controlling him. Eisenhower is similarly gifted in this way. He's chosen as, uh, as Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force because, as Roosevelt says, um, he has extraordinary political instincts. He's the best politician among them, the generals. Eisenhower doesn't think this is a slur. Uh, and again, both of them recognize that the, to again quote Churchill, the only thing worse than uh, fighting with allies is fighting without them. And their job is going to be to hold together an, an allied coalition. In Eisenhower's case, there are 60 countries fighting in, in uh, the United Nations, uh, lowercase. In the case of Washington, he starts by, uh, in 1775, telling New Englanders, yes, I know you've hated French Canadians for 150 years because they have been conducting raids into New England with their Indian allies. Be nice to them. <laughs> Be nice to them. We need them. And, of course, the French are going to come into the war in 1778. He has a sequence of very close and important relationships with Lafayette, uh, Rochambeau, de Grasse, and, and others. 
that I think really unifies their generalship over a couple of centuries. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, you know, as I was reading the book again, based on what I've always thought about Washington, even some of what you've said, you know, as a battle commander, though, Washington does have his moments, and, and they're the sort of climax of the book. Now, you know, spoiler alert, we win the American Revolution. So I won't tell everyone. <laughs> oh, Rob, <laughs> come on. Oh, no. <laughs> so so, so the, the book ends, you know, this volume ends, I should say, you know, with the, the two Trentons, victories of Trenton and, and Princeton. Uh, you, you say George doubled down at, at Trenton. Can you, second Trenton, yeah, can you tell us about that? Yeah, and I don't want to sell him short as a, as a field commander because he does have his moments and these are the best of the moments that he has. Um, well, he's desperate. He's, he's, he's been kicked out of New York. Um, he's been overrun at Fort Lee, just across the Hudson River on the Jersey side from New York. Um, he is being pursued across New Jersey. His army is less than 3,000 soldiers. It's the size of a latter-day brigade. Yeah. That's the Continental Army. Uh, and they are bedraggled and they're, they're um, dispirited. Uh, he crosses the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. They lick their wounds for a while. He is really desperate. It's December of 1776. And he comes up with this crazy idea to cross back into New Jersey, across the Delaware. You know what happens on Christmas night, 1776. He catches a German garrison at Trenton by surprise. They are not drunk, incidentally, one of the many myths about the American Revolution. Uh, the commander, Colonel Rahl, is a very fine uh, 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 combat veteran. He's not drunk, uh, but they are surprised and they're destroyed. And uh, so he collects his prisoners, there's hundreds of them, crosses back into Pennsylvania, and instead of taking a victory lap and saying, you know, yay for me, I finally won one, he, he, he doubles down and he crosses again back into New Jersey, and this time he baits the British, who are basically, uh, the British army is at Princeton, 15 or 20 miles up the road, and he baits them into attacking him at Trenton, where he has the high ground on the Assunpink Creek, and uh, slaps him around pretty well, but darkness falls. It's not clear how he's gonna get back across the Delaware. It's full of ice. Uh, if he retreats south, he's potentially trapped in South Jersey. And so what does he do? He goes east. He goes east around the left flank of the British Army to Princeton, where there's a rear guard left there, and he destroys the rear guard. Uh, by this point, the British heads are spinning. Uh, you know, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the general that we've been fighting so far. And then he goes north into the high ground of, of New Jersey, where he goes into winter quarters. He's safe there, the British can't get at him. And there he's going to refit, rest. Um, it's a pretty brilliant campaign. I mean, no less a battle captain than Frederick the Great looked at it and said, whoa. <laughs> it's exactly what Frederick the Great said. I was reading his papers. Just be... <laughs> that, that's the German. That's the German version. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you, you need a German endorsement, Frederick the Great is as good as, yeah. it, is as, good as, it, as it gets. But yeah, that, those I will recommend to the, uh, the audience. Those portions, Rick, brilliantly written. It had me carried along in, in the excitement. But that's, you know, a definition of, of the American military. We will surprise you and bayonet you in your bed Christmas night, if necessary, right. for, for the liberty of the, uh, liberty of the yes. country. Um, Washington is the indispensable man, isn't he? Uh, I don't, I guess that would be Roosevelt for World War II perhaps, but maybe Eisenhower, but it's Washington for the American Revolution. Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. It's almost a cliche about him now. I mean, first of all, when he dies at Mount Vernon in December 1799, he has 300, more than 300 slaves. You cannot square that circle morally. Uh, and I know in his will he freed those that were under his control, but nevertheless, um, he is a slave master. And his uh, affluence, his success in life, as with uh, so many of the uh, southern plantation owners, is built on slavery. So there it is. Uh, but he is the indispensable man commanding the indispensable institution, the American army, the Continental Army, um, because he's got a number of other things going for him. For one thing, like Eisenhower, he is very robust. Uh, when Eisenhower becomes, Eisenhower is born in 1890, so he's 53 when he becomes uh, Supreme Commander of the Mediterranean. Washington is a decade younger. 
Uh, uh, he is, according to Jefferson, the greatest horseman of his age. He's 6'2". He, when he comes into a room, you have no doubt who's in command. He's got great command presence. Um, this counts when you're uh, a commander under any circumstances, but when you're in a, a, you have a small war, a small army, uh, your personal leadership, your personal ability to convey confidence uh, is, uh, is very important. Like Eisenhower, he, um, he has the ability to change his mind. Uh, he listens to subordinates. Uh, for example, he's against uh, inoculating his troops against smallpox. This is a very current issue. Oh, wow. <laughs> smallpox is the king of terrors. It's a terrible way to die. It makes COVID look like uh, a bad cold. And uh, smallpox w had ripped through the American army during the invasion of Canada in 75, 76. And uh, Washington had been against the crude method of inoculation that was available, in which basically somebody with a smallpox uh, a pustule on their arm cuts it open, takes a straw or a feather, dips it into the pus that's in there, cuts themselves on the leg or the arm, and swabs this toxic stuff there. I want to thank you for coming to New Orleans, Rick. I think we're... <laughs> I think it's time to corral you now. <laughs> so if you think getting vaccinated is problematic, about 1% of those who are given the smallpox deliberately this way die. About 13% or higher of those who get it naturally die. It's a very mortal disease. Washington is against initially inoculating his force because it requires that they be quarantined for several weeks. And that makes them vulnerable. And it also means that they're, they're uh, capable of spreading smallpox if they're not quarantined. He changes his mind when he's at Morristown after the victories, Trenton and New Jersey. Uh, he changes his mind because he, he, he sees that I got to do it. I've got to do it. So he, he issues, issues an edict. You will not come into this army unless you have been inoculated. And he enforces it rigorously. So that's an example of his flexibility. He's got a great eye for subordinate talent. Eisenhower does too. Washington sees that a 25-year-old overweight Boston bookseller named Henry Knox is going to be the father of American artillery. He's a genius as a gunner. Or that 30-something uh, 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 Quaker anchor smith from Rhode Island named Nathaniel Green mm -hmm. will become one of the great battle captains in American military history. He, he sees these guys and promotes them and gives them responsibility. So these are some of the reasons why he is the indispensable man. Rick, you speak of the foundational truths of the American Revolution. And, and you use, the, I believe you say, even if they're only aspirational, which means we're still trying to arrive at them. Well, what are those foundational truths? Uh, and I'm just, you know, while you're on the subject, do foundational truths exist for World War II? Or what do they tell us about this thing we still are trying to work out called democracy? Yeah, it's a really great question, Rob. I, I think there are foundational truths. In, in the case of the American Revolution, they're expressed uh, most eloquently by uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's about as foundational as it gets. Yes. Now, it's aspirational, and it's a lie because there are 500,000 black slaves in the country, but it's what we want to be. Uh, and it's embraced. People get it. Even if you're unlettered, that, the first third of the Declaration of Independence is this soaring dream of what we can become. You know, I think for World War II, uh, the four freedoms, occur to me. This is uh, Roosevelt in his State of the Union address in, in early 1941. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. And certainly it's aspirational. We've hardly purged the world of those things. Uh, Roosevelt, you know, on occasion talks about what he is hoping that comes out of this war. He, 
you know, self-determination is largely the mantra that we, we see. Now, he wants to eradicate empires. Obviously, the Japanese and German empire have got to go, but he has no uh, brief for the British empire or the French empire. It's a source of a great disappointment to Churchill. Uh, and, and, of course, he wants to replace it with an American empire, which he does. And, of course, the Soviet empire is going to be their parallel. But those, um, uh, those hopes for a mankind that is uh, precluded from, uh, uh, from being fearful, from wanting, from not being able to speak freely, from not being able to worship as they want to. These, these are foundational truths. These are things that we still believe in. And he expressed them on behalf of all of us, I think. I'd like to just give a nod to the title of this panel. My last question before I hand you over to the tender mercies of the audience. It's always fun here. Um, this panel is called The Greatest Generations. What would you like to say about this generation that fought and won the revolution? Um, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor with beautiful, beautiful rhetoric. And if you will, how, do, how would you compare them to the generation that won World War II, the one we celebrate here at the museum? Yeah, well, uh, this is where I piss off some people. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I want to go back to that uh, inoculation talk. <laughs> you know, uh, with, with all due respect to my close friend, uh, our friend, Tom Brokaw, I've always had issues with the greatest generation uh, for two reasons. And it's not at all reflective of my admiration. God, I've devoted a large part of my life to commemorating, celebrating uh, those who fought in World War II. But first of all, which generation are we talking about? George Marshall, born in 1880, George Patton in 1885, Dwight Eisenhower in 1890, or the generation of trigger pullers, born mostly in the 19-teens, 1920s. My father, born in 1924, went into the Army in 1942. So, that doesn't have the same ring, the greatest yeah. generations. No, it doesn't. Uh, but beyond that, I think it tends to um, diminish the contribution of generations that were just as critically important to us as a nation, starting with that revolutionary generation. Now, you know, that's a country of two and a half million people versus a country of 140 million people in the uh, in the uh, in World War II, but the generation that uh, commits itself to fighting for eight years so that we can be here today as we have uh, convened in this wonderful country, uh, I think, you know, you, you, you can't suggest that they're not the greatest generation. The Civil War generation fighting to hold together the Union, fighting to destroy slavery, that's a pretty great generation. So um, rather than narrow it down, and, and uh, when I raise this issue with Brokaw, he says, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Um, that's really all I have to answer you, except one more. You're writing a trilogy. You're committed. What's next, Rick? After the American Revolution. You oh, have your, wrong, amongst God. 300 of your closest <laughs> friends here, and I'm sure none of us will tell. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm pretty busy for the next uh, number of years. I'm, I'm, I've, uh, uh, I'm probably eight months from finishing the research on volume two of the Revolutionary War uh, trilogy. Um, all of us who are in the game are aware of a new word in our vocabulary, the semi-quincentennial. It's the 250th anniversary, which is coming up beginning in 2025 the 250th anniversary of Lexington and Concord. And so uh, we have our eyes on that. And then beyond that, life will take care of itself. That's great. I want to thank you, Rick. What a great conversation. Always a, always a treat. Rick thank Atkinson. You. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. And so we've arrived at the portion of our program. I'm going to hand things over. I think I see Jeremy Collins. We'll right, start to your right towards the back, gentlemen. Would you agree or disagree with the statement that another of George Washington's assets was the fact that he had no male children? Uh, hmm. 
Well, he had no male children, it is believed, because he was probably sterile. We know that Martha, who had children from her first marriage, uh, was not. She was capable of bearing children. And he was probably sterile because, again, we can go back and talk about smallpox. Mm, yeah. He had smallpox as a young man on a trip, the only trip he ever made outside of the United States, outside of America, was to uh, Barbados. And he contracted smallpox. He was pretty sick. Uh, and it can make you sterile. And it's, so it's believed that he had no issue as a consequence of that. Um, he had no um, male children of his own, but he, he adopted Martha's. He was a loving uh, stepfather, uh, embraced her extended family uh, and the, 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 his own extended family, because he had siblings who had kids and so on. Um, the, the question uh, presumes that there's concern that there'll be a dynasty somehow, a Washington dynasty. Um, he's taken very careful pains to ensure, uh, you know, as he moves from being a general and resigning the command of the Continental Army and going back to Mount Vernon, incidentally, in eight years, he's only at Mount Vernon once. He only goes home once in eight years, and that's for a very short visit. Uh, and he commits himself to uh, you know, the, the peaceful exchange of power when he's president. After two terms, that's it. Um, if he'd had a son, would there have been a, a you know, rallying around the Washingtons? I, I, I kind of doubt it. American politics by that point, where now we're talking about uh, 1799, uh, American politics are pretty robust there's a lot of really smart, capable guys out there. John, John Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, you know the list. Uh, and it's, I think, difficult to see that the country would have countenanced this kind of uh, uh, dynastic succession. Yeah, and it's just it's a remarkable man, though, who says, well, no, I've, I've had enough. I've had enough power. I've had enough this. I've had enough that. I'm done. Exactly right. Next question is to your right, halfway back with Connie. I'd uh, like to take a little issue with something you said earlier in your comments, that uh, George III was in fact wrong uh, when he said that um, if they lost the American colonies, that they would lose the empire. Uh, the American Revolution, in fact, was cited as an example for lots of decolonializations or wars of colonial liberal, liberation, uh, South Africa, India, uh, both Vietnams, uh, and so forth. So isn't it just a case of George III being right, but it taking a little longer? <laughs> well, we're all right if you give us enough time. <laughs> I mean, look, the, uh, the American uh, colonies, the states, split away. Uh, and the British defeat in the war, because it becomes a world war, and they're fighting not only the Americans, but the French, the Spanish, the Dutch. Uh, they've angered the Russians. Um, it, it costs them. There's no doubt about that. But for, as Adam Smith has told them, Wealth of Nations was published in 1776, you'll make more money by treating them as trading partners than treating them as vassal states. Now, he's very explicit about it. Uh, and that's true. As it turns out, we are the biggest trading partner after the war with Britain. And the first British Empire is then succeeded by a, of course, they've got to fight the French again. It's what they do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's succeeded by another British Empire that's going to be bigger, richer, uh, m more uh, expansive globally than the first British Empire ever was. So. Um, Decolonization is the, the way of the world, but it's going to take World War II to really yeah. uh, put the nails in the coffin where those aspirational issues that we talked about come to the fore and you have the creation of modern India, Israel, Kenya, all the nations that have come into being as a consequence of, of decolonization after World War II. It's a good point, though. It, it points up, in a sense, the continuing relevance of the American Revolution, the drive for liberation. People want to live free. Well, that's, that's right. And, and the American uh, Declaration of Independence is cited over and over in, in uh, movements of liberation around the world, and it continues to this day. 
Gentleman to your left towards the front. Good afternoon. Um, you had mentioned that George Washington had uh, 300 slaves at his death. Can you comment on the assertions made by the 1619 Project that one of the primary reasons for us uh, looking for uh, independence was the preservation of slavery? Good. Yeah, now we're really into the can of worms, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, we are. We're having a good time up here, Rick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the 1619 Project, for those of you who don't know, was a project by the New York Times with, I think, great intentions. It was to commemorate 400 years of slavery in America, first slaves arriving in uh, 1619, uh, and to look at what that meant to us as a country. And it was very ambitious, very sweeping, and in some cases, I think, quite wrong. Now, there's a book, I think it's out this week, on the, they've, they've converted that newspaper project uh, into a, what sounds like a very interesting s collection of essays on the larger theme. And from what I've read about the book, I've not seen it yet, but uh, they have uh, revised some of their thinking about some things and they have expanded and they have really worked the topic. It sounds like the book is excellent. The, the assertion that the revolution was fought to propagate slavery is just wrong. It's just wrong. Now, we can say a lot of things about slavery, and I will lead the band in denouncing it as the original sin. But the revolution begins in New England. And it's not that there's no slavery in New England. Rhode Island, in particular, is very active in the slave trade. And there are slaves in all of the New England colonies. But uh, it is a very small part of the economy and the culture of the firebrands who start the revolution. Uh, Samuel Adams is not declaring war on the king in order to preserve slavery. That's just not what's working. And you can go back and look at the original documents and it's pretty clear. Slavery becomes very complicated in the revolution as it is through all of our history. You have the British offering, for example, in Virginia to uh, give slaves their freedom if they will come fight for the Brits. It turns out it's a disaster for those slaves who, who do that uh, because they are treated badly, uh, sickness sweeps through them, smallpox again, dysentery, uh, typhus. Uh, there are efforts by the uh, American states to enlist black units. Rhode Island has a, a, a black regiment, basically. It's more like a, a, a company than a full regiment. Uh, there are proposals that South Carolina, when in 1780 they're about to be overrun and are overrun at Charleston, that, hey, why don't you arm your slaves to fight the British who are encircling in Charleston? South Carolinians say, I would rather die than do that. So this is very complicated. Uh, but the notion that the, the animating principle behind the revolution is to keep slavery going. First of all, who's the largest slave trading nation on earth? Great Britain. Britain. Great Britain. <laughs> right. And the slave trade is run out of Liverpool. Yeah. The slavery is still legal in uh, Britain at this point. Uh, so, um, and, but they're farther along, uh, no doubt about it. They're farther along than the Americans are in recognizing that it's a moral abomination and that, it's, uh, that it needs to go. But it is not why we fight the revolution. To your left again, towards the front. Thanks very much. Uh, Rick, as a, uh, somebody who's born, raised, and lives in the Boston area, I found the first half of your book uh, great, second half, not so much. Um, <laughs> That's pretty parochial. Yeah. There we are. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, question, and again, I don't know if you've studied this, but ironically, the greatest defeat by the U.S. in the Indian Wars occurs not, in, not on Grant's watch, but on Washington's watch, when uh, a group of a thousand or so uh, regular army or almost massacred in the Battle of the Wabash in 1791. Do you have any thoughts, or did you start at all about a Washington's role as a commander-in-chief? Because it also, when I read about it, it seemed like 
he didn't really, it's kind of like akin to Eisenhower, where there's a, the emphasis on the military. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, the, the Wabash is past my time period. There are, there are uh, significant Indian issues during the revolution. The Indians, incited by the British, are conducting raids on the frontier, which at that time is Western, what's now Western New York and along the Pennsylvania border. And there are lots of massacres, and the massacres go both ways. And Washington in 1779, uh, organizes the, the biggest campaign that he is going to conduct in 1779 is against the Indians. Uh, and he sends uh, uh, General Sullivan and another army under General Clinton, and they sweep through these Indians. They destroy 40 Indian towns uh, in an effort. It's punitive, and it's an effort to push them back into Canada to keep them away from the frontier. Uh, it's very ineffective because the Indians basically, like the Viet Cong have taken a page from them, they just fall back. They fall back and fall back. Very few Indians are killed or captured. And when the armies leave that area, the Indians are again going to begin the, resume the raids that they've conducted. Um, you know, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question, but Washington as commander-in-chief certainly recognizes that the essence of uh, leading uh, an army of liberation is political. And very few things that he does don't have a political component to them. And he thinks about politics, and he uh, recognizes the political consequences of what he's doing. Um, he, let's remember that Washington is a Virginian, and when he shows up to take command of the Continental Army in, in, uh, in 1775, in uh, July, um, he has almost nothing good to say about the, the army he's taking over. Yeah. They're all New Englanders for the most part. There are a few riflemen from uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania, but they're basically New Englanders. He writes in private correspondence about dirty New Englanders. He has nothing good to say about the junior officers. He's got to recognize, he's been out of uniform for 17 years, incidentally, from when he was a militia colonel. So there's a lot of things he doesn't know, and there's some things he's forgotten. And one of those things that I think he's got to, to, uh, to, to, to take on very quickly is the mystical bond between leader and led. He's left Mount Vernon in the care of all those slaves back there and his overseers and uh, his cousin who's uh, running the farm for him and Martha, of course, is there. Uh, m most of the soldiers who have come to fight at his side have left their farms and their shops. Uh, and it, it is, it's a problem for them. It's a problem because you have no income, you've left your wife and kids at home, uh, they have sacrificed immensely for the cause. And this is going to go on in one form or another for eight years. Washington has got to acknowledge that sacrifice. He's got to embrace it. He's got to weld himself to them in a way that they know in their bones that he understands who they are and what they're giving up. It's the essence of leadership. And we're not just talking about military leadership. And he, I think, comes to that realization slowly, and we see over the course of the first several years of the war this uh, commitment not only to the cause, but a commitment to, to Washington because he has a reciprocal affection that develops for them. This is a, a, a critical uh, component of his success as a military leader. You know, that patrician leading the sort of common men. I, I think of Wellington. You know, I don't know if these men scare the enemy. They certainly scare yeah, the hell out of me, as yes. Wellington famously yes. said about his own troops. Yep, yep. Uh, we're going to go to Connie on your right, gentlemen. Could you comment a little bit about the escape from the Battle of Long Island? And some have called that an American Dunkirk. And I would just be curious your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's not a misplaced uh, uh, analogy. Well, I mentioned that Washington um, gets his butt kicked at Long Island. He doesn't realize that the Brits, led by General Clinton, who will become the commander-in-chief, uh, are outflanking him, going around his, his left end. 
uh, and the Americans wake up, this is late August of 1776, the Americans wake up and the enemy is behind them. This is never good. Uh, and uh, there's a pretty good drubbing inflicted and uh, the American forces who have been positioned on a ridge line looking uh, uh, toward, uh, toward Staten Island uh, are falling back in chaos and disbelief and some of them drown trying to get away. Uh, Washington is watching all this from some high ground and you know he's shaking his head. Um, they fall back to Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a little village at the time, and it's got entrenchments around it. So it's a pretty substantial fortified pl a place to, to, uh, to, to take refuge as the British and the Germans are coming ever closer. They're within several hundred yards. And Washington realizes that uh, he's in danger, he's pinned against the East River, and he's in danger of being obliterated. And in that case, the war probably does end. Mm -hmm. And so he uh, agrees uh, in a council with his senior commanders that we will, we will leave tonight. And he orders every fishing smack and rowboat and sailing vessel that you can find to be uh, brought uh, to coves on the East River and the forces uh, tiptoe down to the water side. If you go to the Brooklyn Bridge today on the Brooklyn side, you can see there's signage of where this happened. It's at the, the base of the Brooklyn Bridge today. And they slip away a very provident, the wind, first of all, uh, picks up and it is favorable to them. And then there's a very uh, providential fog that comes in. The British don't know that they're leaving. And the next morning comes, the, the British, you know, they don't hear much from behind those fortifications. They send uh, uh, scouts forward. They see the last of the boats, Washington's in one of those last boats, crossing the East River. It's a miraculous escape back to Manhattan, where they will live to fight another day. Now, they're going to be evicted from Manhattan soon after that. The British land at Kipps Bay on September 15th. Uh, uh, it, it just isn't going well in the campaign for New York. But he has preserved his army, which is the critical uh, thing for him. He's got to have an army if he's going to fight a war. You know, a friend of the museum who's spoken here a couple times, Patrick O'Donnell, has written a really good book on this, yes. this topic, the, yes. the Indispensables, it's called, which takes you through it in chapter and verse. Uh, your, your, your section's on in this book, too. It, it's, it's a chase, you know? It's it a is, chase. It the is. good guys get away, but just barely. Next question right in front, please. As usual, you're excellent. Appreciate uh, your continued visits to the museum, and your book was excellent. Is it possible to compare or contrast beyond the obvious 150-year difference the experience of the soldiers themselves? And can you also comment on their progression from the beginning of the wars to the end as fighting uh, soldiers, good their question. aptitudes? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I'll try and be succinct because um, dissertations can be written on this uh, great subject. Uh, let's look at that American World War II force first. 16.1 million in uniform in World War II in a country of 140 million. Um, they are uh, not always okay. extremely well trained, but they are trained, particularly as we begin uh, pushing those divisions uh, into Europe and out into the Pacific. They have had a fair amount of time, often with a cohort of combat veterans taken from other divisions. So uh, there is a plan for making them available for combat. Now, the plan doesn't, you know, the 106th Division shows up in the Ardennes. They're not only the newest, greenest unit in the Army, they're the youngest because they're the first division to be taking 18-year-olds, and they get destroyed. Uh, so the plan doesn't survive contact with the enemy on occasion, but for the most part, I think that that force, American force, and particularly the Army, 8 million strong, is uh, pretty formidable. The, and it gets stronger as you go along as... Um, Part of what's happening is the sifting out of the capable from the incapable, of the uh, physically vigorous from those who cannot handle it physically or mentally, 
of the lucky from the unlucky. <laughs> What's the trait Napoleon most cherishes in his generals? Luck. 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 Never to be under underestimated in, in life and never to be underestimated in war. So those uh, junior officers, senior officers, NCOs are all rising to the top so that they can lead that force that is going to fight the last year of the war. It is, it's a ferocious, ferocious army. It's different in the revolution. First of all, the uh, notion of a, a farmer leaving his plow on the furrow and grabbing a musket to go off in defense of freedom, that's mostly poppycock. There is some of that, but as the war goes on, trying to fill the ranks is an endlessly agonizing problem for Washington and the Congress and everybody associated with the American war effort to the point where I mentioned, you know, should we arm the slaves? to the point where uh, uh, paying substitutes becomes as common as actually enlisting men in the army. And their uh, capabilities, there are a, a number particularly of officers who've had experience in the French and Indian War, as Washington has, and that's very valuable. These guys have smelled gunpowder and they know something about campaigning. Uh, but for most of the rank and file, uh, they don't know much about it. They've got, they're familiar with, with firelocks, with muskets, uh, because everybody's got one. But uh, trying to teach them the, the rigors of, 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 of a semi-professional army, is, that's going to take years. And the fact that there's such turnover uh, is, uh, makes it very problematic. So the, you know, by the time you get to Yorktown in 1781, yeah. Okay, it's a pretty good army, uh, but we don't win Yorktown if we don't have the French. We don't win the war if we don't have the French. Uh, so it requires sort of external bolstering to, to, to be successful. We're going to go a little long on this Q&A session uh, so we can get at least two more questions in. Thanks. First, I want to say <clears throat> this was really great, the discussion. I really enjoyed it. Good. I want to ask you, Rick, something you touched on. In Viet during the Vietnam War, there was a lot of, in this country, obviously, uh, different attitudes and attacks on the war. How, in England, how was there much of that in England against sending the British, you know, their soldiers over to, to us to fight? And um, I, are there any books about that? I've often thought about it. I wonder what they really felt in England and how, you know, how I could learn a little more about it. Yeah, I agree with Rob. That's a really good question. It's a very interesting issue. I, I spend a lot of time on the other side of the hill. Uh, this first book, we're with the British Army, we're with the, the, we're with the King and the Cabinet a lot. And uh, that issue is something that uh, I, I think is fascinating. There is a robust opposition in Britain. And it has some of the uh, greatest minds of uh, British politics uh, aligned with it, including Edmund Burke, uh, in including uh, Lord Chatham, uh, in in including uh, Charles James Fox, who's probably the, the, the greatest orator in Parliament. And that's saying something when you compare him to, to Burke and, and, and Chatham at his best. Uh, they are against the war. And they're against the war in part because they're against the king. They're against the, the ministry as it exists. They, they don't like, they're looking for power themselves. They don't like domestic politics. And they are a robust, noisy opposition. They're also relatively small. They're always in the minority in parliament. They move repeatedly uh, to uh, e either uh, reprimand uh, certain generals or the progress of the war, whatever, and they always fall short by a lot until we get very late in the war. There is in the 
you know, in, out in the countryside, how do people feel about it? Well, in Britain, they are electing their parliament, so the parliament is largely reflecting British uh, public opinion. There are doubts about it. You know, what, what are we doing? <laughs> well, this, is, this has gone on for a long time. It's really expensive. The people who are paying the most in taxes are increasingly agitated about it because taxes keep going up. They read the casualty lists. Uh, there are a lot of dead British soldiers, and they are never coming home. They're going to find a grave in a foreign field. Uh, so there is anxiety about it, but the anxiety does not translate into a significant enough political opposition to change direction until really Yorktown. Saratoga gives them pause uh, because the British army at Saratoga, having invaded down Lake Champlain in 1777, is trapped and destroyed. It's a big, it's a, it's a very large shock in Britain. And of course, it's going to bring the French in. And when it, when it becomes a, a global war, that works in two ways. First, they, the Brits rally round mm -hmm. the king and rally round the cause. Because now, we're, you know, it's not those pesky, noisy, dirty Americans. It's the French. It's the French. <laughs> <laughs> we can all get behind that. <laughs> And uh, it, it's really quite something. The French and the Spanish send an armada in 1779, very similar to the armada of 1588. They are off the coast, the southern coast of England, with plans to take Portsmouth, the biggest, most important British naval base. And there's even talk of maybe marching on London. It goes wrong. The, this this uh, fleet is uh, uh, stricken with uh, bad luck and with disease. Uh, but at this point, the, the British people are fully on board this war. The American uh, aspects of it are really kind of a footnote. And so that's one of the reasons why their support continues uh, into the 1780s. The question to your left, halfway back, it needs to be a short question, and sorry, Rick, probably a short answer as well. Well, this will try to be a short uh, question, but uh, the, the capture of the Hessian mercenaries, um, did that lead to like the uh, reason why mercenaries started to become unpopular use in the military? Because you don't hear much about it later on, and is that why um, the British probably declared them drunk? instead of uh, saying that they were just captured? Well, the British were looking for scapegoats because it's the British who put them there. And the, the, the disposition of those uh, compounds, including Trenton, that was a British brainstorm. It was stupid. Uh, they were very exposed. Uh, the use of, of mercenaries, some people don't like the term mercenary, but the use of particularly uh, German auxiliary troops had been common throughout the 18th century. Remember that George III comes from Hanoverian stock. His, his George I and George II, his great-grandfather and his grandfather, who had been the kings preceding him, were born in Germany. So tapping into that reservoir of uh, manpower was a natural thing for them. Um, the, the, the British are never going to renounce the use of, of Hessian mercenaries. They're, they're going to be with us in uh, this country in the war until the end. Uh, one of the things that happens, the last thing I'll say about it and, and, uh, and, and end it there, is that when those hundreds go into captivity, they are, uh, for the most part, sent to what we know as Pennsylvania Dutch country. Dutch is a perversion of Deutsch. They're Germans who've emigrated to Pennsylvania, and there are a lot of Germans in Pennsylvania and Maryland, some in New York, and the prisoners are sent out there in part to work, in the same way that prisoners in World War II, German prisoners, worked on farms in the Midwest and so on. And they're looking around and they're saying, you know, it's ain't half bad. Yeah, <laughs> mein Gott. <laughs> yeah, <that's what> <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of them end up staying. And when you drive around 
Carlisle or, or points uh, east of there in Pennsylvania and you see all those German names, uh, you can bet your uh, bottom fennig that uh, <laughs> a lot of them are Hessian prison, descendants of Hessian prisoners who decided not to go back to Germany. The number of times we got Germany into this discussion, just, I, I'm really <laughs> impressed, Rick. I want to thank you personally for that. <laughs> Patino, before everybody gets up to go for the book signing and the break, um, I have some important announcements that really benefit you all here sitting with us. Uh, you, you know we have been talking about our upcoming programs. January, we have a one-day symposium on the Band of Brothers 20th anniversary. Actors, cast, crew, people behind the scenes, family members of Easy Company, we do have a few slots left for that. You've heard about our March 24th through 26th all virtual conference. Uh, we hope you register for that and tune in for that three-day program. And lastly, over my shoulder, we have our 20 22 International Conference. We just had our planning meeting on Thursday night because after a long day, that's what we want to do. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the benefit to you all is you are a smaller group this year. Next year, we will hopefully be back to our usual size of close to 500, and we will sell out the hotel. So those of you that are enjoying the comfort of the Higgins Hotel, you probably want to book soon. The other benefit is we have the rates stated as this year's rates. We might change that on January 1. So if you all book, not only will you get the hotel dibs, you will get this year's rates. If you book the conference alone, you'll save $100. If you book the conference and the symposium package, you'll save $150. So thank you for letting me make this plug. Thank you to our dear friend and advisor, Rick Atkinson, and thanks to Rob. Be back at 1.30, please. At the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, there is a new experience as epic, as extraordinary as the conflict it honors, beyond all boundaries. It is an immersive 4D cinematic journey through the war that changed the world, shown exclusively in the museum's one-of-a-kind Victory Theater. I'm proud to have served as executive producer of Beyond All Boundaries, and you can see it exclusively every hour only at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Hey y'all, I'm Amanda Shaw. We all know Louisiana is as fun as all get out. So get out, take a road trip, and explore our state. Fill her up, then try a new restaurant that's as fun-loving as it is food-loving. Grab the family and take off for monumental adventures at our 21 state parks. Or take a magical minivan tour along our 19 scenic trails and byways. Louisiana's a trip. 
pick one today. This is Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Plan your road trip at louisianaisatrip.com. In World War II, the road to Berlin followed many paths. Some marched the sun-scorched deserts of North Africa, while others crawled the sands of Omaha Beach. From the rubble-strewn streets of Italy to the frozen forest of the Ardennes, each soldier, sailor, and airman's journey was his own. But all were united by a common cause, victory. Follow in their footsteps on the road to Berlin, new at the National World War II Museum. It should have been impossible, crossing the world's widest ocean, to answer an attack made by a powerful adversary. From island to island to island, we fought through hostile terrain, malnutrition, disease, and at every step, an enemy that just kept coming. It should have been impossible. Find out how millions of Americans pushed past impossible on the road to Tokyo, new at the National World War II Museum. They were ordinary people, just like you and me, who never expected to find themselves like this. But they found courage. They found grit, grace. They found strength in each other. And in their stories, we find strength within. The National World War II Museum. Find the extraordinary inside. Five years ago, this was a vast checkerboard of potato farms on New York's Long Island. Today, a community of 60,000 persons living in 15,000 homes, all built by one firm. This is Levittown, one of the most remarkable housing developments ever conceived. There is no job like it on the face of the earth. In the power which is concentrated here at this desk, and in the responsibility and difficulty of the decisions. We've made progress in spreading the blessings of American life to all our people. There's been a tremendous awakening of American conscience on the great issues of civil rights. A third world war might dig the grave not only of our communist opponents, but also of our own society, our world, as well as theirs. Starting atomic war is totally unthinkable for a rational man. I suppose that history will remember my term in office as the years when the Cold War began to overshadow our lives. I have had hardly a day in office that has not been dominated by this all-embracing struggle, this conflict between those who love freedom and those who would lead the world back into slavery and darkness. And always in the background, there has been the atomic bomb. When Franklin Roosevelt died, I thought there must be a million men better qualified than I to take up the presidential task. But the work was mine to do and I had to do it, and I've tried to give it everything that is in me.
yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost.
got about a little over 1,700 uh, veterans going in today, and uh, we're excited about it. It'll probably take a day and a half, two days to get it, uh, get it right, get them all lined up. We have anywhere from about 800 uh, to about 1,500 bricks per, per install. This one's a little bit larger than, uh, than our normal install, which is nice. The commemorative brick program started here at the museum um, before the museum actually officially opened. It started as a volunteer run, run program and it's kind of grown alongside uh, the museum as well. It's pretty amazing. What started out uh, as impressive has grown monstrative and uh, it's become more like a, a rallying cry ar around the museum, around what's going on, around what's going on with our veterans and the, and the the, the, the greatest generation kind of dying off. Today we have, as I mentioned, a little over 45,000 bricks uh, on campus, and all of our bricks are around the perimeter of the museum campus, so both Andrew Higgins Drive, Magazine Street, and then we have some interior bricks as well. With all of our bricks, it's three possible lines of text, 18 possible characters per line. One of the great things is kind of hearing the stories that people submit with, with their brick and the brick text. Um, we, so we do have primarily World War II uh, honorees serving in some capacity, either on the home front or abroad. My family actually purchased four bricks, um, two of which are still living World War II veterans. My grandmother, who will be 97 in March, and my great uncle, who will be 104 on Mardi Gras Day. We also have quite a few veterans who served, um, you know, in other other capacities during this time as well. And those who support our mission, we have quite a few volunteers who have uh, bricks here at the museum, and, and those who have served the World War II Museum's mission as well. You're not just necessarily buying a brick for a World War II veteran. You can buy a brick to memorialized efforts of, of volunteers. My husband's family purchased one for his father. They had three World War II veterans who were very close. So I decided, well, it'd be nice to honor all of them. But what we did is we put all three names on the brick and we put World War II buddies and put the division they were in. It was just such an honor to be able to buy one for the three of them. And it just, it means a lot to us as well as to, to his family. We certainly understand the, the, how meaningful these tributes are to, to all the brick donors. That's why we do everything in our power uh, to you know, not only make sure these are installed and taken care of in a timely manner, and also in a manner that's you know, uh, up to the quality of the museum. I don't think you can make an investment, a cheaper investment anywhere that'll have a more lasting impact in memorializing their efforts. We're getting to a point that it's kind of a legacy of service or, and, you know, how, what that service means today um, for, for other families. I think it's heartwarming for everybody that's w involved with the project. J just being involved with the project is uh, uh, amazing, but handling the memorialization of the soldiers is just, it brings it to another level. The fact that their names will forever be here and people can walk by and know, look and see where they they were stationed and what they did. Our bricks here, they're lasting tributes, and, you know, this is a, uh, a brick program here. I mean, it's seen by millions of visitors every day. It's really moving and very special. The American Battle Monuments Commission and the National World War II Museum in New Orleans have partnered together to help educators better learn the stories of the American experience of the war in Europe. Join us for a four-week online teacher professional development course that will explore critical campaigns, decisions, events, and about those who served in the European theater through the lens of ABMC's cemeteries and memorials. Beginning with the invasion of Sicily and Italy in 1943, each module will cover the Allied efforts to eliminate fascism from Europe. This course will provide access to noted World War II scholars, museum and ABMC staff members, and virtual resources educators can incorporate into classroom instruction. 
employing a rich array of curriculum built upon primary source materials from both the American Battle Monuments Commission and the National World War II Museum, this free online course will aid teachers in finding new and exciting ways to bring the legacy of World War II to life. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, please take your seats. We'll start in a moment. Out of the hallway. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. Thank you very much.
So welcome back everybody. Uh, Dr. Mueller just said, let's go. So we're gonna go. And I hope everybody enjoyed uh, Rick and Rob's conversation. Now we're gonna shift a bit. We'll move into our next session, a panel on the evolving relationship between Germany and the Soviet Union from the interwar years through the Second World War. We have Dr. Ian Johnson, the P.J. Morgan Family Assistant Professor of Military History at the University of Notre Dame. Pretty cool. And Dr. Sean McKeegan, the Francis Flournoy Professor of European History at Bard College. Welcome. We'll provide a new interpretation on this topic. And then our very own Dr. Nick Mueller will offer comments uh, before opening up the panel to the audience question and answer. So with that, over to you, Nick. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see everybody again. Thank you, Mike. It's been my pleasure to welcome our distinguished speakers here. First time speakers at, uh, at our International World War II Conference, uh, Ian Johnson and Sean McMeekin. Uh, and it's always great to add new historians with the latest research and, and new discoveries. And so uh, we're, we're look, looking forward to it. Now, I know you've all just had lunch a little while ago, and uh, this is the beginning of an afternoon of, of great sessions. So, but of new perspectives on Joseph Stalin and the secret military collaborations and machinations between Germany and Russia in the interwar years won't keep you awake. I don't know what will, but uh, uh, your program has a bio, so I won't mention much more than what Mike did, but uh, first just let me say that Ian Johnson reached out to me several years ago as his book was uh, being uh, in, going to press uh, before it was published, and uh, he did so because he had found by some means that uh, knew a little bit of my research and my dissertation at the uh, University of North Carolina on the road to Rapallo, the German-Russian relations from 1919 to 22. Well, COVID delayed his publication a little bit, but he kept me posted on it. And uh, when it finally arrived, I was really just thrilled to see it. Uh, and I immediately called him up and uh, lured him to uh, come to this conference. We had a, an opening, and so we got both of these gentlemen because of that. He has his PhD from Ohio State University and is now P.J. Moran Assistant Professor at Notre Dame. He's published a number of other articles. You can read that uh, in your book. But this hot off the press, The Faustian Bargain, uh, the Soviet-German partnership and origins of the Second World War has filled a major gap uh, in the research in this area in the last 50 years. He's researched his book far and wide, digging deeply into uh, 23 archives in five countries and three languages to bring to light a new knowledge and information and research on the Soviet declassified collections in particular of this uh, secret military uh, dealings, arms dealings between the Red Army and the German Reichswehr from 1919 to the outbreak of war when Hitler's tanks and troops violated the non-aggression pact and uh, with the Soviets and stormed into Russia in Operation Barbarossa. My own research on the subject uh, could, did not have access to the Soviet archives in those days. Uh, so uh, uh, I had to build a, a strong case for what he later proved to be the case with the documents. So it was very hard without the Soviet archives to find the smoking guns in this relationship. But uh, I can assure you that he has discovered all the smoking guns and, uh, and you'll be interested to hear some of them. Uh, so here's the book, you can get it later. It's uh, beautifully written with surprises and re revealing stories on just about every page. Our other speaker, Sean McMeekin, uh, whose new book, uh, here it is. Now this is a tome, and I understand that the store managers agreed if you buy one of these plus the Faustian bargain, you'd only have to buy three, two more books to get free shipping. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of, instead of three. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but in any event, uh, he says uh, it's a new history of World War II, Stalin's war. Well, he kind of tips his hand um, in this uh, larger than life uh, study of uh, Stalin's role as the master manipulator of the allies and a much more central place in allied victory than thought before. Uh, so, in any event, uh, just to mention again, he's the Francis Fornoy Professor of European History at Bard uh, College with 
Uh, teaching stints uh, far and wide as far as Yale, University of Istanbul, Ankara, and NYU before he went to Bard, winner of numerous uh, prizes on his books uh, on the origins of the First World War, Germany's bid for world power. Now, Stalin's war has uh, generated a lot of controversy, and you'll see that in our questions and our discussion and his presentations that uh, he shifts your focus to look at the war from Stalin's perspective far to the east instead of from Washington uh, and London and Berlin, which is one of the interesting aspects of it. Uh, he makes a statement that Rob, I know it's, he's engaging too because I saw a webinar he did with our own Rob Zatino, and uh, Rob uh, caught one, read one point on page 94 that was as startling to me as it was to Rob. He said, there was only one statesman in Europe who truly relished the prospect of a general war breaking out over Poland, and that was Stalin. Well, he's going to elaborate on that in his remarks, but it's a fast-paced book. Despite its uh, size and pages, uh, you'll find it fascinating reading and uh, and I've already given you the, the best bargain in terms of the shipping deal. So <laughs> uh, these two books are complementary. Uh, Ian's goes through the interwar years up to uh, the beginning of the war. Uh, and Sean's uh, covers Stalin uh, during the war. But there is some overlap in areas of significance. And I'll leave it up to our discussion after their talks to examine uh, where they are in alignment or not. But one other statement, I'll just uh, whet your appetite a little bit too on uh, something that uh, uh, Ian writes. He says toward his conclusion that, uh, quote, the, German, the Soviet German partnership formed at Rapallo in 1922 not only helped to explain the outbreak of, World War, of the Second World War in Europe, it also offers some insights into the course, conduct, and eventual conclusion of that conflict offering some explanation for initial German successes, the horrors of fighting on the Eastern Front, and the ultimate Soviet victory. It's quite a statement. Both of you uh, set things up pretty well for us this afternoon. So adhering to the chronology of the two books, I'll ask Ian to go first, and then followed by Sean McMeaton. They'll both speak 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll get on to the questions. Thank you, Nick, for the introduction and the, the chance to come and, and join all of you here at the World War II Museum. I'm grateful for the, the team that's done such a ter terrific job with logistics and, and organization. I'd like to also have a, a shout out to my, uh, my students at Notre Dame. Several of them have mentioned they're going to watch the live stream today. And as one of them very pointedly mentioned in an email to me this morning, I'm competing with a Notre Dame football game. So uh, <laughs> thank you for making the right choice. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy today. So today I'm going to be speaking about my new book, Faustian Bargain, the Soviet-German Partnership and the Origins of the Second World War. The Second World War in Europe began just before sunrise on September 1st, 1939, when 50 divisions of the reborn German army invaded Poland from the west. Great Britain and France reluctantly declared war on Germany 48 hours later, and then to the surprise of much of the world, the Soviets soon invaded Poland from the east two weeks later. That the war began over Poland, and, it, and the fact that it began with the Soviets and Germans working together was a product of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. In August 1939, Hitler and Stalin had agreed to partition Eastern Europe between them. The story of that Soviet-German partnership in 1939 is often described as a moment of opportunism, where two dictators who despised each other saw temporary advantage in aligning with each other. There's something to that, but, but in fact, Germany and the Soviet Union had actually been working together for most of the previous two decades. The invasion of Poland actually marked the culmination of a partnership that had begun at the end of the First World War. In 1919, when cooperation between the German army, the, the Reichswehr in the aftermath of the First World War, and the new Soviet state forming to the east, when it began, it was, it was a difficult prospect to imagine for very many, including its participants. For it's hard to overstate how much the two sides hated one another. 
In that year, Lenin would publicly refer to the German military as savages, plunderers, and predators, and credit the Germans with having set all records in war atrocities in the First World War. As you see from this, these posters here, the, the one uh, to the right, uh, this is a depiction of a German soldier as a gorilla with the rather subtle caption, kill him, a Bolshevik propaganda poster from 1919. For much of the Bolshevik leadership in Moscow, the, the right-wing military officers who dominated the interwar German army were the archetypes of counter-revolution, the, the villains of their propaganda. For their part, the German officer corps were about as fond of the Bolsheviks in turn. Many German officers had participated in uh, the quite brutal uh, suppression of a communist revolution in early 1919. One Reichswehr non-commissioned officer would write, that, quote, the rulers of present-day Russia are common bloodstained criminals, the scum of humanity carrying on the most cruel and tyrannical regime of all time. And you get some sense of this from German propaganda in the same year. So why did two groups who saw each other as the literal embodiment of evil strike a deal with one another? Their hostility to the international order in the aftermath of the First World War first brought them together. In the summer of 1919, the victorious allies issued the Treaty of Versailles. Germany was to be forcibly disarmed, to pay reparations, and to give up over 10% of its, its land area. The victorious allies further completely dismantled the vaunted Imperial German army, reducing it from over 5 million to only 100,000 men, of whom only 4,000 could be officers. Germany was further banned from possessing aircraft, armored vehicles, chemical weapons, submarines, all of the modern accoutrements of war. And to oversee this process and guarantee Germany could not start a new world war, the Allies stationed inspectors across German territory to dismantle German military industry and demobilize the German army. The terms of Versailles were so harsh when the German army initially learned of them that they held a secret conference in the summer of 1919 to discuss the possibility of reopening hostilities. But they concluded that resistance was impossible. Germany would lose if it tried to resume the war. Instead, the remnants of the German high command decided to embark upon a program surreptitiously to restore Germany's military might, concealed at first even from their own government. Their stated aim was not just to overturn the Treaty of Versailles, but in fact to overturn the outcome of the First World War. Meanwhile, to their east, in 1919, the Soviet Union was not yet in existence. The Bolsheviks were in the midst of a desperate fight for their very survival against 18 allied armies then fighting on their territory, as well as the forces of the various white factions, the anti-Bolshevik forces within the Tsarist Empire. It was in this moment of, of isolation and desperation in both Germany and the USSR that the two sides began exchanging military envoys, intelligence, and technology, at first quite subtly and on a small scale in 1919. The first secret military conference was held not long thereafter in 1921. And the following year, in 1922, Soviet Russia and Weimar Germany signed the Treaty of Rapallo, which normalized relations between the two states. In part, thanks to the cover that that provided, five months later, the Reichswehr and, and the Soviet Red Army negotiated the first secret accord to begin relocating banned German industries and training facilities to Soviet soil. You see here a, a surreptitious picture taken by a Soviet intelligence officer of one of these early meetings. What did these two arch enemies hope to achieve by working together? Well, General Hans von Zeicht, pictured here looking rather Prussian with his monocle, uh, wanted to rebuild German military power inside the Soviet Union, away from the prying eyes of the inspectors and allied soldiers then occupying Germany. He had three specific means to this end. First, to relocate banned German military industries, then in the process of being destroyed, to the Soviet Union. Second, to train his officers, again, that small officer corps, to train them and make them as professional as possible on the new technologies of war. But unfortunately for, for that vision, this is how the German army was training and practicing tank warfare prior to cooperation with the Soviets. We've got a, a couple of poor officers who for hours on end would have to hold up paper mache elements to make it look like they were in fact inside of a tank. It was even more humiliating when they had to practice uh, aerial maneuvers and, and poor German officers had to ride motorcycles with wings strapped to the side. This was hardly uh, an appropriate means to rebuild German military power. The final element of Zeke's vision involved actually developing new technologies of war themselves, 
prototypes that could serve as the basis for a broad general rearmament of Germany, particularly aviation and armored warfare technologies. For his Soviet partners, the aims were somewhat similar. Leon Trotsky, who headed the Red Army until 1925, sought to rebuild a devastated Soviet Union with German assistance. The Red Army was in disastrous conditions in the aftermath of the Russian Civil War. The majority of its men had no uniforms, let alone working weapons. A majority of the officer corps were untrustworthy Tsarist-era officers, many of them aristocrats, who had to be monitored closely by political commissars lest they commit treason. The entire Soviet Air Force was down to 73 aircraft in 1922, most of which were probably not safe to fly. And it, perhaps most humiliatingly, much of the Red Army's rusting tank forces were actually redeployed to, with plows to assist farming in Ukraine in the aftermath of the Russian Civil War. Trotsky wanted German assistance in developing a new professional officer corps and new technologies with which to equip it, lest the Soviet Union fall in the face of, of capitalist encirclement. As a result of these shared aims, the two sides began building a network of secret factories and military facilities throughout the Soviet Union to achieve their shared goals. The first element of their partnership, and one that would continue fitfully until 1941, centered on relocating German, indust or German industries uh, to the Soviet Union, cooperation between German corporations and the Red Army. You get some sense of the network and its scope, mostly in, in Europe and Russia. I'm going to note briefly what went on at some of these different facilities. Here you can see a picture of Feely, a major aircraft factory located just outside of Moscow. The German military and the Junkers Corporation, a major aeronautical engineering firm in Germany, took over this factory on a lease in 1923. It was designed to produce fighters and eventually would produce the first Soviet four-engine bomber, the TB-3. Several thousand Russian workers were employed here, working under German managers and joint German and Soviet engineering teams. Other facilities managed by German corporations worked on artillery, tanks, chemical weapons, rifles, machine guns, submarines, just about anything with military utility. The scale of this cooperation would grow to staggering proportions. The, the Germans would become by far the Soviet Union's largest trading partner by 1931 and almost every major German firm would receive contracts from the Red Army to build weapons or modernize or build factories, more than 255 German firms in total. Most of these contracts were in fact mediated by the German Army, who set up their own secret office in Moscow, known as Moscow Center, to serve as a negotiating hub for German firms interested in relocating banned operations to the Soviet Union. To give some sense of how significant this effort was in the overall uh, development of Soviet military industry, by 1940, more than half of all Soviet tank production was dependent on German built, designed, or managed factories. As corporate projects took off, German military leadership also sought to expand direct military to military cooperation. The first of these arrangements centered on salvaging Germany's air power. In 1923, General von Zeicht began dispatching German pilots to a Soviet air base in, in Lipetsk in south central Russia. There they trained Soviet cadets on basic flight technique. In 1925, the Germans acquired this entire base on a lease from the Soviet government. The Germans got a lot out of this facility. They trained new pilots, developed new tactics, rewrote their training manuals. They also developed new technologies. Nearly a thousand pilots, mechanics, and observers in total would be trained at this facility. For context, the, about the entire size of the Luftwaffe when it formally reformed in 1935. 22 future Luftwaffe generals of three-star rank or above either taught, trained, or commanded this facility in its time of operation. In fact, one of its alumni, General Wilhelm Speidel, would later write that, quote, the spiritual foundations of the entire future Luftwaffe were developed on that Russian aeronautical field. So what did the Soviets get out of all of, all of this in turn? Well, they too trained pilots and mechanics and engineers in the German managed training courses. But their most important aim was to borrow or, or steal German technology. Seven out of eight German aviation firms that existed in 1925 would sign secret development contracts, all of them illegal under German law, with the Reichswehr to begin developing fighter prototypes for testing at Lipetsk. The Soviets had access, legally, uh, to any design that arrived at this facility. They were allowed to fly, photograph these aircraft, etc. The Soviets would go a little farther. They would 
take apart component parts, break into hangars and warehouses at night. Sure, the Germans might be holding out on them. But the sum result was uh, a great acceleration in the development of Soviet aviation technology. The Soviets would in fact go from having almost no domestic aviation industry to one of the largest in the world by the mid-1930s, largely thanks to technological theft and borrowing, much of it alongside the Germans. You can see here one of the designs that was tested that would in fact lead to the uh, Junkers 87 Stuka dive bomber, first tested and developed at Lipetsk. Lipetsk was not the only place where this sort of technological experimentation was underway. The Germans and Soviets established an, another joint base not far away, codenamed Kama, dedicated to tank warfare. Much like Lipetsk, it served as a training center, testing ground, and a place for tactical experimentation. Among the alumni of this facility were such notables in armored warfare as Heinz Guderian, Ernst Volkheim, Oswald Lutz, and on the Soviet side, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, perhaps the most famous Soviet theoretician. The school graduated about 200 officers in total between both the Germans and Soviets, but they were of a higher rank than those training at Lipetsk. On the German side, 17 of them would have become division commanders by the outbreak of the war or above. And in addition, nearly every tank that Germany would deploy in combat between 1938 and 1943 had been developed based on testing at Kama. Now, the most secretive element of Soviet-German cooperation centered on chemical weapons production and testing. Two major laboratories and testing grounds were dedicated to Soviet-German cooperation on this point. The first of them initially built in the suburbs of Moscow, only about seven miles from the Kremlin. This proved to be something of a problem when they were uh, dropping chemical agents from the air and unfortunately uh, hitting people in the Moscow suburbs. So the main base was actually moved out uh, much further afield later on in this period. Relying on human testing, sometimes on a huge scale, the Soviets and Germans jointly experimented with new chemical agents and deployment techniques. I argue in the book that the research logs from, from these facilities give some answer why chemical weapons weren't used in the Second World War, unlike the first. The Soviet and German research teams concluded, by the conclusion of their cooperation together, that chemical weapons did not work well alongside high-speed mechanized warfare of the kind that both Germany and the Soviet Union had, uh, had embarked upon in training and maneuvers, or with strategic bombing, something they spent a great deal of time exploring. Now let me turn to some of the consequences of this first era of Soviet-German cooperation. Hitler came to power in January 1933, helped in many ways by this period of cooperation. General Werner von Blonberg, who assisted Hitler in, in coming to power and shepherded the, the German military into the Nazi era, told a fellow officer, confused perhaps about his loyalty to Nazism, about why he had become so dedicated to Hitler. Blomberg replied, replied that, I have seen in Russia what can be gotten out of the masses. My trips to the Soviet Union turned me into a national socialist, end quote. General Hans von Zeigt, for his part, who was dismissed for political reasons in 1926 and then embarked on his own career in politics, would second Blomberg's views, telling Hitler personally in 1935 that, quote, our paths may have been different, but our ultimate aims were the same, end quote. Now, interestingly, once he came to power, Hitler did not immediately suspend military cooperation. Another testing season in the USSR would continue, despite Hitler's own hatred of communism. But soon, most of the bases were closed, as Hitler felt confident enough to restart training and technological development in Germany itself. He was no longer concerned about the Western Allies. This was, of course, part of Hitler's broader project of accelerating German rearmament, expanding the army, reestablishing the German Air Force, and rapidly raising defense spending. By 1935, the Luftwaffe had already received over 5,500 aircraft, and more than 500 tanks had been issued to the Wehrmacht. In other words, a window to halt German rearmament without a world war was rapidly shrinking. Now, there was broad awareness of the pace of German rearmament by 1935. When Hitler marched into the previously demilitarized Rhineland in 1936, the chief of the French general staff informed a shocked French prime minister that military intervention would be disastrous, as Germany was, in fact, already the strongest army in Europe. You get some sense of this from this cartoon from the famous David Lowe, Appeasement Illustrated. The caption reads, how much will you give me not to kick in your pants for, say, 25 years? Now, what's surprising about this is the date, 1936, well before the most infamous acts of appeasement. The British had, of course, reached similar conclusions. 
The British and French both concluded that they either needed to buy Hitler off and delay him while they rearmed themselves, a process that would take four to six years, or, or convince Hitler, not of, of course, not to start a war at all. In other words, the foundation laid by 11 years of secret rearmament paid immediate dividends for Germany, deterring intervention against Hitler as he achieved one foreign policy goal after another through 1938 and solidified his domestic control of Germany. Now, of course, the, the greatest and most disastrous consequence of secret rearmament work came in April of 1939. At that juncture, after years of rejecting quiet Soviet overtures to renew their period of cooperation, Hitler suddenly decided a new partnership with the USSR was in fact in his interest. That month, the German foreign ministry quietly told their Soviet counterparts that, quote, Hitler desired to, quote, renew the old Rapallo partnership of the 1920s and early 1930s. Again, couched in terms of renewal, not some sort of about face. In August 1939, as noted, Germany and the USSR would agree to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, partitioning Eastern Europe between them and renewing elements of the early military partnership. But most importantly, the renewed partnership paved the way for Hitler's invasion of Poland. Stalin followed suit some 16 days later, and their two forces began to intermingle in central Poland not long thereafter. On September 22, 1939, German General Heinz Guderian in the center here and Semyon Krivoshain uh, to, to his left met in the town of Brest-Litovsk, a town the Germans had taken but were turning over to Soviet uh, custodianship. They may have in fact been acquaintances. Both had trained at Kama in the USSR. Here we can see them celebrating their mutual victory over Poland, the high point of the Soviet-German relationship, ultimate fulfillment of cooperation that had begun 20 years earlier. Only 22 months later, however, the two states would be at war with one another. On June 22, 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. More than 30 million people would die in Eastern Europe over the next four years. What is remarkable is how much the two adversaries, in fact, had it in common when they began the war. Rarely in the annals of history have two opponents spent so much time arming each other for war. Invading German forces marched on boots made with rubber imported from the Soviet Union. They ate rations, including Soviet grain, which had continued to arrive up until the day of the invasion. Their ammunition contained chrome, nickel, steel, and manganese, all mined in the USSR. Their vehicles and aircraft drew heavily from the legacy of engineering work conducted in Russia and were fueled in many instances by Soviet oil. And some of the German field manuals, in fact, had been written in the USSR. Many German officers, too, had learned their trade in Soviet Russia. Across the lines, the story was much the same. Although few senior living Soviet officers had trained alongside the Germans because of the purges, most had been trained in facilities organized along German lines and in many instances staffed by German officers. Among German lecturers who taught for extended periods in Soviet military academies in the early period of cooperation were Erich von Manstein, Walter Model, Friedrich von Paulus, and Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel. Soviet operations would be managed by a Germ Soviet general staff modeled on its German counterpart and reporting to Semyon Timoshenko, who had lived in Germany in 1931. The tanks, aircraft, and artillery the Red Army used to resist the German invasion drew heavily on German designs, in some instances being actual copies of German vehicles. Many were powered by BMW-designed engines and built in factories built or modernized by German engineers. As news of the German attack began to filter in from the West, Stalin reacted with disbelief. Surely, he asked his, his close advisors, Hitler would not just attack like some brigand. He told Foreign Minister Molotov to find the German ambassador. As Molotov sat quietly in his office, German ambassador Schulenberg began reading a memorandum accusing the Soviet Union of breaking the terms of the German-Soviet pact. Schulenberg concluded his remarks and a pregnant silence hung in the air of Molotov's office. Molotov asked him, is this supposed to be a declaration of war? Schulenberg merely shrugged. He had been given no directions on that note. Molotov replied heatedly as it, that it could be nothing else as German troops have already crossed the Soviet border and Soviet cities have been bombed by German aircraft for over an hour and a half. Schulenberg said nothing. At the end of their interview, all Molotov could stutter was, quote, what have we done to deserve this? Thank you.
all. Well, first of all, thanks to Ian for setting the table so ably. It's going to be a difficult act to follow. Um, I'd like to thank Nick for a kind introduction and to Rob, Jeremy, Stephanie, and others uh, uh, for organizing this splendid conference and inviting me here, uh, despite the fact that my book is perhaps not the most cheerful. Um, it takes a slightly more, shall we say, sour tone regarding the conduct of the war, at least on the part of some of the allies, along with, of course, some of the uh, results of that conflict. Um, uh, I realize now I need the clicker. Oh, here it is, it's right next to me. So I'm actually not gonna click yet. I, I want you just to look at this photo and kind of puzzle over it for a few moments, and try to figure out what it actually depicts. Um, uh, so as we were learning from Ian, there was this rather odd legacy um, of Soviet-German cooperation, obviously various layers of irony. Um, we have these two states that are set up almost as pariahs, uh, conspiring against the international system. Um, and I'm going to come back to that theme in a moment, what they have in common. I mean, it's quite interesting Then, when you look at the literature on the war, I think there always has been, on the one hand, this idea of inevitability. We were hearing about this uh, earlier today in the debates about the Holocaust, the so-called functionalism versus intentionalism debate regarding Hitler and Stalin. Will you have these two supposedly diametrically opposed ideologies? They are fated to clash. Hitler talks about Lebensraum and so on in Mein Kampf. There's, there's always this kind of idea that it just kind of has to happen. It's fated to happen. Um, I don't actually agree. I think there are a lot of ways in which the war might have turned out differently. I do agree, though, with, with some of the speakers today that, that some kind of war was probably inevitable, but not necessarily the precise war that broke out when it did, nor the course of that war. Um, so to get into this relationship, um, again, some of the projection I'm talking about, what, what I think people often miss when they try to read Soviet foreign policy, and, and frankly, there just aren't that many books on the subject to begin with, um, you know, compared to the vast volume of tomes on, on Hitler and the Germans and German foreign policy and German strategy, such as it was, and obviously German brutality, war crimes, etc. There are a lot of books on Stalin and his domestic repression. There aren't really that many books that examine Soviet foreign policy. And to the extent anyone does, it's usually in the context of the failures of collective security, the failure to organize any kind of a coalition against Hitler, which frankly is usually blamed on British and French stubbornness, naivete, what have you. There are a lot of problems with this way of thinking, though. I mean, if you look at the lead up to the famous Munich conference, uh, the discussions of Czechoslovakia, 1938, in the wake of the Anschluss of March, um, while it is true that Litvinov, the Soviet foreign minister, uh, talked rather loudly about, obviously, his disdain and his hatred uh, for Hitler and, and the anti-Semitic regime uh, in Germany. Uh, there was no real serious Soviet, Soviet effort uh, to take part in any of these negotiations. The, the so-called short course, this kind of Bible of communism published that year, doesn't even mention the term collective security. It talks about the second imperialist war, which has already broken out. Um, in fact, if you look at the map here, and since I don't have a, a sort of a, a laser pointer, uh, uh, the organizers, I think this is Stephanie who did this. I have to give her credit. She, she did a wonderful job of kind of highlighting what I'd like to highlight. So, You'll notice here that if the Soviet Union is going to help Czechoslovakia, it would kind of be difficult to do so. They don't share a border, nor do the Soviets share a border with Germany. So if the Soviets are going to do anything against Germany or for Czechoslovakia, the Soviets would, of course, have to invade Poland and Romania, and or Romania. Um, probably Poland, a country with which, of course, the Soviets had an active and ongoing border dispute dating back to a rather vicious war fought in 1920. Um, the Soviets did not really like the idea of collective security. In fact, when Chamberlain uh, famously proposed and then actually uh, gave this so-called guarantee to Poland, notoriously guaranteeing not the integrity of Poland's territory, but rather the independence of Poland, thus with all this kind of leeway, it could be interpreted opportunistically both by Hitler and, of course, by the Poles. Uh, not only did the Soviets not back this, they explicitly repudiated it in public. They weren't particularly subtle about this. They actually denied press rumors and reports that they had actually made any arrangement to protect Poland. In fact, the partition of Poland, which was carried out in September of 1939, was a Soviet idea and a Soviet proposal, not a German one. I think we, we actually heard from Ian this interesting logic that it was actually the Soviets, in, in a lot of ways, who, who were keener to renew the partnership than the Germans. The Germans were in a bit more rush because of, of course, Hitler's military timetable and the need for better weather to carry out the invasion of Poland in August turned out to be actually not even in August. They had to delay it until September 1939. It was actually a Soviet proposal. It was first mooted in theoretical journals, uh, eventually even in Izvestia. It was talked about, 
kind of in dinner parties and banquets with various diplomats, and of course, eventually it reached the German ears. Uh, now, when Hitler and Ribbentrop and also Goebbels uh, you know, finally got serious about this Polish problem. Uh, what was interesting was Stalin wasn't very subtle there either. He gave a speech in March, I call this the chestnut speech, the idea being that he wasn't going to basically uh, pull the chestnuts out of the fire for the Western powers who were trying to incite a war between Germany and the Soviet Union. Later on, during the negotiations for, uh, in, in Moscow for the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, um, they actually mentioned this, and they said, oh yeah, we, we really liked your chestnut speech. We kind of saw where you were going with that. The next gesture was a little more blunt. Uh, this is when Litvinov, uh, the Jewish foreign minister, or Foreign Affairs Commissar, excuse me, term of art in the Soviet sphere, Commissar. Uh, he's not simply fired by Molotov. Um, uh, Molotov being, of course, a Gentile, not Jewish. Uh, the orders are actually issued to purge the entire Soviet, Soviet Foreign Ministry of Jews. Um, this is an olive branch to Hitler and recognized immediately as such, and Hitler actually asked Goebbels to tell the German media to stop attacking the Soviet Union, which they do. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they had a deal right away. Of course, they had to work out all the details and the fine print, a lot of talk about kind of the trade agreements and how maybe the Soviets could help the Germans evade the British blockade by importing raw materials from the Soviet Union they couldn't get from the rest of the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but if we actually look at the negotiations, there are a couple of really interesting factors here. Um, First of all, I mean, this, this map is a little bit cleaner than the other one, so you can kind of get an idea for where the division line was supposed to be if you actually look at... There are a number of different lines here. They later cause endless diplomatic mayhem because of the talk of the different lines that the Soviets are constantly trying to fudge where the borders actually are. We're really only restoring the Curzon line. Now, in fact, the original line was not the Curzon line, nor was, of course, the line that actually happened in September 1939. I often have a lot of fun with my students when I teach late autumn history when I talk about the so-called Sykes-Picot Agreement or so-called sezonov sykes picot Agreement, which supposedly led to today's modern Middle Eastern borders. I show them today's modern Middle Eastern borders and then I show them the sykes picot map and they bear very little resemblance to one another. Uh, in this case, you can actually see that the whole thing gets screwed up because in fact the Germans go way past the demarcation lines. Why did they do that? Well, they did that because the Soviets delayed invading. And it's quite interesting why. The Germans were actually somewhat annoyed that the Soviets weren't participating in this joint war of aggression. They kept delaying. They said, no, 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 don't worry. We mobilize troops. We'll move when we're ready. We don't want to incite the enmity um, of the outside powers. In other words, they did not want France and Britain to declare war on them too. So they decided to pretend they weren't actually invading Poland. The way they actually spun it once they finally got around to invading Poland was that it was a protection mission. And the way they even explained this to the Germans was that they were going to wait till Poland ceased to exist. They were going to wait until Warsaw fell, and then they would invade, because then they wouldn't be invading a sovereign country, because the country would no longer exist. Now, it turns out they actually got the timing wrong. They got an erroneous press report that Warsaw had fallen on about September 15th, so they invaded on September 17th. It turns out that wasn't true. Warsaw actually held out for another two weeks. But, but meanwhile, they, did, they gave the Molotov treatment, as I call this, and Poland is not the last country to receive this treatment. They, they summon the ambassador. They say, you're no longer ambassador. Your country no longer exists. Then they arrest him, and they send him to the gulag. They did the same thing to the consul in Kiev. What's quite clever about this, though, is that precisely because the Germans went past the demarcation lines, and the Soviets, in the end, they had to do a little bit of kind of horse trading and horse swapping, but you know, in the end, they agreed on this really interesting territorial swap. Although the Soviets were actually originally supposed to get even more territory than the Germans, they ended up conceding a lot of central Poland, including, as you can see here, Warsaw and Lublin, to the Germans parts that had been originally either bisected or in the Soviet sphere. In exchange, they get Lithuania, which wasn't really Polish. And so then they have this wonderful spin for the Western media. Well, you see, first of all, we didn't really invade Poland because it didn't actually exist. And uh, second of all, you can see that, in fact, the Germans, they got kind of Polish Poland. We only really invaded the parts that used to be part of Tsarist Russia. And so, in fact, we haven't really invaded any territory at all. Now, what's amazing about this argument is that it's actually endorsed by leading British politicians, including David Lloyd George, former prime minister, including Winston Churchill, who was called in by the Soviet ambassador, Ivan Maisky, who thanks him for his support. 
Now, admittedly, Britain was trying to figure out how to defeat Germany. They hadn't really figured out, uh, they hadn't figured out even how to help Poland, let alone defeat Germany. So you can understand why they don't want to take on a new enemy. But this allows the Soviets to pose, and again, people will still make this argument. Well, they didn't really invade Poland. They weren't really allied to Germany. They were neutral. And as I was reminded by the Russian Foreign Ministry when they denounced me on the 4th of July in an official tweet, the Soviet Union was a peace-loving empire, <laughs> which invaded seven countries between 1939 and 1941. They were a peace-loving em empire, and they were neutral. Um, it's an interesting pose, and it's kind of amazing that they get away with it, because in fact they deport even more people from Poland than the Germans do. Uh, what's really amazing is they didn't really hide it. Now, they weren't quite as blatant at times as Hitler and kind of almost openly boasting about their crimes, but when it came to things like expropriation, they actually were. They would literally boast in Pravda about how many banks they looted in occupied Poland and later Romania and the Baltic states. Now, I think what this all shows, when you actually look at the territorial swaps, um, I don't really have time to go into great detail about the Soviet-Finnish war, um, some of the moves into Romania as well. What they really show, aside from the nefarious consequences of the molotov ribbentrop Pact for the peoples of Eastern Europe, which is rather obvious, is that the Soviets were in the end a revisionist power, just like the Germans were, just like the Italians were. For some reason, no one really recognized this. But they were actually quite open about it. If you even read some of the boring kind of dry literature in the Soviet foreign ministry, they have, they have this wonderful way of talking about it. You know, oh, well, you know what? We're not, ha we're not satisfied with Bessarabia. We want Bukovina too, because there are lots of proletarians there. And they count up the proletarians, and their mouths are kind of beginning to water new subjects for the empire. You know, we've, we've enlisted 25 new million subjects with our era of peaceful expansion, um, invasion of sovereign countries. Um, you know, the, the Germans actually initially didn't agree about Bukovina because it hadn't even been mentioned in, in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. They end up having this rather Baroque argument where Molotov, strangely enough, uh, sounds a little bit like a sort of ethnic chauvinist. And he says, no, 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 it, it should be Soviet because it's populated by Ukrainians who were oppressed by the Romanians. Um, and the German ambassador Schulenberg actually pulls out a kind of a ethnographic encyclopedia and points out some of the errors in the reasoning. And, and Molotov says, oh, no, 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 this is not real. This is Romanian encyclopedia, not to be trusted. Um, now, when it comes to this relationship and how it all goes awry, uh, again, this, I think it's a really interesting way to think about it, the functionalist versus the intentionalist debate. That is to say, the relationship, when does it finally come a cropper? Well, I actually think it is over Romania and the Balkans. You know, if you actually look at what they're negotiating in late 1940 um, and what Stalin demands, I mean, Hitler does formally invite Stalin to join the tripartite pact. This is the kind of touched up... Uh, a cosmetically altered version of the old anti turn pact, directed, of course, against the evil Anglo-Saxon imperialists, with which, of course, the Soviets also shared an enmity, quite loudly at times expressed. You know, Stalin is, is overheard saying at times things like, well, yes, we never asked to befriend the British, and we do not now wish to befriend them, the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons are our enemies. Well, so that's how they view it. Hitler invites Stalin to join. In the end, negotiations break down over Stalin's demands that in order to join, he says, the Germans must agree to withdraw their troops from Finland, um, or in particular, they, they had a lot of interest in the nickel produced around Pitsamo. Uh, and the Soviets wanted the Germans to withdraw military personnel from Romania, from which they got about half of their natural oil. They got about a third from the Russians. They got half from Romania. Um, and Stalin also demanded the right to invade Bulgaria and to station Soviet troops at the Ottoman Straits, at the Bosporus. Uh, there were also concessions from Japan. He wanted the Germans to wrest from them. Now, I have to say, one of the documents I'm, the most, I'm most proud of finding in this book, although I, I, I don't think a single reviewer has noticed this yet, I actually discovered in the Bulgarian archives of all places, I think that what the key moment was. You know, when Molotov presented this list of demands, almost like an ultimatum to the Germans on November 25th, 1940, Hitler didn't get it right away because he was traveling. He was always down in Salzburg or somewhere down. He preferred Austria, really. He didn't spend a lot of time in Berlin in those days. Um, so Hitler finally gets the news when he returns to Berlin. He calls in the Bulgarian minister and he unloads on him in a three and a half hour monologue. 
December 3rd, 1940. That is when I think Hitler made the decision to invade the Soviet Union. Uh, it shows up a couple weeks later in the formal documents regarding kind of planning for the war and so on. Now, as for that war, and Ian has really, I think, laid out really interestingly the way the two sides kind of prepared each other for the war. I don't think he mentioned it today, but in his book, he makes a really interesting point about one of the ways in which the Germans maybe had almost, in some ways, too much intelligence. Some of them actually remembered their days of cooperation with the Soviets, but it was a little out of date because some of them had actually been there much earlier, if I have the point correct. I think that's entirely true. We do know that the Germans underestimated the, the, basically what, what the Soviets had in reserve in terms of armor. On the other hand, they had a very good idea what was near the frontier. And just to go through it really, really quickly, because I don't want to go over time, the Soviets had put a massive amount of material, war material, at the frontier. Of the 251 aerodromes or air bases they built in the first six months of 1941, 80% of them were in the frontier districts occupied since 1939, abutting the German Reich. Within several minutes to about 30 or 40 minutes flying distance. And the Germans knew about this because, of course, they were conducting overflights. So, too, were the Soviets, incidentally, conducting overflights, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Romania. And if you look at what the Soviets are planning, and here's where it really does get interesting. There is this talk uh, in the last war plan of May 15, 1941, about the need to predit a protivnika, to forestall the adversary. The Soviets seem to think, and admittedly it is a little bit like wishful thinking, that the Germans would telegraph their giant upcoming punch and somehow the Soviets would have a grace period to prepare their own counter strike. So the, the phrase which keeps coming up in the Soviet documents is a powerful strike in the direction of Lublin. On this map you can see they're focusing on southwestern front in western Ukraine, targeting both Romania to the south and the oil fields and also Poland. Lublin in particular. The armor concentration, they have 24 mechanized divisions and 85 aviation regiments on that front alone. In particular, in these two salients jutting out at Bialystok and Lvov and Lemberg, they had very specifically insisted on having in the negotiations in September 1939. Turned out to be a giant mistake because, of course, those salients were exposed and they were nearly annihilated in the early days of the German invasion. Now, what you see when you actually look at the Politburo special files, which I will probably never be allowed to see again, but luckily I did see them before I was banned from Russia. What you see in these files in the last days before Barbarossa begins is a kind of creeping sense of dread. They do see what's coming. Stalin does see what's coming. There's plenty of evidence. However, they're not ready. At the last minute, there's a lot of talk of the desperate need for Maskirovka, for camouflaging all those new aerodromes, all the new air bases, all the new tank parks. They're supposed to finish camouflaging the aerodromes and building the dummy air bases by about July 5th. They're supposed to finish camouflaging and building the dummy tanks and the, all the kind of the petrol stations by July 15th, which is, of course, more than two weeks too late. Now, we all know the war doesn't go particularly well. You know, if you just kind of very briefly look at how far the Germans make it, and we've already kind of learned about how significant it was that they were repelled outside Moscow in December 1941. Um, in the remaining time I have, which, which is not copious, um, I would like very briefly to look into these questions surrounding the Materialschlag. I think that Ian raised a really interesting point again about how much the Germans underestimated the scale of Soviet armor. I don't want to overemphasize this, however, because the Germans still did a pretty good job of destroying the armor that was there. By December 1941, Stalin had lost 91% of his tank park out of 200, uh, sorry, 22,340 tanks. Now, in that period, the Soviets had produced 5,400, a little less than one-fourth or 25% of losses. They had lost 81% of, of the pre-war stock of anti-tank guns, uh, 12,100. They had built about 2,500, about one-fifth of losses. They had lost 7,200 out of their 8,400 bombers. They had built about 2,500, you know, again, about a quarter. Uh, with fighters, it was a little better. They only lost 9,600 out of 11,500. On the other hand, they had produced 6,000. So there they were at least producing about one half of ongoing losses. 
Now, as we all know, the Soviets do improve. They, they evacuate, they relocate a lot of their war industry to the Ural Mountains, to the east. Um, however, even with the vaunted production of the famous T-34 and, uh, and other Soviet tanks, um, if you look at the monthly figures, for example, in 1942 and 1943, their peaks and valleys, they produce about 2,000 tanks a month, and they lose about 2,000 tanks a month. Where was the margin? The margin, of course, was ultimately in the 625 Lend-Lease tanks a month that they are receiving from their allies. Um, even Soviet war production, and, and this, these are very closely guarded secrets, believe me, in, in the Soviet archives. Uh, I, I can't actually actually disclose my methods as to how I was able to get this information, but uh, yeah, it's hard to know how they were using all of the Studebakers and the Jeeps and the Fords and, the, and, and ultimately the Harley-Davidson motorcycles. Uh, we know how much they valued certain things. They loved the diesel tanks. We actually produced uh, Sherman M4A2 diesels specifically for the Soviets. Uh, we ended up producing most of the Douglas A-20 Havoc bombers that the Soviets, for peculiar reasons, called Bostons. Uh, most of those were actually produced for the Soviet Air Force. Most of all, of course, Stalin fell in love with the P-39 Era Cobra produced in Bell Aircraft in Buffalo, the Kobrushka, um, as the Soviets called it. And they got extremely angry whenever the Americans would send any of these to Britain because, you know, they wanted all of the, the Kobrushkas. Um, in addition to this, everyone has heard about the spam. You might not have heard about the borscht, but in fact, the United States also sent tens of millions of tiny little packets of dehydrated borscht. And I've actually looked at the ingredients. Included bay leaves, a certain percentage of bay leaves, you know, so they got the formula just right. Along with crab, butter, I mean, the butter thing is kind of interesting because this is when America was first sold on margarine because we were told we had to eat oleomargarine because the butter was for the Russians. Um, 90 million pounds a year. Um, so I, there's a lot in the book on lend -Lease. I'm not going to bore you with all the statistics, but I do want to just kind of raise this question and kind of leave it dangling in the air. What the Soviet war effort would have looked like without all of this surplus, which they were, of course, no longer producing. Again, if their tank production is roughly equal to their tank losses, it's only at the margins that they can win, and it's only thanks to the allies at the margins. So I'm, I'm just going to return now very briefly to the first picture and tell you what this is of. All right, so these are Berling's men, Stalin's Polish stooges, the puppets who go around hunting down the patriotic members of the Polish Home Army, Army of Krajowa after the uh, Warsaw Uprising of 1944. They're riding around in Harley-Davidson motorcycles, re-gifted to them by Stalin, uh, who also gave Berling's men, as they were called in Poland, it was not a compliment, uh, 485 Dodge trucks, 300 Willis Jeeps, 350 Harley-Davidson motorcycles, and they had promised 850 more, uh, 850 more American trucks by the end of 1944. So it was with this re-gifted equipment that uh, Stalin's Polish communist puppets were able to hunt down all those Polish home army fighters. And I'm just going to leave that dangling. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's have a few, I'll have a few questions here and, uh, and then we'll turn it over to, to the crowd, but uh, who I know would be anxious to get into it. But uh, uh, let me ask you a question that's really kind of for both of you, but one thing you didn't get into a whole lot, uh, Sean, is that you have this, gave us this picture of Stalin as a center of the war effort and master war leader, uh, really, of, of the war and the events, so it's more into the war than the pre-war. And uh, Len Lease, of course, uh, you, you talked about uh, there and, and how that was so, uh, you know, critical uh, to, to the Soviets. Uh, so there are different sources of Soviet strength that you both uh, uh, point out in your, in your different ways. Ian, you look at it from the point of view of the technology transfer of a training and uh, technical support and technical advances uh, th uh, that led to advances in the strength of the Red Army in terms of uh, sophisticated, more sophisticated tanks and weapons and aircraft. And, and um, uh, Sean, you, you kind of make the case uh, that it was really the aid from the West uh, the Lend -Lease, uh, and Lend-Lease and Soviets uh, uh, and Stalin's uh, leadership here. So the question is, uh, which of these developments do you think was, was more important to Soviet survival in 41 uh, and ultimate uh, counterattacks against a German offensive? Either technology transfer and training and the advanced weaponry, or was it really the Lend-Lease uh, from the United States? So, 
Uh, let each, either one of you start. Do you want me to start? Sure. Um, well, I mean, look, the easy answer, it was a bit of both. Um, I do think that um, all of those prototypes um, and the practice that the Soviets had acquired, and even their own models, I mean, I don't want to poo-poo the successes they had, particularly with the T-34 tank, which had a lot of excellent attributes, although it was, of course, not without flaws. Um, what, what's significant, though, is that even the Soviet production, and of course, they're not going to win the war without their own production either, which they relocate east, but even that Soviet production, although it did depend a lot on what had been learned in the interwar cooperation uh, that Ian talks about, even that continued production required uh, the import of vast amounts of industrial inputs also from the United States, um, in particular aluminum. Aluminum is really kind of the sine qua non of Soviet weapons production. Unlike the Germans, who uh, everyone used aluminum in, in the producing airplanes because you know they didn't have the modern hyperlight composites yet and, and they were lighter obviously than, than steel and so that's what you use for airplanes. The Soviets used them in tanks as well. Um, and Stalin loses most of his bauxite production at Tikvin outside Leningrad. Um, the reason the material shock was going so badly was, of course, the Germans occupy all the Soviet territory, and so they, you know, they take over all these industrial regions and zones, and also raw materials. Uh, so they, the Soviets lose vast quantities of, of things like raw iron and, and steel. Um, so the Americans are sending things like armored plate, uh, a lot of refined steel products, uh, ball bearings, chrome, um, in addition to, of course, petroleum and foodstuffs, and uh, they lost their entire complex for, for boot and uniform supply, which is mostly in the Baltics, all taken by the Germans. So that's why by the end of the war they're requiring, they're relying almost exclusively really on the Americans. I mean, in certain things like food stuff, like sugar, it's like 70% is coming from the United States. Uh, uniforms, cloth, leather, nearly all of it's coming from the Americans. Uh, I didn't really talk about the Pacific theater, but the US also ships 8.244 million tons of war material, including a million tons of refined aviation and motor fuel, aviation gasoline, motor fuel, mostly to Vladivostok. And that's what the Soviets used to conquer Northern Asia in 1945, um, along with all the weapons, ammunition, and all the rest of it. You know, so the Soviet production matters, the Soviet experience matters, the learning curve obviously improves vastly between 1941 and 1945. And so what had been learned in that interwar period, I think, was a kind of essential precondition, but I still don't think they win the war without Lend-Lease. Well, yeah. I think they are very much uh, complementary stories, as, as Sean noted. The, I argue in my book that the, the Soviets had developed a certain dependence on foreign in industry, advisors, military expertise, primarily from Germany until 1933 or 34, and then increasingly from the United States. And that this dependence was one reason that Stalin continuously and quietly courted the Germans about renewing some sort of partnership. This, the Soviets needed German assistance in different supply chains and technological development, uh, all sorts of different, different areas. Of course, that was renewed in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact when the two economies uh, collaborated more closely than ever before. But, but with Operation Barbarossa, not only did the Soviets, of course, uh, suffer huge losses materially, lose mines, lose agriculture, all of these things, they lost that German, uh, the, the engineering expertise that had again resumed uh, assisting them in 1939. Lend-Lease became that substitute, essentially replacing German expertise and assistance after 1941, at great cost. It took a while, as you demonstrate in your book, for that uh, to, to become so, so significant for the Soviet war effort. But I really think in some ways they're the same story uh, with, with different players. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is it happens again in 1945-46 when the Soviets start looting German industry. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a really strange kind of a sequence. You know, first they're relying so much on the German cooperation, prototypes, joint training maneuvers. Right. Then they lose that. They have to rely on the Americans. And then in 1945, once they pour into places like Poland, Hungary, and Germany, they begin to loot all of those factories and industri intellectual and industrial property as well. And then they take a huge amount of their reparations. Some of it is also, of course, human, human reparations, labor, slave labor, but they also take vast amounts of industrial property and they ship it back to Moscow. They have these special kind of looting units you know, inside the Red Army um, that actually ship back, uh, again, tons and tons and tons of industrial equipment products and intellectual property of German corporations and all the rest. Well, well Ian, uh, is it fair to say that you think Barbarossa would be the most, uh, looking at it from the other side, I mean, the benefits to Germany of the uh, secret uh, a collaboration and development of their own tanks and uh, Luftwaffe and so forth. Do you think Barbarossa is a, uh, the main consequence of that relationship and, uh, and Hitler's ability to rearm so fast? Yes, I, I can't. I mean, the, the counterfactual is always a, a diffi difficult one, but 
it, the timing of the Second World War is impossible without all of the effort that had been made uh, in the 1920s and early 30s. It took four to six years to devel develop a, a tank prototype or aircraft from scratch. Mm -hmm. And essentially, when Hitler took power in 1933, immediately there were a huge number of contracts issued to German firms, all of which had been working throughout this period on essentially preparing for general rearmament. The result was by 1938 or 39, the, the Germans had advanced models being mass produced both in the air and on the ground with armored vehicles. Well, the British and French, who really did not begin fully mobilizing until 37 or 38, were, were several years behind. This created a window of opportunity that Hitler used to start the war. And of course, Barbarossa was the, the, the bloodiest front in that war, the ultimate culmination. Um, but I also see elements both of Barbarossa's failure in, in cooperation and, uh, and, and the way in which Barbarossa was conducted. So a lot of the German officers that I, that I study in this book, uh, they were being spied on, of course, by, by Soviet intelligence personnel who are monitoring their political affiliations, their thinking, what they're reading, their gambling habits, their relationships with, with local women, etc. And they notice a disturbing trend, which is the longer that junior officers are in the Soviet Union, the more anti-communist that they, they became, in part because at a lot of these bases, they were in the famine zone created by collectivization, and there were starving people climbing over the, you know, the gates trying to get access to food. Uh, hardly a, a, you know, an encouraging picture of, of Stalin's Soviet Union. Soviets tried to respond by bringing in lecturers to talk about how great the five-year plan was, but for a lot of these 19 to 25-year-old young men, it was hardly convincing. And so we see a radicalization within the German army that fuels the warfare conducted after Barbarossa um, in, in large part. Could, could I add just one small yeah. point there regarding Ukraine? I mean, it is quite interesting. It's you know, one of the many obvious just glaring mistakes the Germans make. I mean, aside from the moral ones, just talking about what affects the course of the war is that in addition to the overall brutality of the campaign and the fact that even though a lot of Ukrainians initially welcome in the invasion, many of them, of course, just as horribly mistreated as, you know, as Jews and, and Russians and other groups, the Germans also undermine their own argument about a war of liberation of the camps and the Kahosi or collective farms because they decided it was effectively more efficient just to keep the collective farms in place because they had centralized grain collection and distribution. And so they don't actually break up the collective farms, which you know, completely undermines any possible political logic to what they're supposedly doing. Um. Okay, and, and, and Sean, uh, another question. I mean, you have uh, painted a picture of, of, of Stalin as his master war leader and, and yet uh, indicate that he wasn't ready, uh, missed the intel coming in. Uh, how great a war leader uh, and how much was he the manipulator and master war leader uh, if uh, he missed those basic uh, intel and, and was unready uh, from a just a mobilization point in getting troops in, in place. Uh. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I certainly don't want to give the impression that he was kind of this infallible genius who always got things right. Uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, his gamble in Europe backfires in 1941. I mean, all of his plans. What he had really hoped in kind of helping to some extent to incite the war between Hitler and the Western powers with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is that they would bleed each other. You know, that is that they would fight a war of attrition which would weaken both sides and eventually the Red Army could just kind of intervene at a moment of his choosing and you know, kind of sweep into the ruins. And instead, of course, Hitler had famously embarrassed nearly all of his opponents and the Germans had routed everyone and had really scarcely been weakened at all aside from the Luftwaffe and the Battle of London. So he really does kind of miscalculate in a lot of ways. And he's caught by surprise not in the sense that I don't think, I think he definitely thought a war with Germany was, was coming. He just didn't really think the Germans were going to be ready that quickly. I mean, frankly, a lot of the military buildup happens on the German side, happens at the last minute. Um, you know, it's kind of this, almost the shock of first that they're actually going to do it. Some of it is also that his intelligence is, is so good, it's almost too good in some ways. Now, Stalin knows, for example, that the Germans have not ordered up enough winter clothing and they don't have the right lubricants you know, for winter temperature. So he thinks, well, how could they be so stupid to invade Russia <laughs> without preparing for winter? Um, and in fact, part of the reason the Russians let the Germans have all the surveillance overflights is they figure, look, they're going to see all of our equipment. They're going to see all these tank parks and petrol stations. Admittedly, they weren't, the logistics were you know, still kind of running behind, but just physically, they're all there, all the air bases, and they're going to think they couldn't possibly invade us. You know, we outnumber them three, four, five, eight to one in nearly all essential aspects of modern war making, at least on paper. I mean, obviously in practice with the logistics, the Soviets were no, nowhere near ready. Um, so he does miscalculate. I mean, in, in Asia, again, not, not the subject we've talked about today, but I think it actually works out far better for him. He plays it perfectly. 
Japan, the United States, China, and Britain spend four years blooding each other up rather terribly, and then Stalin waits until literally the day that the second atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki and moves in to seize his empire after Japan had already moved back about a million troops to the home islands, thus paving the way for the conquest of Manchuria, North Korea, Kuril, Sakhalin, and all the rest of it. Uh, just maybe a question or two more, but uh, the, this question of war readiness, I, I mean, I get it that uh, they hadn't gotten everything to the borders and, and weren't uh, ready to fight uh, the petrol stations and everything was, was unready from that point of view, but looking at the perspective, Ian uh, paints a picture of the technology transfer, the training, the advancing in their tanks uh, technology and uh, their plane technology and weaponry. Uh, the question for both of you then, uh, do you think, had it not been for those operational mistakes or missing the intel, was the Soviet Red Army really ready, perhaps based on what Ian is saying about the training and technology they transferred from the Germans, were they ready or not? Well, uh, in, in my examination, one of the key parts of the story, and one we haven't mentioned yet, was the role of the, the purges uh, in affecting the Red Army's preparations for war. Stalin, of course, uh, had superintended much of the, the Soviet-German partnership and the enormous role the Germans had played in training the new elite of the Red Army. Uh, about 180 officers of general rank had lived in Germany for extended periods. Almost every corps and divisional commander had been trained at least at some, in some way by a, a German officer in, in, say, 1937. This was a cause for concern as the war approached. He became suspicious and, and perhaps paranoid that all of these officers with all of their connections to Germany might not prove loyal in the event of war. Uh, and, and in my book, I argue this is one of the reasons that the, the purges unfolded in the late 1930s and so decimated the Red Army. About 11% of the officer corps being, being removed in some way, shape, or form, many shot, uh, thrown in prison. And many of those individuals were ones who had not only trained alongside the Germans, but understood the, the German playbook. They, I mean, they had driven vehicles together, they had thrown New Year's parties together, I mean, they knew their, their German adversaries quite well. The decapitation of the Red Army, in part as a result, uh, was disastrous for Soviet preparations, and it showed immediately in the Winter War uh, when the Red Army per performed so badly. So I think that was another critical factor in, in the lack of, of Soviet preparation and the poor response. Both the expansion of the Red Army between 1939 and 1941, which was quite haphazard, as well as the fact that so many skilled and prepared officers disappeared on the eve of war. So you would say that uh, Germany took more advantage of the of the training and the exchange than the Soviets did. If you add the purges to that uh, uh, factor, is that? In, in operational terms, yes. In operational yeah. terms, Sean, what do you say? Well, no, the purges clearly hurt, and clearly the Soviets, they weren't ready, or not as ready as they should have been. Um, uh, one of the points that is kind of interesting, though, if, if, again, if you take a comparative approach, not just the Germans, but you look at, let's say, the French in 1940, and I'm by no means an expert of the subject, but I've read enough in the literature to know that there's a lot of criticism of the French high command in 1940. Um, you know, for example, the, the failure to really understand and properly deploy tanks, um, you know, that they're sort of an offensive weapon. They're, they're not supposed to be just kind of sitting at strange intersections, I don't know, kind of watching and observing. Um, that is kind of coordinating mobile warfare. The Soviets were, they were more advanced. You know, they, they didn't have their heads in the sand. You know, they, they had both the experience of kind of watching and observing the campaigns in Europe. They had their own recent experience in Finland. Zhukov had some pretty serious experience, the Battle of Kalkingol against the Japanese in the summer of 1939. So while they definitely lost a lot of probably intellectual capital and preparation in the purges, you know, and there's a little bit of a sorting out that happens, a very ruthless sorting out among the Soviet generals in 1941, 42, 43. A lot of them actually, of course, get, get executed, um, uh, among other things, the same way that a lot of troops would have been shot for retreating. You know, there are a lot of no retreat orders. Um, there's a ruthless sorting out. And they obviously get better as there's, there's a, a sharp learning curve, and they definitely get better. The Soviet Army of 1945 bears very little resemblance to the Soviet Army of 1941. Um, I said, I think they should have been better prepared than they were. Um, I do think that Stalin, while I, I don't buy the idea that he was, you know, completely shocked into this funk. I mean, we now have the, the records. We know, for example, he was meeting regularly the first week after the invasion with everyone in the Politburo. He creates the GKO. It's fairly standard and pro forma. He doesn't suddenly disappear in a drunken stupor like people thought he did. 
No, that said, his not taking all of the, the rumors and reports of German preparations seriously enough, it did matter. I mean, you know, the, the orders given out to the frontline troops, there had been an order to be essentially war ready, but without, without clear, um, you know, without clear instructions regarding the, the rules of engagement and when to fire. I mean, that order was sent out early in the morning of the 22nd, but they should have been more prepared than they were. But, but that said, you can see all kinds of signs of preparation. I mean, they're, they're canceling all furloughs. You know, they have everyone on extra guard duty. They're calling up polit rooks, the political officers. They're camouflaged. It's not like they're not preparing. You know, it's, they're not asleep. I mean, I think that's the, the, the famous Christopher Clark metaphor about 1914. You know, they're not sleepwalking into it. Um, uh, but they definitely were, I mean, they, I think no one was, was really prepared for what the kind of German onslaught actually meant. Okay, well, we, so the, the Lend-Lease thing is still out there. Other people may want to ask questions about that. Uh, I don't know how you'd answer the question of how Stalin, uh, on a counterfactual basis, uh, would have emerged as a, as a great war leader had there not been a Western Front. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if we want to discuss that later on, but maybe, Jeremy, you want to get the audience into the question, so but we'll think about sure. that and come back and... Round of applause for Ian Johnson and Sean McBeacon. Thank you for wonderful presentations. We'll start in the center here. In 1939, the uh, French and British diplomats were trying to take advantage of the natural antipathy between the Nazis and the Soviets and coming up with their own pact. Now, about those efforts, I've read it viewed two opposite ways. One, that uh, the British and the French missed a real opportunity to uh, get a pact with Stalin. And the other side is that no matter what the French and British would have promised Stalin, they could not offer as good a deal as Hitler. So I was wondering what your view on that was. I, I can take that one you first. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so there, there's a lot of discussion about collective security in this period, you know, how genuous, uh, genuine was, were Stalin's offers to, to partner with the British and French uh, against Germany. I think they're, they're not particularly honest or good faith efforts. Even as Litvinov is, is broaching the possibility of collaboration with the British and French, the Soviets are consistently reaching out to the Germans about how, you know, re renewing, bringing back the good old times uh, it, of, of earlier cooperation. They reach out to the Germans multiple times in 34, 35, 36, and 38 about renewing military collaboration, even as they're talking to the British and French. And if you actually look at the timeline uh, of, of negotiations in 39, Already by December 1938, the Soviets seemed pretty interested in a, a broad political and economic agreement with Germany. At that point, one of the documents I found that appears in my book, the Soviets come up with a list of 170 equipment purchases they'd like to make from German industry, including essentially every aircraft and tank design that Germany has. There is no way the Germans are gonna sell them all of their high-tech stuff absent some sort of much broader political agreement. They provide this list to the Germans in January 1939, and the Germans say, oh, we're, we're not sure if we're ready for that kind of commitment. It's uh, the, when the British and French then offer their guarantee to Poland, at that point, the die is very much cast, and I think really it's uh, the, the Germans and Soviets are just dancing around, seeing if they can trust each other and what the terms will look like. In fact, the very day that British and French negotiators arrive in Moscow in August 1939 to conclude their own agreement with the Soviets against Nazi Germany, Stalin essentially okays a political agreement with the, the Germans. So they're there, <laughs> I, in, in my opinion, to drive up the price that Stalin will get from, from Hitler. He's a, you know, if nothing, if not an effective poker player. But uh, I, in terms of genuine efforts after 1938, I see very little evidence of that from the Soviet side. Well, I, I fully agree with, I mean, it'd be more interesting if I didn't agree, but no, I, I fully agree with Ian's point here. And the only thing I would add is that certainly the British and French didn't help their case. I mean, there's this famous story about how long it takes them to get there. They didn't fly. You know, they take this elderly steamer, the city of Exeter. Uh, Drax isn't even given credentials. I mean, that, that is the, the British Admiral. He literally does not have the authority to negotiate on behalf of Britain, which is absurd. The French took it much more seriously. They were much more desperate. Mm -hmm. Dumont did have the credentials. I've seen some of the documents at Vincennes, and the French, yeah, they were realistic about it. On the other hand, they, they were really hoping they could cut some kind of a deal. But that said, it simply wasn't going to happen. Um, I think, just as Ian said, uh, this was just about kind of driving up the price. And I mean, uh, Voroshilov actually is Stalin's kind of crony, Klim, uh, the one they named the KV tank after. 
he kind of has some fun with them both with like, you know, he goes duck hunting and, you know, tells them he's too busy. But no, at one point he also says, you know, so have you procured permission from Poland and Romania for us to violate the third they basically and and you know, the French say, sorry, no, we don't. And he says, well, I'm sorry you have not procured this permission in advance. Um, the French are game enough. They sent an envoy quickly to Warsaw to ask the Poles if they're willing to permit the Red Army to invade Poland. The answer is no. <laughs> the, the one other thing I'd note, too, is the Soviets always knew they could get better terms from the Germans. The French and British would never accede Absolutely. to the conquest yeah. of broad tracts of right. Central and Eastern Europe, and the Germans were quite willing to consider that. So at the end of the day, Stalin could always get more, both economically and politically, from a partnership with Germany than he could from the British and French. Yeah. Next question's with Connie, halfway back in the center aisle. Hello, gentlemen. Great talk. Prior to, you know, I guess starting the war with Britain, I mean, Germany knows it's greatly outnumbered at sea, yet they transfer an incomplete hipper-class cruiser to give lots of hmm. naval help to Russia. Yeah, I know Stalin wanted to rebuild his navy. Knowing the imbalance and the wars getting ready to happen with Britain, why? I mean, did, did the Kriegsmarine know that Hitler was going to invade a couple of years later? It's like, why do you give up whatever little bit you have for whatever deal they got out of it? Do you want to take that? Sure. Well, uh, something to keep in mind is I, I do think there is some uncertainty in Hitler's mind whether or not the British and French will honor their pledge to Poland in, in September 1939. Up until essentially the moment uh, of the British and French declaration of war, he's being told by Ribbentrop that I understand the British people. They're not, they're, you know, they're going to back down. There'd been behind the scenes diplomacy ongoing even after the German attack against Poland. And so this is clearly playing a role that, uh, you know, there's a great hope that, that naval forces will not become necessary. And of course, we see the great neglect of the German Navy on the eve of war compared to the, the Army or, or Luftwaffe, uh, part of a, a product. So I think this is part of the story. Um, the other thing I'd note is that this was uh, something Stalin very much wanted. He had begun superintending the construction of the Soviet Navy in 1934, all the way down to calibers being procured for, for different ships, coastal defenses. This was something Stalin wanted to manage personally. And so this was very much kind of a necessary part of an agreement if Hitler was going to get his, his, uh, his treaty very quickly in August 1939, which was his ultimate goal. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that, um, I mean, the reason the Germans do have to part with a lot of, a lot of things, which obviously Germany did need, is, um, I mean, it was a bilateral deal, and they were getting a lot from the Russians. They're getting massive amounts of grain, cotton, manganese, uh, chrome, as I think you mentioned, and, of course, in particular, uh, petroleum. Um, so they, they obviously are going to have to pony up something in exchange for all the, the raw materials. I mean, they're even getting rubber, which is transshipped, which they cannot get otherwise, you know, being transshipped across the Soviet Union. So they have to give something you know, to get, to get all this equipment and raw material, which allows them to evade the British blockade. Yeah, and, and perhaps one very final note. Um, the, the, the German Navy does get certain things out of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which are often forgotten. They, they're allowed to establish a naval base yeah. on Soviet soil near Murmansk. Uh, Soviet icebreakers will actually lead merchant raiders across the Arctic. Only one actually makes it, gets out in the Pacific, captures something like 14 British ships. It's flying a Soviet flag some of the time to disguise itself. So there, there are elements of cooperation at sea that the Germans are also getting in return for, for that naval assistance. Question here in the center, please. Uh, the U.S. invaded Russia and intervened in the Russian Civil War in 1919, 1920. And my question is, how much did that drive the Soviets into the German camp? Um, well, you're right. I mean, the U.S., uh, it was a somewhat half-hearted intervention. I mean, very few U.S. troops actually saw anything resembling combat. That said, you're right. I mean, it was an important part of kind of the Soviet, uh, both worldview, foreign policy, this allied intervention. Uh, to be really honest, I don't think Stalin remembered or thought too seriously about the U.S. intervention. However, he thought constantly about the British intervention, uh, particularly in the Baltic. And so that's one of the big concerns vis-a-vis -vis Finland. I mean, the, the pretext that the Soviets used to invade Finland is that it might be a launching pad for an invasion of the Soviet Union. When he's asked about this, who do you mean? You know, he mentions Britain. You know, Britain is still seen as a potential adversary in 1939, 1940. And, and Churchill, significantly, even though, you know, my book, he comes off as kind of rather soft on Stalin uh, until the end when he firms up. Um, Churchill was, of course, an arch-interventionist during uh, the Russia Civil War. You know, he was an office minister of war, minister of munitions. Um, he was a lot more firmly interventionist than Lloyd George was, for example. Uh, the British had also, and this is quite significant, I didn't really talk about it today, but... 
uh, the Baku plots that the Soviets uncover where Britain was, you know, wargaming, bombing Baku um, in the spring of 1940, which effectively gave Stalin the pretext for what we now call the Katyn massacre. I don't have time to go into that. You'll have to read the book. But the British had actually sent an expeditionary force to Baku in 1918. Um, and so, in fact, he takes this quite seriously, uh, the threat of a British intervention. Even when they're talking about the Balkans, the reason he tells the Germans, you know, we need Bulgaria and we need to station troops at the States is to keep the British Navy out of the Black Sea, uh, where, of course, the British Navy had gone in 1918 after the Ottoman collapse. So he's not really thinking about the American intervention. He's definitely thinking about the British intervention and the position, because, of course, he was at the time, you know, in a position of power and influence in 1918, and he knew what was going on with the British. Yeah, absolutely. I would second that. Uh, the, the British were the, the, the bigger threat from, from Stalin's viewpoint. And of course, keep in mind, you know, the British also had an active uh, combat force in the Baltic during the Russian Civil War. They were assisting a number of these uh, states seeking independence in the former Tsarist Empire. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a plot, at least from the Soviet perspective, to, that might involve the assassination of senior leaders hatched out of the British embassy in Petrograd uh, during the Russian Civil War. They actually stormed the embassy, kill a number of military officers, hold the rest hostage. Uh, they're, they're seen as a much greater and, and longer term threat than, than the United States. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Nick Mueller, Ian Johnson, and Sean McMegan. As Nick mentioned, before you all leave, as Nick mentioned about the, um, the free shipping for books, an important note, any books that you may want with you, such as Jeanette Conan's books for tonight, you should go and retrieve them from your boxes now. The boxes will not be brought over to the U.S. Freedom Pavilion tonight. So uh, go add to it the three books in total with Faustian Bargain and Stalin's War, which equals two books. But uh, we'll be back at 3.15. Thank you very much. <laughs>
not just in the United States, but globally around this ma uh, major conflict. I think that's great. And I'll, I'll also throw this in that just as we're going to try to be global geographically, we're really going to try to have the broadest possible approach. So sure, we'll do some battle and war fighting. That's always been my bread and butter as a scholar and, and as a researcher. But we're also going to be looking at politics, at society, at diplomacy, at culture, at film. We're not going to shrink from the, discussing the horrors of the Holocaust, yes. comparative genocides. That too is going to be part. So I'm pretty excited about this. I, I, I also, we'll second what you said about the, it's two institutions that are kind of being married here. Mm -hmm. It's a great educational institution in Arizona State and one of the leaders in, in online education. But you know, here at the museum, we also bring bring some things mm -hmm. to the table. Uh, as you can see, we, we're standing in a museum gallery, artifacts, mega artifacts, uh, you name it, we have it here, including mm -hmm. 10,000 testimonies, oral wow. histories from, from veterans. I think of people who might want to take this. I, I can come up with a lot of groups. I see this as kind of professional development. You might be a, a high school teacher who mm -hmm. would, would like to get a master's and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, for professional development reasons. You might just be somebody who wants to keep that keep those juices flowing and, and yeah. study this, uh, this largest of human conflicts a little more carefully than you have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's why the program is designed to teach skills, right? We were, of course, we're going to learn a lot about World War II. There's no doubt about There's, that. That's for sure. <laughs> but we're also really interested in transferable skills. So analysis, uh, our critical thinking, writing, and writing not just in the academic format, but writing on many, many different venues, as you will when you are a professional working in a museum, if you're a teacher, um, if you're a historian, in any kind of um, public organization, you will have to have a repertoire of different kinds of writing, and we try to teach that here. Great points. So, you know, I'll throw in one last thing, the flexibility of this program. Mm. You're going to really do it at your, your, at your own time. It, it doesn't matter where you are on the globe. This is yes. World War II class, and you can take it literally from anywhere in the world. So I hope that you will be very much interested uh, in the program. You will definitely meet Rob and myself, uh, and we're looking forward to having you in class. Uh, we had donut machines, donut mix, coffee, ground coffee. So we'd go out to a base and um, hook up to their electrical system for the, for the donut machine. It had uh, a PA system, but that meant that, uh, that either they could listen with their coffee and donuts or you could dance with them. We also, in our off time, as it were, would go over to the two to the two Red Cross clubs in town, and uh, and help uh, you know entertain and listen, 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 listen. I'll tell you, the first unit that we served was a, an artillery battery in in firing position. Uh, we, we used to have just line up jerry cans and put a box of donuts and a, some cream and sugar and some coffee, you know. Um, we we and the guys would come by. The the guys loved it when we did stupid things. They did, and sometimes we did them purposely, but not usually. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they're they're going down the line and uh, and uh, we're talking to them and everything, and they're wondering, some of them be, stand behind and wonder, what are you doing way up here? And, well, well I don't know, we're doing our best. And um, uh, so the, they were not firing at the time we set up. Mm -hmm. And here we are, uh, I'm doing coffee again, and it's a big one pound uh, ladle. Uh, and um, I've got it uh, just about to pour into this uh, this off, he turns out to be the, the commanding officer, the captain. Uh, of, uh, he, and he's got his canteen cup out, and I'm about to pour the coffee at, into it when they start firing. These are 155s. These make a noise. And I go this way and pour coffee all over him. And uh, he, fortunately, he had a field jacket on. And so our orders were to be among the first to cross. And we, we had this truck that we turned into a club mobile and had the donut machine in it. And our GI cooks, we had two guys who had, you know, 
they did the cooking while we went out and served. That was the point. Why, why put Red Cross women in a truck and have them cooking? Um, what happened was when, when we turned up at the, um, at the gates of Memmingen camp uh, and started in, the guys went wild. It was disbelief. It was joy. I can remember I was standing in a in a an open space with just nothing but guys, you know, mm -hmm. prisoners. And I started trying to talk to them, and you know, said, hey, hey, who's who's from there and whatnot, and and um, they wouldn't answer. They just stood there and looked at me. And finally, I said, I don't know what to, what what what. Why won't you talk to me? Mm -hmm. And, and one guy, an American, stepped forward and he said, Miss Red Cross, could I touch your hand? And I said, sure. And, I, and he turned it over and just went like that. It went, you know, uh, I think what it meant, what, I hope what we meant to them, and I believe it, was that there, there is a, a, a normal, caring world out there. Mm -hmm. Constance Negrotto was a talented art student in New Orleans when a professor suggested she apply for a job as a draftsman. We were supposed to bring a sample of our work. I drew a picture of a, a C-46, a big poster, and uh, <laughs> I got the job all right. Negrotto began her new job at Higgins Industries, working on both production and internal projects. My aunt and my cousin worked there as riveters, and I had a job up in front. We did a lot of the charts and things for both the plant and Higgins' conference room. When Negrotto began work at another Higgins location, the Mishu assembly facility, wartime restrictions posed challenges for her commute. I didn't have enough ration stamps to get gasoline for my car, so I had to go and catch a streetcar, ride to Canal Street and Broad, get off and get a ride to the Mishu plant in a horse trailer. <laughs> it was kind of fun. <laughs> Draftsmen and women like Negrotto were key to the productivity of wartime manufacturers like Higgins Industries. By the end of the war, Higgins employed 25,000 people and had produced over 20,000 boats and landing craft. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States, died on April 12, 1945, while in office. His death was a shock to the country and dealt a blow to the morale of the American people in the waning months of the Second World War. For many Americans, especially the young men serving overseas, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the only president they had ever really known. Elected in 1933, when many of those fighting Germany and Japan were in grade school, Roosevelt was the epitome of the term leader. His leadership was unquestioned from his initial election through his astonishing and unprecedented four terms in office. Winning in a landslide victory over incumbent Herbert Hoover in 1933 during the heart of the Great Depression, FDR as he was known, guided the country through the worst economic years in America's history. At the time of his election, more than two million Americans were homeless and over a quarter of the American workforce was unemployed. Roosevelt's New Deal policy helped pull the country out of the depths of the economic depression and put people back to work. Despite his successes in his first two terms and into his third, Roosevelt's greatest lay in front of him. Desperately trying to keep America out of the war raging in Europe while still trying to render aid to the country's besieged European allies, the president provided skilled and trusted leadership in the dark days following Japan's attack on the United States at Pearl Harbor. His trusted voice reassured, panicked, and scared Americans that the country would strike back at their attackers and gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Throughout the war years, Roosevelt displayed great leadership, trusting his subordinates while leaning on their expert levels of dedication, ingenuity, and strategic decision-making. Roosevelt's leadership allowed for American victory to be achieved in both the European and Pacific theaters of war. His leadership on the American home front gave hope to millions who otherwise had not known opportunity. The war which essentially ended the Depression and either employed the unemployed in defense plants and war work or enlisted them in the armed services also provided opportunity, thanks to Roosevelt's decisions, to millions of African Americans and women who both took a prominent role in the workforce for the first time under FDR's guidance. 
the depression, war years, and ceaseless leadership of the American people and her allies took a toll on the president. With his health declining during the initial portion of his fourth term as president, Roosevelt succumbed to a massive brain hemorrhage on the afternoon of April 12, 1945. On the morning of April 13th, Roosevelt's body was placed in a flag-draped coffin and loaded under the presidential train for the trip back to Washington. Along the route, thousands flocked to the tracks to pay their respects. Roosevelt's declining physical health had been kept secret from the general public. His death was met with shock and grief across the United States and around the world. After Germany surrendered the following month, newly sworn in President Truman dedicated Victory in Europe Day and its celebrations to Roosevelt's memory, saying that his only wish was that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had lived to witness this day. Walter Imahara, and welcome to the Imahara's Legacy Garden here at Hemingbau in St. Francisville. First thing you see is a Tory gate, because the Tory gate, it's, it's welcome. You're welcome to uh, peace in nature, and you leave the old world behind. This garden has uh, been built about two years ago because we had a, uh, we sold a big gardens on in St. Francisville. We needed a place to finish up with the legacy portion and we didn't want a big piece of property. So here at Hemingbau, we found this property but needed a lot of work because where I'm sitting, big erosion and the trees are just so solid in here, you couldn't see the water. bring in plants from all over uh, Louisiana because the plants from up north doesn't really grow good here. And during construction, I was asking if it's a Japanese garden. I said, well, it's a, it's a Japanese American garden, which has uh, never been heard of before. But it's a mixture of Japanese and American because that's where I am. But we have lanterns here, we got Tory gates. You see some carvings that came from Indonesia area, made out of lava stone. Okay, this is a greeter. I was born in 1937, so when World War II started, I was like uh, four years old. I learned a lot of philosophy from my father and mother because you must remember now, I'm now age over 80. I, I, I've been with them all my life, except for the three and a half years in the service. And I must mention that uh, I learned a lot because my parents were Buddhists. And we were born Buddhists, but after camp, my mother became a Christian. We came from camps from Arkansas. We were in two camps, uh, Jerome and Royer, which is about five hours north from here. And my parents wanted to go south because they lost everything in California. Okay, and when I say they lost, they lost a farm and all that. And one of the biggest things that we want people to know that we really were Americans at that point. So, and we knew the circumstances of the war. My father spoke about incarceration uh, to, uh, to the, not too much to the children until he got past the anger. My father's journey into uh, plant materials that he found peace after uh, leaving camp. But it took him maybe uh, uh, 10 years, but till then he was very bitter against the United States and just bitter against everything. But uh, he found a way in his heart that with the Buddhist background, and then he started uh, working with plant material and your nature, huh? You see plants blooming, you see the bees, and you see the butterflies, and it's, it's all nature. That's why I like, uh, my father and I like the gardening business, because sometimes when you work with plant material, it really uh, makes you feel better, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
This monument was first found by my father and myself in Hiroshima in 1977. But it took us another, until 2005, when we understood that the, the monument was gonna be taken down in Hiroshima at this Buddhist temple. The temple did not want the uh, monument any longer because no one has come visit it for 50 years. And a generation of Imaharas left Japan and, my, and now living in America. Okay, so this is a very old, uh, I would say in age-wise, it's about made, uh, it was built about 19, uh, 1905. What's interesting about the monument that it did survive the atomic blast, and it, the history is that uh, my great-great-grandfather built it for a son who passed away 1895, while he was a Navy in, in China. So it's not a tombstone per se, it's like a monument. But also in the front here, I can't read Japanese, but in translation, it means this is a Imahara monument for those now living and also in the future. When you walk in the gardens, it's, uh, it's peaceful, nature. Uh, you don't hear no uh, trucks going by, and it's just so quiet, huh? And you see a, uh, the birds, you see the bees, butterflies, and the peacocks, things like that. It's just, uh, it's, good, uh, it's good for the soul huh? to, uh, to visit nice, quiet place with nature. So quiet here. I'll do it. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to the ballroom and find your seats and find your cell phones also. Thank you very much.
Can't help it. All right, everybody, welcome back, please. So if you haven't found seats yet, uh, you know, please do. But uh, also want to give a special shout out to the, uh, the folks online, uh, to include my wife, who's, uh, who's been watching this uh, back home in Virginia. So, uh, you know, sadly, we've reached the last session uh, for the afternoon with this conference, uh, but we got a great one for you. Uh, an opportunity to really cap off an extremely productive and engaging uh, conference. Author uh, Malcolm Gladwell will discuss his latest book, The Bomber Mafia, A Dream, A Temptation, and The Longest Night of the Second World War, and a look at how Major General Haywood S. Hansel and Major General Curtis LeMay developed new innovations in air power and strategic bombing during World War II. Historians Dr. Don Miller and Dr. Con Crane will join Malcolm on stage for a roundtable discussion and for questions from the audience. So first, uh, we'll turn to Malcolm uh, for a bit of a talk about the historical context of his book, The Bomber Mafia, and provide some insight into the making of the audio book. And with that, sir, the stage is yours. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm um, humbled to be on the same stage as two historians who have forgotten more about Second World War than I ever knew. Um, so um, I won't, and I, I think our conversation will be more interesting than me alone. So I will, um, I'll be relatively brief. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about the origin of the book and the audio book. Um, I was someone who, uh, I grew up in, I'm, I was born in England, my father is English, and I grew up reading those, I feel like it's a particularly British thing, these kinds of popular military histories aimed at kind of teenage or pre-adolescent boys, those were the books of my youth. I consumed them by the truckload. And I always wanted to write a kind of popular history in that vein, um, particularly of the Second World War, because that was the war I grew up hearing about from my father, who uh, I grew up in Kent and would hear the bombers, the German bombers overhead as a child, and whose, his mother uh, my grandmother told my father to sleep under his bed as if that would protect him. Uh, and in, at one point, uh, a German bomb actually fell in, my, in the backyard of my grandparents' house and luckily did not explode. Um, but anyway, I grew up on these stories, always wanted to write a World War II story. Um, I, but I despaired that they had all, the, all the good ones had been told. Um, and then I kind of stumbled on this one. And the motivation I had or the template in my head for the Barra Mafia came from uh, a conversation I'd had a good 15 years ago with um, Colonel uh, Paul Van Riper, who was a, in the Marine Corps. And I had been interviewing him about something very, very different. And he had said his favorite battle of all time was the Battle of Chancellorsville in the, Second, in the Civil War. And I became immersed in the Battle of Chancellorsville. And what's interesting about the Battle of Chancellorsville, and the reason Van Riper directed me towards it, is that it is a, it's really a character study. I mean, it's many things. You can tell that story of that battle 20 different ways. But the most compelling way to tell it is as a character study between uh, General Hooker and, uh, and Robert E. Lee. And everything that happens almost everything that happens in that showdown between these two men was a function of their own particular flaws and personality and character makeup, and in um, Hooker's case, his arrogance. And I, in, in immersing myself in that battle, I fell in love with the idea of telling the story of battles um, through the context of character. Um, and this coincided with a a more general feeling in my own writing that I, in the early part of my career, I wrote books that were primarily about ideas. And as I've gotten older, I've become more and more convinced that you cannot tell a book about an idea unless you start with the character and personality of the people who are engaged with that idea. That character is destiny in so many different things. Um, so that was the, that was the kind of um, what, that was the context for me investigating the story of the bomber mafia in the Second World War, and in particular, 
the conflict between Haywood Hansel and his uh, band of like-minded airmen down at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama and Curtis LeMay and um, his particular approach to how best to use air power in the context of war. And my primary interest was in describing their conflict through the prism of each man's character. And those of you, and I'm sure almost all of you know a lot about those characters, LeMay in particular, will know that the minute you start opening the question of LeMay's character, you can go on forever. I mean, he's, he's just the most interesting guy. I mean, many, uh, many people have written much more interesting and brilliant things about LeMay than I have, but I got the LeMay bug. And when you get the LeMay bug, you can't stop until you've written a book. Um, so that's what, that's what this is. Um, my, there was one story in the book about LeMay. I will contribute this to the, to the enormous body of LeMay knowledge. I, I talked to a man. LeMay's um, uh, one of the, from LeMay's perspective, most disastrous air campaigns he was involved in was the bombing of Schweinfurt um, in 1943, I think. Um, or was it 42? I can't remember. Um, yeah. And um, I talked to a guy who was, had known LeMay when LeMay was in retirement, and he, for some reason, had gone to visit LeMay at his house in Newport Beach, and he, had, he was delivering a package of some kind, and he went in the front door, and he saw on the wall in the foyer to LeMay's house a giant blown up uh, photograph. It was the strike photo from the attack on Schweinfurt. And it was this little window into, well, I thought, actually an enormous window into LeMay's character that he chose to put in the position of greatest prominence in his house a visual memento of what he considered to be one of the great disasters of his career. And he still had that photo on his wall in the 1970s, right? For 30 years after the fact. Um, that. I always, I've, I've turned that little anecdote over in my mind many times when I come, try to come to terms with LeMay, that um, this was not someone who let bygones be bygones or who was uh, willing to turn his back on what he considered to be a disaster, right? That's interesting. Anyway, um, those stories and others are told in my book um, and they are ways of trying to understand these enormously complicated people. A um, couple other um, uh, quick points um, before I talk a little bit about the audiobook. The other thing that drew me to this story of the conflict between these two schools of thought of bombing and um, Second World War was this notion that there are a set of problems in our world that are essentially impossible problems, that they are problems without clear or un unambiguous solutions. And I think the idea of an impossible problem is something that is both kind of under-theorized and underappreciated in our society. We like to pretend that every problem has an unambiguous and clear solution, um, and they don't. Um, you know, I have spent way, 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 the subject that has consumed me more than anything else in my career as a writer has been writing about law enforcement. I have returned to it repeatedly. My next book is about policing. And the reason I'm so drawn to that question is I believe that most of the hardest questions around law enforcement are impossible problems. Um, we ask policemen to do things that are impossible. We ask them to respect our rights and to keep, also to keep crime at a minimum. We ask them to, uh, to enforce the law as fairly as they can, but at the same time, we would like them to, to enforce the law with discretion. I could go on and give you a whole series of impossible contradictions that lie at the heart of that, uh, of that profession. And every time we have an argument about policing in this country, we're essentially having an argument about it because we refuse to acknowledge the fact that the police, by definition, deal with impossible problems. Well, war is one series of impossible problem after another. And I thought it would be very useful to try and tell the story of these two men and these two philosophies for a popular audience, an audience that may have be entirely unfamiliar with the Second World War, for the purpose of introducing them to an impossible problem. 
Um, and I think the more we immerse ourselves in impossible problems, the better off we are. A um, couple other quick points uh, before I turn um, to this much more fun conversation with Don and Khan. Um, we did a, this book was conceived of as an audio book first. I, I started an audio company with uh, my best friend a couple years ago, and we had this idea that the single most um, disappointing and pathetic offering of the literary community was the audiobook, that it, you, you would write a book, which you would pour your heart into, and then at the end of the process, they would yank you out and put you in a studio for three days and just have you read the whole thing, and they would say, we're done. And this struck me as the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. Um, so we, we were determined to make an audiobook that was like an audio documentary, that was immersive, that used the tape. So in my book, when I interview Dr. Crane, you hear Dr. Crane. When I'm talking about Curtis LeMay, you hear Curtis LeMay. When we're talking about flying in a, you know, a B-17 bomber, you hear the B-17 bomber. I could go on. We try to bring as much tape, real world tape as possible. You know, I went down to the Maxwell Air Force Base, um, and if you are an, ar an archival geek as I am, Maxwell Air Force Base is like heaven. It's like, it's one of the two or three greatest moments of my professional life because you walk in and they have tape of every single person of note in the air war, in the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. It's just miles and miles and miles and miles of tape. It's all there. Because it's the Air Force, it's all perfectly organized. And um, so I just thought, why would I turn my back on that enormous resource? Why not create a product that allows you to hear and feel what all of these people were talking about in the Second World War. Um, so I would, as one last thing I would say, if you have not read the book, um, I would wholeheartedly recommend that you, uh, well, you should buy the book, why not? <laughs> but <laughs> you might also want to listen to the audiobook. I happen to be of the belief the audiobook is a better experience. Um, and uh, you can find it on Audible, you can find it at uh, uh, bombermafia.com. You can just download it. Um, it's a, a labor of love uh, that, um, that I think is a, uh, an order of magnitude better than the standard um, audiobook that is available. Anyway, with that, um, we will, let's commence our conversation. Yeah. Conversations don't usually begin with a question, Malcolm, but um, I, I see you as a, a Wallenda, a high wire act, and a provocateur as well. Uh, you once said you'd rather be interesting than right. Yes. And uh, you get minds moving, you know, and I think you really succeed in that. I, I'd like to begin talking about a little more about Maxwell, you know, and how you got there and, you know, Yeah, I said I'd like to hear more about Maxwell and mm -hmm. how you found out about it and how you get there and how much time you spent. I mean, that's cool. Um, I, uh, I'm going to take this occasion to name drop, which I normally don't do, but I, um, I had the great uh, honor of flying down to Maxwell with, uh, with General Brown, the oh. chief of staff of the Air Force, um, who I got to know a little bit when I was doing the book and who I'm... Um, uh, enormously impressed by, and he, I said I wanted to go to Maxwell, it was the middle of COVID, and he invited me down, and I had dinner with the, is it the superintendent of, yeah. yes, of Maxwell, and saw that kind of, Maxwell is such a kind of amazing little strike, little piece of America, American military culture, um, with all the streets named after famous airmen. I mean, there's Curtis LeMay Way, and there's, you know, um, and there's all those, all the officers' quarters are these kind of picture-perfect um, houses of that, of that, of the 30s and 40s. Um, but I went there, uh, and I, I really wanted to talk to people at the Air University, because um, these people had been thinking about these topics for, it's their job to think about these topics. And I will say the, 
of the many things that impressed me about Maxwell, and this, is, I will say, is a general thing that has struck me about military historians, particularly those who are directly affiliated with uh, the military itself, and I would count Dr. Crane among this, um, is their willingness to be, their ability to be objective and critical about their own institution is really striking to me. Um, that there is a tradition within the military of being, um, of being, of trying to learn from past mistakes and being open to all manner of perspectives on things that have happened. And that's, um, that is such a rare commodity these days. It is. Um, and when I was sitting talking to the historians at Maxwell, I mean, they're, they were like, they just had a, I, I, for some reason I had thought they would be kind of, there would be some kind of party line they would be towing. There's no party line. It's, you know, it's wide open. And that was one of the many things that impressed me about doing this project. I found the same thing with the, uh, even with the airmen, the veterans, you know, willing to criticize the stupidity of some of the things they did and willing to, you know, name names and things like that. And then where praise is due, they, they give it. But, you know, you kind of expect just the defense of what they've, do, what they've done, you know. And, uh, you know, you don't get that generally, yeah. And it, it surprised me, it really did, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you from experience, though, that the, the problem is when you get up in the general officer ranks, that the, uh, <laughs> that's what you've got a, more of a party line there. And there's yeah. a lot of other agendas going on, but generally I've, I've Colonels and below are great to work with, and historians also. Yeah. <laughs> Although I heard a, an interview... Oh, historians are as dug in as orthodox military people in a lot of cases. <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> I heard an uh, interview with uh, General McChrystal, um, which is really interesting. This was just a couple weeks ago. And he was talking on this very subject, and he was saying that his greatest concern about the direction of recent military culture was that... Um, there was an intolerance of, an increasing intolerance of, uh, of mistakes. In other words, it used to be the case that you could screw up and they would say, well, let's see if you can learn from it and be better. And now if you screw up, you're out. And he thought that was, it's a reflection of this very point that we're making, that he would like to see at the upper ranks of the military a willingness to tolerate errors if there was an expectation that you would learn from them. Um, but wouldn't you, 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 you describe yourself once as an obsessive, mm -hmm. and the bomber mafia kind of mirrored that. They were obsessive too, but wouldn't you think that people who were obsessive would be um, inflexible? Which is kind of how you portray Hansel. Yeah. yeah, although, I mean, I know that I, my reading of Hansel, I think, differs from others in that I was much more inclined to see in Hansel a strong moral streak. And I know yeah. that you had said that, you know, it's possible I was overreading this part of his. I think you did. Yeah. Um, which I'm fine with. I would rather be more interested. But he in is the only one. He is the only one, yeah. and he's the leading one, I should say, who introduced morality. He put morality into play. Yes. In the discussion about bombing. I mean, Khan and I were talking about that before. He, he, he comes back to it, and he's concerned about it. His priority is always effectiveness. Uh, that's what everybody's priority was in the air war. When you go into a room, you know, as I could imagine, what those operations rooms were like in Europe, where they were battling with the Curtis LeMay of Europe, uh, Bomber Harris. Mm -hmm. And they say, no more fire bombs, because we know a better way to knock out the German economy with strategic bombing, not pinpoint bombing, because they don't believe in that, that's an oxymoron. But the, um, there's, you know, it's just... There was a moment... There's a different tone, you know? Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, there was two things that led me to that conclusion that made me want to stress his morality. One was reading, uh, and I've forgotten his last name, I went back and found a privately published memoir of one of the members of the Bomber Mafia, and he was one of the older members, and he had been through the First World War, and he was talking about... He's a George or Wilson. George, yeah, George Wilson. Yeah, yeah. George. Yeah, yeah, he was in the trenches. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he talks about how 
scarred he and his generation were by the First World War and how their kind of moral revulsion at that conflict. Well, that's why, you know, I mean, when you talk about, not you, but when historians talk about the origins of this idea of strategic bombing and things like that, they always go back to Billy Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And he's, it's the same thing with him. He, he gets a chance to fly across the trenches. And he said, this is morally absurd to have this kind of killing close quarter when we're going to be developing planes very rapidly that are closed cockpit and can fly over the battlefield, quickly knock out targets, not kill a lot of c civilians, and then end wars by rapier-like strikes, you know, rather than, you know, um, inclusive cover bombing or slaughter bombing. I, I, I must say, though... It's there that, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got, to, I've got to say, though, that I, I have seen a, uh, Carl Spatz's granddaughter has written a biography of Spots that I've seen the manuscript for. I have too, it's great. And, but she emphasizes her father had very strong, now he, did, he didn't bring him up, and he, he says in, his, in, in a number of places, I never discussed morality, I never brought morality up in any discussions about bombing, but her argument is he did have very strong qualms. I mean, he comes over, he comes over to take over from, uh, over, be over LeMay in, the, in July, I guess it is, of 45, when the, fire raids been going on and he really wants to stop the fire raids but he can't for a number of reasons there's just too much bureaucratic inertia but he was you know he wrote in his memoir i've never been in favor of destroying cities uh, you know he but his again his granddaughter argues that he did have a very strong moral mm -hmm. feeling but but that he didn't keep did not keep him from doing it he still yeah. did the he still sent the fire raids in he still dropped the bombs but but back in the background he did have this sense of what he thought was right and wrong yeah or better, or righter, or wronger. I, I guess. think you caught it in your title. You know, it it is this dream, yeah, because it seems to be possible to have bombing with a semblance of morality, and uh, and do it in a different way. Fight wars. In a, they're trying to invent, in, like you say, a, a different 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 way of there, conducting warfare. There's two. I make two points along these lines. One is that. And this part is, is largely unanswerable. But my sense is, from reading just in general, um, that for, for a, a thoughtful person of that era, uh, raised in a culture that was where, where religious ideas and practice are at the center of the culture and not at the periphery, that moral questions are um, dealt with in a different way. And if, can I be more specific than that? I, I don't know. What I do know is that to, in order to engage with a subject in a moral way, you need to have a vocabulary you need, of morality. You need to have a conceptual framework of how to think about a moral question. For generations who were raised on the Bible and for whom going to church every week was a central part of what it meant to be alive, you're, th that kind of thinking is very available to you. And it's not available to people who aren't immersed in um, the church in the same way. And that's a huge difference between 1935 and 2020, or 2021. The other thing I would say is that, a, 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 a second thing is that for a man of authority in 1940 or 35 or what have you, um, the difference between what you said in private and what you said in public was perhaps much greater than it was today. Um, I, I'm in the middle of a project right now about that uh, talks, among other things, about Tom Bradley, the mayor of Los Angeles, a uh, first black mayor of Los Angeles. And I, I'm, he was born in 1917. It's a little bit younger than this cohort we're talking about. But it is, in his case, it's so striking. The things he said at home and the things he said in public bore no relationship to each other. And that is, that's that generation, right? Is you went out the door and you put on your hat and your suit or your uniform and you took on an entirely different identity. So that makes me, that's when I was wondering about the inner life of some of these uh, men. That's what I had in mind. I think that's really right. When I interviewed as you, as you did, the, the crews who flew those firebombing missions, 
I mean, uh, one of the guys in particular that I interviewed was deeply religious, a Methodist, and very connected to his, to his pastor, who he was writing regular letters to. And um, he was abhorred by the bombing, but he supported it because that's what he was supposed to do. That, that was his job. And he was worried that he was enthusiastic about the fact that he thought it was winning the war, but this was a sin against God. Mm -hmm. And he wrote to his minister, and his minister told him it wasn't, that you're fighting in evil. He uh, took that in, and it got him through. Uh, as a consciously you know, alert human being, he, it got him through these missions. And he's thinking exactly that kind of way. Mm -hmm. Two authority figures, the maid's telling him to do this, the minister's telling him to do that. And he doesn't see it as diametrically opposite. He thinks it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay, religious-wise. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I, I, I know we want to give the audience a lot of time for questions. I want to, that, that, by the way, this is, there's all kinds of great stories in this book about the Norden bomb site, about the development of napalm by my favorite mad scientist, Louis Fieser. There, there's just all kinds of great stories. But the, the, his la the last line of the book that he closes with, and I don't know about the podcast, I'm going to have to listen to that. Uh, he says, he talks about the fact that the U.S. Air Force today has really realized that dream precision bombing, and he says, Curtis LeMay won the battle, but Haywood Hansel won the war. And that, I was thinking about that, and, and the, it, it's an interesting dynamic today. Uh, one of the things that, that Niall Ferguson talked about in, in the lead-in uh, talk for this conference was that our, the American nuclear uh, capability has no credibility. Nobody thinks we're going to do it. Some of you who have been to previous conferences know I have a pine. We need to drop a nuke on somebody every 50 years just to remind them we do that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, we have not done that and, and that we have lost our credibility. But on the other hand, uh, let me talk about an example and how the dynamic of Hansel and LeMay operates in the current environment. Let's talk about Kosovo, 1999. First war won by air power alone, as John Keegan said. It's much more complicated than that. Nothing is monocausal. There's a lot of reason most of which gives in. But, but if you look, if you see what happens, of course, we start the 78-day bombing campaign using precision bombing, Hansel's techniques, as, as air campaigns often do. Things escalate as the time goes on. You're doing more and more dual-use targets. Um, eventually, on May 24th, about two-thirds of the way into it, there's an attack on that takes out the power grid in Belgrade. All the power goes out. Chaos in Belgrade. There's uh, uh, babies dying in incubators. There, there's, there's, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, there's a, a Stephen Hosmer, who was a researcher at RAND, went in and interviewed a lot of the Serb leaders. And he said that as the Serb leaders watched this escalation, the metaphor in their mind was Tokyo. So we have, we're using precision bombing, but it's in the mind of adversaries, they know that this conventional bombing can eventually get to Tokyo. So it becomes a major deterrent. I mean, there are certain operations in American military history that have, that are, that have stuck in our mind of potential, potential adversaries forever. One is Inchon. Mm -hmm. Everybody we fight against is worried the Marines are gonna come ashore on their beaches. But another one that seems to be Tokyo. That, that they, as much as, and, and I've worked with the Air Force, their targeting is meticulous, the care they, I mean, Hansel, the dream has been realized. I mean, precision bombing is the way we're going to do it. We're going to be effective. We're going to be humane. But in the mind of our adversaries, they know how far this can go. So we have this conventional deterrent because of what LeMay did. I mean, we can talk about the controversy about Tokyo, but Tokyo is out there as an example. If you go to the, I mean, it's, that's the image of American air power. You go to the, the, the museum in Beijing, the military museum in Beijing, you go to Hanoi, the images they have is this massed American air power. I've talked to Iraqi POWs. I've talked to uh, North Vietnamese veterans of Vietnam. Uh, and they don't remember precision bombing. They remember massed American air power. So the, the, this, you know, again, it's interesting. We are, we're, we're doing Hansel, but, but at the, in the adversaries' minds, they remember that we they had remember a LeMay. LeMay too. But why then are, this is for you, you know, and why then in Malcolm's conversations with these guys um, are they committed to the precision bombing? They're not committed to the LeMay-like bombing, which you say everybody fears. Well, I think Khan's point is we have the, I don't want to use the word luxury, but we have the ability 
to to lean on the precision method because yeah. of this example looking in the we terrified them 50 years, no, 75 years ago with this other thing, 85, whatever it is, <laughs> uh, with this other, and I think that actually, that's a really, really interesting, by the way, I, I can't turn down this opportunity to tell my favorite Kosovo story, um, which is, this is told to me by, so the, it was a coalition, right? Yeah. Which meant that any target that you were attacking in Kosovo had to be signed off by everyone yeah. in the coalition, which turns out to be a nightmare, right? Yeah, an right. absolute nightmare. Yeah. For example, there was at one point the notion that they would take out, I think, the presidential palace. And so everyone signs off on it except the Dutch. Dutch say, no, you can't do it. Do you know the story? Yeah. Oh, you, no. you guys? Go of course you know the story. <laughs> and the Dutch say, there's a Rembrandt on the second floor. You, you can't take out that. <laughs> It, anyway, <laughs> there's, there's a book, there's actually a great book I reckon, it's called, but it's by Michael Ignatiev, it's called, um, oh, jeepers, it, it, baby, it's on Kosovo bombing, and I can't remember the title of it, but Michael Ignatiev, and he talks about all these dilemmas about precision bombing, and is it really precise, and the fact that it's not perfect, it never is going to be perfect, yeah. and expectations are out of control, um, it's, uh, it's a real good, and it talks about those same dilemmas. The first day, Michael, I talked to Michael Short, who was the commander. The first day they go in, and he, he wants to take out the, the, uh, the, barracks, around, the, 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 the barracks around Belgrade. It's one, on the first day of targeting, and, and the coalition, you, have to, you can't bomb those barracks. There may be draftees there. Drove Short nuts. It drove Short absolutely bonkers. Some of the restrictions, and eventually they have to go where they, they, only, they only restrict the targeting decisions to those, t those nations who actually have aircraft on the mission. So they cut the decision making down from 19 countries to four or five. Yeah. But it's, uh, it, it's, oh, it's, what's it called? Virtual, virtual War. The name of the book is Virtual War. I highly recommend it. Oh, wow. All right, I will. Uh... But throughout this whole thing is this transfixing power of Curtis LeMay. I yeah. mean, what first got me into that idea was I interviewed a guy named Robert Rosenthal for my book, and he's a really neat guy, and he flew 52 missions, and Jewish kid from the Bronx, great athlete, and all that other stuff. And today, at the time I was interviewing, he was a Bobby Kennedy Democrat. Absolutely adored LeMay. Was very upset by Dr. Strangelove, you know. He, he thought he was, as you point out in your podcast, what everybody says, that he was the best air commander ever. And, you know, I, I could not find a single airman, uh, not only the airman who flew for him, you know, both sides, you know, B-17s, B-29s, you know, they're all in the LeMay's. Do, well, so this is a question I've been dying to ask the two of you. Does a LeMay work today? In other words, could someone of his character and temperament and per personality reach the level that he reached in today's <sighs> military? I don't think so. Oof. I thought, of, I thought of it in a different way. I kept thinking, when I was thinking about you know, talking to you today, I thought, um, would LeMay have used that slaughter bombing in Europe? Let's say he hadn't gone to Japan. Let's say he was there in 44, 45, when we had the capability. We all, you mentioned the, the, the Japanese village that they built in Mom, and you mentioned Mendelssohn, the German architect. They also built a German uh, tower block, and they bombed that, and they were going to use napalm, mm -hmm. and they were ready to use atomic bombs, and the atomic bomb, of course, was made for Germany. But um, I don't think LeMay would have went to firebombing because at the end of the war, uh, in terms of economic destructiveness, in terms of knocking out the German uh, infrastructure, uh, all the commanders were convinced that these two targets they had picked, oil and transportation, and the way they were hitting them were working really well. Because what I, I went back to those air meetings that they had with Harris, and they're saying to Harris directly, you're screwing us up. I mean, you're hitting places like Forzheim, which aren't industrial targets, and you're wasting a lot of bombs, and we, we could be hitting more important targets. We have the Achilles heel. We have it in our hand. And this is wastage. So it wasn't so much, wasn't so much morality, but it's about wastage. And I don't know if he would have been permitted. And also, you made a really good point in your book. You said that he was running rogue in the Pacific. And he really was. Norstead was the only guy over there. I mean, he didn't even go through, as you point out, he didn't even go through Arnold, the head of the Air Force, to conduct a type of bombing that just hadn't been done before. Yeah. 62 cities. 
and he doesn't, he doesn't consult his own air commander. Yeah, he gets, I mean, today that does not Jesus fly. Well, he's, <laughs> it, it, his personality, though, it's, it's I don't know, there, there's, I know, out in the audience, I know there's a guy named Trevor Albertson, who is, I think, is the, he's got a couple volumes of his biography of LeMay. He's, I think, the premier LeMay biography right now. And I, I don't know if he's found it, but I remember when I was going through LeMay's papers, when he was the uh, vice chief of staff of the Air Force, there was a, there was a paper, I, 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 I regret not copying it, but basically what he told his staff was he says, if anybody asks me for my opinion, and this is how you got to understand when you see LeMay in, in the movie 13 Days and other places with this blunt assessment of bomb in Cuba. He says, if somebody asks me a question, I'm going to give them a very blunt answer based on my feelings about the, 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 the best military action. It's going to piss a lot of people off, and I want you on the staff to spend the rest of the time taking care of those hurt feelings. So. You, so, so their job was to clean up after he gave his opinion because he, he was going to be blunt and give that opinion. And that's the way that he was. Uh, he's, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scene in the movie um, Strategic Air Command with Jimmy Stewart. And then the character, the, the general in that, the, the general hawk in that movie is, is LeMay. And it, it's with a, it's, it's a it's, it actually happened in, during World War II, but it has a thing that's happening in the, in the, in the late 40s, where they land, that he's in an airplane, it lands, and, and they're refueling the aircraft, and the General Hawk is out there smoking a cigar as they're refueling the aircraft. And, and one of the guys fueling it comes up to Jimmy Stewart and says, doesn't the General know that the, that the plane could explode? And Stewart looks at him and says, it wouldn't dare. <laughs> and that actually, that actually happened. <laughs> when they brought him back to brief him on the atomic bomb in June, he fell asleep in, in the meeting with Stimson. And, uh, I, th and I would have said command. Stimson is the one who was likely to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he fell. He said, "I can do it. Just give me more bombs and thirty more targets." Yeah. No, but I want to, I want to touch on this. this. I want to return. I think this is a really interesting question because I've wondered about this in many different contexts, that our notion of what effective leadership is has, and what's allowable in a leader has evolved so rapidly in the last yeah. generation that there's a whole category of people who we simultaneously would say, like, oh, LeMay, we can, all of us would agree he's the finest combat commander of the Second World War, you know, in terms of, uh, 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 but simultaneously, we, we would have to admit the modern military would have no use for him. That, that's a paradox I struggle with a lot. That, mm. What does that mean when we actually have a real war again? Do we relax our more recent standards about these things, or do we commit ourselves to simply um, trying to make war with a fraction of the of the ability that's out there. In, in a blatant, and this is truly blatant plug for my book, which is out there being sold, <laughs> I, 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 I talk about that dilemma today. I, I, I talk about Coast War, talk, I go beyond World War II, but you've got this dilemma now where existential wars are different, but we're not fighting existential wars. And, and so when you're fighting limited wars and you can't go all the way, and you've got this dilemma, you know, Clausewitz, I throw a Clausewitz quote out for, I get the beer, right? Is that for, from Rob Satino? You know, Clausewitz says, resistance equals means times will. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the different bombing approaches, the, you know, the British bombing is gonna take out will, and our type of bombing is really gonna take out means, but you're gonna put resistance to zero with both, each approach. Uh, but if you can't go that, if we're not, if we're not gonna go all the way, then how you, comp how, you, how you manipulate that equation becomes more difficult. But it, you know, Michael Howard made a great, uh, had wrote some great stuff about, and it, it, if you're fighting an existential war, the uh, options available to decision makers become much more limited. But look at this, the, the moral way to go, you would say would be, as opposed to cover bombing, would be precision bombing. Yeah, but precision bombing makes it easier for you to bomb. If you're reluctant about bombing, no, no, we're gonna bomb precision. No, it's cheap, it's easy. Clinton gets a little mm. trouble with Monica Lewinsky, throws a couple of rockets here, right? Mm. I mean, you, you just can do it. 
because yeah. it's precision bombing and you're not going to hurt anybody. That, that's, and so that's, there's a temptation that draws you into bombing. And Malcolm mentions that's that. A, that's a little, uh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's a little crazy. No, that, that Malcolm mentions that. That's also a point of Michael Knavis' book in Virtual War. He says, you know, if, if we see... But you go to annihilation, you've got to really think it out. If war's a video game... You're going to do it. You're going to take that next step. Mm -hmm. If war's a video game and nobody gets hurt and there's no real damage, it's easy to do. If your option is, you know, th think about some of the decisions. I'm not going to send a diplomatic note. I'm going to shoot a cruise missile into a milk factory. That's a lot easier to do than to send a diplomatic note. But in its own way, it's Orwellian. It's crazy. Well, and, 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 and the, the lure of strike, I did an article on this one time, that the problem is the lure of this easy airstrike can often lead you into something where it takes a lot more than an airstrike to resolve it. Remember Vietnam? Oh, the nerves get rattled as they did, you know, at the airport, you know, when they were evacuating Afghanistan and they hit that family? I mean, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the big dilemma. We, we, we've, we've created this image of a, of a video war that nobody gets hurt. You know, really, and, 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 it's, and it, that's not war. War is not that way. It's, it's violence, and people get killed, and people get hurt, and your best laid plans. There was one of those raids in Kosovo where we got castigated because we blew up a train, killed 40 civilians, caused all kinds of havoc on both sides. It's one of the few air raids I've ever seen where morale on both sides dropped after the air raid. Yeah. The train was 15 minutes late. I mean, the Air Force had the, they had the train schedules. They put the aircraft out there, put the missile on the, the bridge, and here came this train 15 minutes late. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, we, 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 we have to educate the public about what war is all about. Yeah. I, I want to, one last, I think we're going to go to, we're going to go to questions yeah, soon. But time. I wanted you to quickly, Con, I have one last question for you. It's something, a point you raised with me when we talked um, uh, way back when, um, and that was about Korea that, in many ways, am I right in thinking that the, the really morally problematic conflict along these lines of bombing doctrine is not the Second World War, which was an impossible problem, as I said, but Korea. Right. That's what, when I, when I had that conversation with you, that's what I came away, I came away with that from that, when you were talking about Korea and like, Korea is like a replay of the worst parts of Second World War. I was like, wow, like, and yet, you know, have we made a mistake by not talking about Korea in a, the Korean War in a much more... I mean, that is the true forgotten war of the 20th century. And is that a huge mistake on our part? No, that's uh, Al Millett who's out there somewhere who is the quintessential historian of that. That's finished his third volume on Korean War. Yeah, the, 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 what happens in Korea is we... When we go to the peace talks, and we've got to, each side has to determine how they're going to coerce at the peace talks, and our coercion is going to be through air power, and the air pressure campaign that goes through 52 and 53, basically firebombs North Korean cities. It burns down pretty much every, most North Koreans are living in caves by the end of the war. The, one of the main drives for the North Korean missile program today is to make sure that never happens again. I mean, it, there are implications for these actions as well. It, it, it's, uh, but you're right, it's, it's, I'm sure when Amalette's third volume comes out, it'll be much more popular to talk about it than it is now. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready, got time for our questions, I think. Well, thank you to our panelists. We're going to uh, have a round of applause and then I'll get the microphone. <laughs> to our first question, to your left, all the way in the very back. Uh, hi. Um, when you brought up that we made the warrior war more like a video game, ah, sorry. Um, do you think that we, that with our all advances in technology, it's become more easier to distance ourselves in this sense? Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, part of it's, to be honest, we in the military are our own worst enemies because we, we hype our capabilities a lot. Um, sometimes they get uh, exaggerated. Again, war is, we, we've already talked about this war is chance and war is, 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 you know, things go wrong and just fog and friction and, 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 and part of it is, is more and more, but less and less the public has experience with it. And, you know, I'm sure the World War II generation realizes how dangerous and how unpredictable war is, but we have, Americans have always loved technology. It's some of the, the some of the attraction that, that, the, the bomber mafia that, that Malcolm writes about is they, they just saw this as a very effective and efficient way to fight war. 
more effective, more efficient. Uh, but it's, it's, it's always good to have this elements of chance and probability that you just can't ignore. There's always, somebody's always going to get hurt. Um, and, and it's all, this, all the services has fallen victim to this over time. I, I, wonder, one, I think it's a really interesting point. I wanted to make one amendment, slight amendment, which is I think that virtual war, or not virtual war, or the kind of modern distance war that we're talking about, makes the decisions of leaders easier. But I think it's a much more complicated question when you talk about the people who are actually waging the war. So if I'm in wherever, Colorado, or wherever the drone warfare mm. center is, and I'm, I, am, I am killing an individual on the other side of the world, um, when I launch that drone, I actually see, I see that person. Yeah, you do, yeah. You know, in the Second World War, when you dropped the bomb from 25,000 feet, that's remove. You might never, ever see the consequences. Maybe a strike photo, but a strike photo, even a strike photo is so far taken um, so f that it's a, it's a relatively, um, whereas that guy in Colorado, like he, he sees it right there in, in, this, in astonishing detail. And I wonder whether it's easier for leaders, but a lot harder for the people who have to pull the trigger. Hmm. Helen Mirren's movie, Eye in the Sky, do you see that? Yeah. It's a Canadian commander, actually. <laughs> And uh, they make that, they have to make that decision. They have a target targeted and uh, a meeting of high Islamic officials and all of a sudden they have the hut all set up, you know, they're gonna hit it. They have a little uh, camera in there that's as big as a bug. They're picking everything up. And all of a sudden, five little kids come out there to sell bread and they set up a stand right in front of it. Yeah. You know, this Go is- Go or not. This is, a, this is a topic for another time, but I, uh, I've often thought this is emblematic of something very profound that has happened in our current society, which is the emotional consequences of actions are now being offloaded yep. to the bottom of the pyramid. Mm. The, so the leadership is increasingly isolated from those kinds of, of, of um, highly personal psychological consequences of their decisions. That worry, you know, go back a couple hundred years and the general, you know, is on his horse, at the, you know, marching with the men, mm -hmm. whereas it's a very different matter now. And you've also have the, the sons and daughters of the elites are sharing the, the risk, and there's not as much of that these days either. Yeah. yeah. The next question will be to your right, gentlemen, with our presidential counselor, Adrian Lewis. Great. Uh, great talk. Uh, can you explain a few things that I think uh, have gotten a little muddled here? For example, can you explain the difference between precision bombing and area bombing? And when you think about precision bombing, uh, the difference between precision bombing in Iraq and precision bombing during World War II, uh, which are very different things. The uh, second part of the question is, can you explain how you win a war with air power? Uh, destroy the enemy's means of production, uh, the destroy the will of the people, and what's the difference between destroying the will of the people and extermination warfare? Thank you. My. <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> Series of easy questions. Well, you know, uh, precision bombing, and you guys can pick it up. Precision bombing, uh, World War II style, um, is an oxymoron. Um, there was no such thing as precision bombing. You couldn't drop bombs from a pickle barrel. Uh, we can technologically bomb more precise today if we had, have good ground intelligence, but that's a big if. So there, there is, as far as the difference between area bombing, I mean, by the end of the war, the Americans flying strategic bombing missions are really doing area bombing. And um, the, um, as a bomber command pilot told me, you know, he said he confronted an American, he said, um, we area bomb area targets and you pinpoint bomb uh, you area you, you area a, area bomb pinpoint targets he said what's the difference no it just you understand that the way it's being done in world war ii is you normally have a squadron of 12 to 16 aircraft lemay sets up this these you know they're going to go in on a on a straight bomb run you, you have a, a trained crew in front that knows the target everybody drops their bombs at the same time so you got 12 or 16 aircraft dropping their bombs at the same time they normally have a, a stick of 12 bombs. They set a 400-foot gap between bombs with a thing called an intervolometer. 
So the bombs are, each bomb string is covered 4,400 feet on the ground. So basically, you, precision bombing is taking out a square mile on the ground. Mm -hmm. that, that's precision bombing in World War II. Today, you're talking about a, a pilot with a screen that who can see, I mean, we're, you are, we are literally putting bombs through windows in, in offices and, 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 and taking out individual vehicles. I mean, it, it's, we have come an awful, awful long way, but it goes back to Don's point. If your intelligence is wrong, you still kill the Afghan wedding party. Yeah, and, and as far as taking out an entire economy, that's very difficult to do. I mean, uh, LeMay took out 66 cities, Bomber Harris took out 74, but let's just stay on Japan for a second. By the time LeMay does that, beginning in February of 45, the Japanese economy is already kaput. It's been knocked out by a naval blockade that cut off uh, supplies of rice, iron, minerals coming in from Java and places like that. And the Japanese were beginning to starve, and they're starving industrially. They can't feed their machines you know, with, with the things that make them go because the navies killed 1,700 merchant marine and sunk 340 ships just in three months going in there. So LeMay is hitting dead targets. That's my problem with LeMay's bombing. Um, it was slaughter bombing, it was a morale bombing. And in a sense, the crazy thing about it is it's effective in this sense, in that it, when Japanese leaders and po Japanese civilians were interviewed by strategic bombing survey interviewers after the war, they said something very interesting about morale bombing. They said that, um, it is the single most important factor in convincing the military elite and the population that Japan couldn't win the war. But if you went on to the next level of questions, they asked him, do you think Japan should still be fighting? And they said, yes. So it doesn't, doesn't destroy morale to the extent that they're willing to stop fighting. It's just that they're saying they can't win the war. And just to throw, a, an, interesting eth throw an interesting ethical twist out here, uh, that we kill about... 350 to 400,000 Germans with the bombing of German cities in World War II will kill almost exactly the same number of Germans with the naval blockade in World War I. Yeah. One of the things that made LeMay's bombing so transfixing for airmen is we lost 26,000 8th Air Force airmen in World War II, and he lost 1,200 crewmen in all his raids on those, uh, on those 66 cities. Casualties were exceeded. Now that was because the Japanese didn't have an aerial defense system that was, you know, was worth anything. But nonetheless, you know, the men felt that these missions, they had a better chance. John Chiardi, our former poet laureate, uh, flew B-29s in the war and wrote a great book about it, Saipan, and, and gets into these kinds of questions that are really interesting. We talk about getting into these questions in an existential way. Chiardi's book is fantastic. Yeah. Um, the next question is going to be to your left in the very back, please. Hey, Con, you say my name three times and I show up like Beetlejuice, right? Oh, that's Trevor back there. Yeah, it's Good. me. That's Curtis hey. LeMay. That's right. <laughs> no, no, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so a couple quick comments. One, Don, to your point, <clears throat> in Curtis LeMay's mind, he really thought he was depriving the Japanese of capacity. We can say all the things we want to say about what was being achieved, but in LeMay's mind, and in his own documents, in, in everything that they ever produced, it was because they wanted to convince the Japanese they couldn't produce the things they needed produced to fight the war. I would all, and, then, and then take me to task, because there's a lot I don't know. Two. How, how do you know that? Um, because I have just about every document that 21st Air Bomber Command produced. Okay. And, and I got the book. I can give it no, to you. No, I'm not challenging. I'm just asking. No, no, no. Yeah. It, it, there's uh, every single one of the tactical mission reports accounts for what they were going after. And then in the post-mission report, they determine what the damage assessment was. And the only thing they ever list are factories and military facilities. They're the only things that have target numbers. There's also a document from the Committee on Analysis from about 1942 that says the whole point of burning a city is to use it, and I quote, as kindling to get the industrial targets. So it wasn't even LeMay's idea. But to the larger point, I, I, I'm a believer that a war of choice, not a, a war of non-existential uh, non conflict, yeah. can become an existential conflict. And I will, I will posit this and then shut up. 
Look at Vietnam. It has become the specter, the ghost of everything we fight against since 1975. It convinced us we can quit wars and be okay. It convinced us that there are wars we can lose. And in so doing, it has helped us to lose almost every war we are gonna fight since because we can leave. It's okay to leave. Yeah. And the minute we learned that, I think we learned to lose wars. Let me just make one comment on LeMay. And LeMay give, does give a briefing when, when uh, ha, uh, Hap Arnold comes out and, and LeMay gives him a briefing and he says, the war will be over on 1 October 1945. And Arnold asks him, how does he know that? And LeMay says, because I will have eliminated every target on my target list. But again, that, that goes back to, to, to I, I agree with Trevor. I think LeMay, he, he doesn't realize how dead the economy already is, and he's just going down that target list. I mean, there's a, a picture uh, I used to illustrate this. There's, this, there's a, a targeting picture that was in the uh, Insight magazine, but the Air Force has this really neat magazine they put out uh, for the, the Air Force A2 puts out to all the different forces. It shows this a picture of Toyama, Japan, and the caption says, Toyama, Japan, burned down 66% of the city, but we got the important propeller plant. And, and that's what the focus was. And I've seen those, those after action reports too, and they don't even mention casualties. But I mean, Con, did you believe, I think this is a myth, LeMay's idea that uh, the Japanese economy is dependent on small crafts and, you know, with, you know. No, they, they don't. If you look at his target list, it's, yeah. all, it's all major factors. It is. It's he all major factors. He doesn't even mention that. But LeMay Le does say that in his memoirs, that he had to, because the Japanese economy was so dispersed into households, and there's drill presses, he said, the, okay, the, you mentioned this in your book. I mean, there's the wreckage, and you see the drill press there. So I've got to annihilate an entire area to get at these small things. I, 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 I can't pinpoint bombs. No, I, I, think it's, I, I, you know, I think that's partly a rationale to help explain better what happened. I think happened. so, too. I, 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 just, I mean, you, you see it. You can see it in some of the writings about Japan. They talk about these cottage industries, but I don't think that... But look at all the precision bombing raids he made after he, he firebombed Tokyo. I'm not talking about the ones at the end of the war on oil. I'm talking about the ones against aircraft factories. And... Uh, uh, he had a, a program called Operation Empire, where the first thing to do was, if it's clear, we're going to go precision. If it's cloudy, we're going to firebomb. Yeah. And he actually did have one, one very good B-29 group that was really accurate with radar bombing. Yeah. I can't remember what, 305th? I, there was one group that was probably the most accurate. Well, they had a site they'd picked up from the British. They used it on oil targets yeah. at the end of the war. They could bomb at night with more precision than they could bomb on a clear day, you know, from 18,000 feet. Uh, Harris your, had the same equipment. He didn't have to fire bomb. To your right with Connie and John Morrow. I have enjoyed this session. I'd like to take it back up towards the present um, because you folks went in that direction. In 1991, after I'd chair the Air Force History Advisor Committee in the Pentagon for four years, uh, I was asked to consider becoming the chief of the Office of Air Force History after Dick Cohn. Mm. Um, in my interview with Merrill McPeak, who was the chief of, stop that con, who was the chief of Air Staff at the time, he told me point blank, uh, if you become the Air Force historian, I want you to write a pamphlet or a book on how effective our smart weapons have been. And he pointed out that maybe about 90% effective. I said, General, the dust hasn't even cleared from the war. And when it does, you're going to find out they weren't anywhere near that effective. So I would suggest you not do that. And uh, he said, well, that's your belief. But if you become the chief, you'll have to do what I want. Um, I got the job. I got the job offered to me, and I turned it down. And all I said, without saying anything to the general, was, I don't do what anybody damn well thinks they think they want. We all, I do we, what I think is smarter. And it turned out when yeah. they wrote the monograph, they got torched because they claimed that it was far more effective than it was. Come up to the beginning of the Iraq War in this century, 
There's a great documentary, Why, Me, Why We Fight, taken after Frank Copper's set of documentaries in World War II. And part of the sequence is that you have these two F-117 pilots, both colonels, lieutenant colonels, who take off at night, fly all the way to Baghdad at night. They have these incredible bunker buster bombs that you can put on target, cloud through cloud, everything else, and they know what the target is. They're not sure, they're not told they're going after Saddam Hussein, but they're pretty sure of it. And they drop the bombs, get out, and they're interviewed when they get back, and they say, you know, uh, we really don't have any control over our orders, we carry them out. But we think that we may have prevented another war by taking out Saddam Hussein. And then the next sequence shows the ground where not a single one of the goddamn bomb, bunker buster bombs hit the bunkers they were supposed to hit. So this Air Force fantasy about the effectiveness of technology continues to be an issue, I think, even today. And uh, so it, it, what do you gentlemen think? Because this still strikes me. The Air Force is up here, they're not on the ground like infantry, and they're doing these things, and they're sure their technology works, and nothing is perfect. Malcolm, why don't you take that? Well, it, you know, in this respect, they're not that different from um, any, uh, a devotee of new technology. They, they sound to me like a lot of CEOs of Silicon Valley startups. Um, one in particular uh, is in the courts right now, um, having to do with blood tests. Uh, you know, the thing about technological obsessives is that you don't get where you want to go unless you have an outlandish belief in your own um, experiment, right? And so, that's a necessary, that kind of out, outsized belief is a necessary ingredient of embarking on the experiment in the first place, but it is also powerfully contributes to you being wrong occasionally. I think, I just think this is what you, your observations, which I think are spot on, are true across the board of people who pursue these kinds of new ideas. They, they're obsessives, they're, they're, they're true believers. This is what true believers do, and is your, you're absolutely right that the job of the historian is to correct the record. You know, if, the, if you're gonna write a book about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, don't drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, <laughs> right? And I think if you're gonna be the Air Force historian, your job is not to defend the fantasies of Air Force generals, it's to figure out what actually happened. We've got a question in the back to your right, gentlemen. So I have a comment and, and a question. My comment is just to keep in mind that all wars are existential for those at the pointy end of <laughs> yes, the spear. Yes, yes. And I know y'all yeah. gentlemen realize that. That's Good a truism, point. but it is an important point to keep in mind. So my question deals with morality in war, generally speaking, and air war specifically. Is it more moral to use precision and limited bombing to limit civilian casualties or to use massive bombing, which results in the killing of massive numbers of civilians, that convinces our enemies that they are utterly defeated and that they must change their ways, not just their government, their culture, their way of thinking, so that no new wars come about? In other words, is there something to be said about bombing leading to massive civilian casualties that results in victory and long-term peace? And, and the, the corollary to that is mm -hmm. perhaps LeMay had it right, even from a moral standpoint. Hmm. Well, that's the Sherman and to some extent Grant point of view. Um, keep the war short. Um, Short and brutal. Kill as many people as you can quickly, and uh, in the end, it's more merciful. Um, Sherman didn't necessarily fight that way, but he argued that way um, uh, in his letters and, and whatnot throughout the war. But it's, I think it's an unsolvable 
question. I mean, it, it, it really is. I mean, the, um, I don't know where you go I'm, you know, with that one. I, hmm. I just argue. don't support the LeMay point of view, that's all. I, 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 uh, yeah, LeMay argued that he could have ended both Korea and Vietnam in two weeks if they had basically taken the gloves off and let him bomb everything. Uh, I, I don't think that would have worked, but that, that was his, you know, his, LeMay was, but look at Eisenhower. He's a total warrior. Let me. He's a total warrior. Go to war, Eisenhower he's was twice advised by his entire cabinet and his jo entire Joint Chiefs of Staff to use the atomic bomb on two occasions in Korea. And in both cases, Ike said no. Mm -hmm. I I would. This is a really good question, um, and I would it make is. An, an, anal question. an analogy to public health. Um, so think about this in the context of, say, uh, an epidemic of a infectious disease, uh, unknown infectious disease, where a significant part of the country of the population is resistant to a method known to stop the spread of this disease and to limit the damage caused by this disease, you could do one of two approaches. You could withhold the cure and the preventative technology and teach the population of that country a lasting lesson about the benefits of newfangled vaccines. So you could say, all right, well, let's see what happens if you don't vaccinate people against this disease. We'll have a couple million deaths dead, and the next time around, you can bet 100% of the population will sign up. Or you could say, let's vaccinate as many people as we can and try and reason with those who are resistant to this life-saving technology. Which of those is the more moral approach? Now, I don't mean to make a leading suggestion here, um, part, part of me thinks, you know, I mean, if we're going to be dealing with, is, with pandemics on a regular basis in the future, it might be really useful to scare the bejesus out of Americans and convince them the next time around we should all sign up the minute, first minute we can. It's the same problem, right? The problem is, how do you convince a resistant party to change their behavior that is in a way that's in their own best interest? Um, I bring up this example of vaccines in our own population only because the experience of the last year and a half suggests that it is really, 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 really hard to get people to change their behavior even when it is in their own best interest to do so. Um, and in, when it comes to wars, the problem is magnified a hundredfold. Next question is to your left, it's about halfway metaphor. back with Connie. Interesting metaphor. Um, yes, gentlemen, I would like to um, mention that I'm from Berlin, in fact, in the third generation after World War II, I suppose, and I've always been um, thinking about this moral aspect of the bombing campaigns in World War II, and in fact, uh, until recently, was inclined to, in part, yeah, to think that the Allied side may have gone too far, and then I met the British historian Anthony Beaver, who mm. told me while he was sorry about the random massacre of uh, the civilians, there is a strategic aspect that was um, quite obvious, and um, yeah, I understand that and respect that. But if we try to progress and go away from repeating uh, warfare and the random killing of civilians, Mm, to my mind, today's presentation is not enough um, of the moral aspect without going too far and becoming unrealistic, mind you. I don't know whether you're familiar with the documentary The Fog of War, yeah. the big interview with Robert McNamara, and to me that really struck home as being very close to what I think would be not a solution but the right direction to go. And, uh, yeah, have the cake and eat it too. It's not a good uh, way to phrase it. But how can you restore credibility um, and how can you have effective deterrence without the risk of escalating the wars? And I think that's the, the key to strike the, the right balance and um, yeah, not go all the way because how can you be sure uh, then you're right and it's unknowable how the people will react and obviously 
you show people they are going to lose, but they will keep on fighting and they won't mind everybody gets killed on their own side, like Nazi Germany, like Japan, and keeps repeating itself. Uh, you know, you have Islamist fanatics and they think uh, they, they, they go to heaven, it's going to get better for them. Uh, so they don't mind getting killed. And so how, to, how can you, how can de-escalate and create effective deterrence and restore credibility without going all the way? Thank you. That's, that's, that's the credibility problem. You've got a, you know, effective deterrence, you've got to have some kind of a threat that your opponent thinks you might actually do. Then of course the dilemma with deterrence is you can always tell when it fails, but you're never really sure when it works. Uh, but no, that, that is, you know, that, that's why, you know, we can, we can debate the morality of what, what LeMay did in Tokyo, but that, that is a deterrent fact out there that, that, that potential adversaries realize that even with conventional bombing, that we could go that far. Uh, like I said, I don't think anybody thinks we're going to use a nuke again. But that is a dilemma. I mean, it's, it's, you've, you've got to create a, to coerce someone, you've got to have some kind of a, a threat that is going to force them to change their behavior and they believe you will actually do it. Uh, and it's, it's uh, but of course, yeah, one of the other dilemmas is that once you actually do it, your credibility goes down because it's never, it's never as bad as they yeah. thought it was going to be. It's, it's really complex. I, I, I was teaching a class in Hiroshima to an all Japanese, a student body of all Japanese. And um, the class was divided on the atomic bomb. And the progressive kids, the leftist kids, supported the bomb and the right-wing nationalist kids were opposed to the bomb. Uh, the right-wing nationalist kids were opposed to the bomb because it destroyed the credibility of the military elite, Finis, and they, there was an almost religious devotion to them. And, um, uh, and that's exactly why the kids on the left supported the bomb, because it did exactly that. Um, it, it not only you know, ended the war, but it ended the regime and turned Japan in a different direction. And it was a real eye-opener. And these kids were ardent in their beliefs, and I had never thought of the bomb like that. Mm -hmm. There's a, we're going to have a really interesting, in the coming uh, years, a really interesting case study of this very question. Um, and this is a, actually, I, I did an episode of my podcast, Revisionist History, on this. Um, right now, if you are a pedestrian in a city, why do you not jaywalk with impunity? You're reasonably sure that if you walk out in traffic, the car will stop, but you're not 100% sure. Somebody could be on their phone, someone just could be in a bad mood, someone could not be watching, and they might hit you and kill you. So there is a, that is deterrence in action, right? There is, there is a threat of, uh, of, uh, of an extreme case where you'll, where you'll lose your life. The threat is not large, but it's significant enough in your imagination that you do not jaywalk with impunity. Okay, what happens when every car on the road is an autonomous vehicle equipped with 500 different sensors and LIDAR and 17 cameras? Now you are almost absolutely sure that if you walk out in traffic, the cars will all stop, right? Because the, the threat, the deterrence has been removed by technology. The car will absolutely, and that, they're designed to do that. Right. So what happens if we replace cars driven by humans with, as we hope to, with cars driven uh, remotely by computers, people will just jaywalk with impunity. It will be impossible to drive a car across the city. Children, <laughs> children <laughs> will. That is amazing. That's metaphor. wonderful. Children will play ball on I-95 as they should, <laughs> because it's a really great place to play ball. It is. I, this argument has been presented by a couple of people to those on, in Silicon Valley who are pushing autonomous vehicles. And this concept literally never occurred to them. They, <laughs> and I would say that it would be really useful for a group full of people such as yourself who are well acquainted with matters of deterrence to take a field trip to Silicon Valley, uh, invite all the people pushing autonomous vehicles, and just talk to them about deterrence and how it works. Because <laughs> it might, it might uh, take a little bit of the air out of their balloon. <laughs> Great. <laughs> to the back, to your right, gentlemen. That is a neat metaphor. That's good. <laughs> Brilliant. 
So y'all have discussed both past and current generations. For the current generation, I've heard the argument that they're not willing to do voluntarily meatless Mondays or war bond drives or et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. Um, England being an example still had uh, restrictions up until the early mid 1960s, if I recall correctly. The Marines that showed up to, I believe it was called Murphy Point. I'm brilliant. Um, who had women and children who were uh, jumping to their deaths. Saipan. Um, Saipan. So that, Marpan, thank you. Um, I'm not so great with all the names sometimes. Jumping to their deaths in front of them, and they were absolutely horrified that they would be willing to do that when they were supposed to be the great liberators. We intentionally had propaganda out there as a yay, go us, we're going to really beat it to them, and we used incredibly incendiary language in order to prove our might and strength, and then we were shocked when they believed us. We were shocked when the Japanese housewives took batons to try to defend themselves against our soldiers. When we talk about the generation that we had and the generation that we have now, do you think that we're moving away from, you know, annihilation level war, specifically because we as a, as a nation, as a world, will no longer conscien that sort of language against someone? I don't really understand the question because um, the, um, the American military on the Saipan was discouraging um, with Japanese language translators, people from jumping. Um, they had been encouraged to jump by defeated Japanese troops. And um, so I don't really understand the, you know, the flow of the logic there. No, she, it was brought up on one of the other panels. The question that she's talking about that maybe that the propaganda, the our our very aggressive talk towards the Japanese. Some of the things we had said may have set up created a mindset that we're out to. We we had made some a few statements that have been played out in the Japanese press. Well, that's exactly that. what happened. Yeah. 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 The Japanese played on it. Yeah, they did. Um, yeah. But yes, the military was, they were trying desperately to I stop mean, that. W men, women, and children were in caves, and they had been told that, you know, if they go out of the cave, they'll be not only killed but raped. And uh, we sent in translators and tried to get them to change their minds. And I mean, it depends if it's an existential war. I mean, if you look at the, the Gulf War in 1991, there was a poll taken about nuking Iraq, and a, and a little over 50% of Americans favored nuking Iraq before we went in there. I mean, if you get Americans angry, if it becomes is perceived as an existential conflict, again, that's I don't I don't know I don't know how far it would go. We 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 haven't been faced with that kind. We got wars of I've mentioned before. We got wars of choice. These are not being forced on us. Um, I, you know, I, I, if if it's you know, if, if we have another, you know, Pearl Harbor type thing, I don't know. I don't know how the dynamics work. So we're going to try to get one or two more questions in, but I want to encourage the audience to stay because I have a couple of important announcements and maybe some good news. So uh, next question to your right, about halfway back, please. Thank you. So this is in part uh, directed at the question that nukes will never be used again. When I was stationed in Central Europe in the 60s, ah, yes. it was well believed among uh, American forces that we could never agree to no first use because the only way to keep the Soviets from massing the kind of uh, attack they could have massed was that that would make too good a target uh, for tactical nuclear weapons. I don't know that precision bombing has changed that calculus against our friend Putin and his uh, legions, but I'm not so sure that it would be useful to think that we wouldn't use them under those kinds of circumstances, and I would like you to repeat your view that we're never going to use them again. Well, nobody thinks we are. I mean, I, I, I can't get into some classified stuff, but uh, the, uh, I mean, it, it, the, only, the only people out there in the contemporary arena that talk about any kind of tackle use of nuclear weapons right now are the Russians. Um, they have a capacity to do it that we don't. Uh, you know, remember that they tried to 
put something through the Congress to develop a smaller nuclear weapon and, and the Congress canceled the program. I mean, if your choice is, is, is go to, you know, that the Russians think they can escalate to de-escalate. They think they have much, but they're the only people to talk about it and nobody's quite sure where that goes. But I, I would say that you're, that the, 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 the balance of powers in Europe is not as it was then. I, I, I was in the Army in the 70s. I played all the Dunkemp War games where the, the first round was destroying the first echelon of Russian troops and the second round was firing nukes at the rest. And the, uh, our motto was nuke them till they glow. And, and I, I used that until I ran into a physics student at a lecture who told me that organic material does not glow. <laughs> so we'll nuke them till their belt buckles glow. But uh, the, the bottom line is that the, the, the dynamics have changed. And, and there is a sense that uh, to use it, I was actually at a conference in France after they had the, the terrorist attack, attacks in Paris and I tried to advise them to nuke Raqqa. And the, the French were, they, would, they, they were horrified by the suggestion. Uh, I don't think any Western power even would contemplate using a tactical nuke at this point. But I don't know. What, again, situations change. We'll see. I, I think one of the real advantages of Malcolm's book is that he has not sympathy, but empathy for LeMay. And he makes LeMay a believable, he makes him a human being, not some sort of you know, abstraction. And, and with complexity. So that introduces issues like the ones we're discussing today. In other words, he's stirring the pot. <laughs> and, uh, and we certainly thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you panelists for that. Uh, this is a, uh, a very deep and in-depth Conclusion to our day. It doesn't end our total day because we have the closing banquet tonight. That'll be across the street at the U.S. Freedom Pavilion. A uh, couple of important announcements. Mr. Gladwell will be outside in the book signing area to sign copies of the print book. But he, as he and his team have uh, told me throughout our conversations, he is most proud and focused on the audio book that the print book is actually sort of a transcription of. And uh, in coordinating with Mr. Gladwell and his team, Anna and Stefan, and with the support of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, everyone who is attending in person will receive a copy of that audio book. Uh, so it's... Uh, <laughs> It is a, uh, definitely a different way to learn through what we would call podcasts, but it's, it's pretty fascinating to hear the mix of oral histories, uh, the audio engineering that they did to make the uh, engine noises. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to it while doing dishes. So, <laughs> um, The catch. What is the catch to this free stuff? We need your opinions. We need you to fill out surveys. We want to know how we can make this great weekend even greater. And so we will be sending out surveys to everyone. And if you fill out the survey, at the bottom of it, you're going to have the option of opting in to receive the uh, communication as to how you can get this copy. So it's a little carrot and stick. <laughs> Um, but in all honesty, it, it helps us with both the history side and the hospitality side. So please do let us know. Uh, you guys are the most loyal of the loyal that we have that we count on every year. So thank you. Uh, we now do have our break for dinner. The banquet doors will open at the U.S. Freedom Pavilion at 630. The Magazine Street Firehouse, just right across the street from the entrance um, to the hotel, the, that will be your primary point of entry. So uh, leaving the ballroom now for good, take your stuff or it becomes mine. And don't forget the boxes of books. If you need anything out of there, now's your chance. One last round of applause for the audience with their questions and of course our panelists, Malcolm Gladwell, Don Miller, and Con Crane. Thank you.